Section 1 of Children of the Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Children of the Frost by Jack London. In the Forests of the North. A weary journey beyond the last scrub timber and straggling copses into the heart of the barrens where the niggard north is supposed to deny the earth are to be found great sweeps of forests and stretches of smiling land. But this the world is just beginning to know. The world's explorers have known it from time to time, but hitherto they have never returned to tell the world. The barrens, well, they are the barrens, the badlands of the Arctic, the deserts of the circle, the bleak and bitter home of the musk ox and the lean plains wolf. So Avery Van Brunt found them, treeless and cheerless, sparsely clothed with moss and lichens, and altogether uninviting. At least so he found them till he penetrated to the white blank spaces on the map, and came upon undreamed-of rich spruce forests and unrecorded Eskimo tribes. It had been his intention and his bid for fame, to break up these white blank spaces and diversify them with the black markings of mountain chains, sinks and basins, and sinuous river courses. And it was with added delight that he came to speculate upon the possibilities of timber belts and native villages. Avery Van Brunt, or, in full distinction, Professor A. Van Brunt of the Geological Survey, was second in command of the expedition, and first in command of the sub-expedition, which he had led on a side tour of some half a thousand miles up one of the branches of the Thalon, and which he was now leading into one of his unrecorded villages. At his back plotted eight men, two of them French-Canadian voyageurs, and the remainder strapping Crees from Manitoba way. He alone was full-blooded Saxon, and his blood was pounding fiercely through his veins to the traditions of his race. Clive and Hastings, Drake and Raleigh, Hingist and Horsa, walked with him. First of all men of his breed was he to enter this lone Northland village, and at the thought of an exultancy came upon him, an exaltation, and his followers noted that his leg weariness fell from him, and that he insensibly quickened the pace. The village emptied itself, and a motley crowd trooped out to meet him, men in the forefront, with bows and spears clutched menacingly, and women and children faltering timidly in the rear. Van Brunt lifted his right arm and made the universal peace sign, a sign which all peoples know, and the villagers answered in peace. But to his chagrin, a skin-clad man ran forward and thrust out his hand with a familiar hello. He was a bearded man, with cheeks and brow bronzed to copper brown, and in him Van Brunt knew his kind. "'Who are you?' he asked, gripping the extended hand. Andre? Who's Andre? the man asked back. Van Brunt looked at him more sharply. By George, you've been here some time. Five years, the man answered, a dim flicker of pride in his eyes. But come on, let's talk. Let them camp alongside of me, he answered, Van Brunt's glance at his party. Old Tantlach will take care of them. Come on. He swung off in a long stride, Van Brunt following at his heels through the village. In a regular fashion, wherever the ground favored, the lodges of Moosehide were pitched. Van Brunt ran his practiced eye over them and calculated. Two hundred, not counting the young ones, he summed up. The man nodded. Pretty close to it. But here's where I live, out of the thick of it, you know. More privacy and all that. Sit down. I'll eat with you when your men get something cooked up. I've forgotten what tea tastes like. Five years, and never a taste or smell. Any tobacco? Ah, thanks. And a pipe? Good. Now for a fire stick, and we'll see if the weed has lost its cunning. He scratched the match with the painstaking care of the woodsman, cherished its young flame as though there were never another in all the world, and drew in the first mouthful of smoke. This he retained meditatively for a time, and blew out through his pursed lips slowly and caressingly. Then his face seemed to soften as he leaned back, and a soft blur to film his eyes. He sighed heavily, happily, with immeasurable content, and then he said suddenly, 
God, but that tastes good. Van Brunt nodded sympathetically. Five years, you say? Five years, the man sighed again. And you, I presume, wish to know about it. Being naturally curious, and this a sufficiently strange situation and all that. But it's not much. I came in from Edmonton after Muscox, and like Pike and the rest of them, had my mischances. Only I lost my party and outfit. Starvation, hardship, the regular tale, you know, sole survivor and all that, till I crawled into tent latches here on hand and knee. Five years, Van Brunt murmured retrospectively, as though turning things over in his mind. Five years on February last. I crossed the Great Slave early in May. And you are Fairfax? Van Brunt interjected. The man nodded. Let me see. John, I think it is. John Fairfax. How did you know? Fairfax queried lazily, half absorbed in curling smoke spirals upward in the quiet air. The papers were full of it at the time. Provence. Provence? Fairfax sat up, suddenly alert. He was lost in the Smoke Mountains. Yes, but he pulled through and came out. Fairfax settled back again and resumed his smoke spirals. I am glad to hear it, he remarked reflectively. Provence was a bully fellow if he did have ideas about head straps, the beggar. And he pulled through? Well, I'm glad. Five years. The phrase drifted recurrently through Van Brunt's thought. And somehow the face of Emily Southwaith seemed to rise up and take form before him. Five years. A wedge of wild fowl honked low overhead at the sight of the encampment, veered swiftly to the north, into the smoldering sun. Van Brunt could not follow them. He pulled out his watch. It was an hour past midnight. The northward clouds flushed bloodily, and rays of somber red shot southward, firing the gloomy woods with a lurid radiance. The air was in breathless calm, not a needle quivered, and the least sounds of the camp were distinct and clear as trumpet calls. The Crees and voyageurs felt the spirit of it, and mumbled in dreamy undertones, and the cook unconsciously subdued the clatter of pot and pan. Somewhere a child was crying, and from the depths of the forest, like a silver thread, rose a woman's voice in mournful chant. Oh, ah, 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 ah. Oh, ah, 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 ah. Van Brunt shivered and rubbed the backs of his hands briskly. And they gave me up for dead? His companion asked slowly. Well, you never came back, so your friends promptly forgot. Fairfax laughed harshly, defiantly. Why didn't you come out? Partly disinclination, I suppose, and partly because of circumstances over which I had no control. You see, Tantalach here was down with a broken leg when I made his acquaintance, a nasty fracture, and I set it for him and got him into shape. I stayed some time getting my strength back. I was the first white man he had seen, and of course I seemed very wise and showed his people no end of things, coached them up in military tactics, among other things so that they conquered the four other tribal villages, which you have not yet seen, and came to rule the land. And they naturally grew to think a good deal of me, so much that when I was ready to go, they wouldn't hear of it. Were most hospitable, in fact. Put a couple of guards over me, and watched me day and night. And then Tantlatch offered me inducements, in a sense, inducements, so to say, as it didn't matter much way or the other, I reconciled myself to remaining. I knew your brother at Freeburg. I am Van Brunt. Fairfax reached forward impulsively and shook his hand. Your Billy's friend, eh? Poor Billy. He spoke of you often. Rum meeting place, though, he added, casting an embracing glance over the primordial landscape and listening for a moment to the woman's mournful notes. Her man was clawed by a bear, and she's taking it hard. Beastly life. Van Brunt grimaced his disgust. I suppose after five years of it, civilization will be sweet. What do you say? Fairfax's face took on a stolid expression. Oh, I don't know. At least they're honest folk and live according to their lights. And then they are amazingly simple. No complexity about them. No thousand and one subtle ramifications to every single emotion they experience. They love, fear, 
hate, are angered or made happy in common, ordinary, and unmistakable terms. It may be a beastly life, but at least it is easy to live. No philandering, no dallying. If a woman likes you, she'll not be backward in telling you so. If she hates you, she'll tell you so, and then, if you feel inclined, you can beat her. But the thing is, she knows precisely what you mean, and you know precisely what she means. No mistakes, no misunderstandings. It has its charm, after civilization's fitful fever. Comprehend? No, it's a pretty good life, he continued after a pause. Good enough for me, and I intend to stay with it. Van Brunt lowered his head in a musing manner, and an imperceptible smile played on his mouth. No philandering, no dallying, no misunderstanding. Fairfax also was taking it hard, he thought, just because Emily Southwaith had been mistakenly clawed by a bear. And not a bad sort of bear, either, was Carlton Southwaith. But you are coming along with me, Van Brunt said deliberately. No, I am not. Yes, you are. Life's too easy here, I tell you, Fairfax spoke with decision. I understand everything, and I am understood. Summer and winter alternate like the sun, flashing through the palings of a fence. The seasons are a blur of light and shade, and time slips by, and life slips by. And then, a wailing in the forest and the dark. Listen. He held up his hand, and the silver thread of the woman's sorrow rose through the silence and the calm. Fairfax joined in softly. Oh, ah, 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 ah. Oh, ha, 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 he sang. Can't you hear it? Can't you see it? The women mourning, the funeral chant. My hair white locked and patriarchal. My skins wrapped in roots splendor about me. My hunting spear by my side. And who shall say it is not well? Van Brunt looked at him coolly. Fairfax, you are a damned fool. Five years of this is enough to knock any man, and you are in an unhealthy, morbid condition. Further, Carlton Southwaith is dead. Van Brunt filled his pipe and lighted it, the while watching slyly and with almost professional interest. Fairfax's eyes flashed on the instant, his fists clenched. He half rose up. Then his muscles relaxed and he seemed to brood. Michael the cook signaled that the meal was ready, but Van Brunt motioned back to delay. The silence hung heavy, and he fell to analyzing the forest scents, the odors of mold and rotting vegetation, the resiny smells of pine cones and needles, the aromatic savors of many camp smokes. Twice Fairfax looked up, but said nothing, and then, And Emily? Three years a widow. Still a widow. Another long silence settled down to be broken by Fairfax, finally, with a naive smile. I guess you're right, Van Brunt. I'll go along. I knew you would, Van Brunt laid his hand on Fairfax's shoulder. Of course, one cannot know, but I imagine, for one in her position, she has had offers. When do you start? Fairfax interrupted. After the men have had some sleep, which reminds me, Michael is getting angry, so come and eat. After supper, when the Crees and voyageurs had rolled into their blankets, snoring, the two men lingered by the dying fire. There was much to talk about. Wars and politics and explorations, the doings of men and the happenings of things, mutual friends, marriages, deaths, five years of history for which Fairfax clamored. So the Spanish fleet was bottled up in Santiago, Van Brunt was saying, when a young woman stepped lightly before him and stood by Fairfax's side. She looked swiftly into his face, then turned a troubled gaze upon Van Brunt. "'Chief Tantlach's daughter, sort of princess,' Fairfax explained with an honest flush. "'One of the inducements, in short, to make me stay. Tom, this is Van Brunt, friend of mine.' Van Brunt held out his hand, but the woman maintained a rigid repose, quite in keeping with her general appearance. Not a line of her face softened, not a feature unbent. She looked him straight in the eyes, her own piercing, questioning, searching. Precious lot she understands, Fairfax laughed. Her first introduction, you know. But as you were saying, with the Spanish fleet bottled up in Santiago? Thom crouched down by her husband's side, motionless as a bronze statue, 
only her eyes flashing from face to face in ceaseless search. And Avery Van Brunt, as he talked on and on, felt a nervousness under the dumb gaze. In the midst of his most graphic battle descriptions, he would become suddenly conscious of the black eyes burning into him, and would stumble and flounder till he could catch the gate and go again. Fairfax, hands clasped round knees, pipe out, absorbed, spurred him on when he lagged, and repictured the world he thought he had forgotten. One hour passed, and two, and Fairfax rose reluctantly to his feet. And Kronya was cornered, eh? Well, just wait a minute till I run over to Tantalach. He'll be expecting you, and I'll arrange for you to see him after breakfast. I will be all right, won't it? He went off between the pines, and Van Brunt found himself staring into Thom's warm eyes. Five years, he mused, and she can't be more than twenty now. A most remarkable creature. Being Eskimo, she should have had a little flat excuse for a nose, and lo, it is neither broad nor flat, but aquiline with nostrils delicately and sensitively formed, as any fine ladies of a wider breed. The Indian strain somewhere, he assured. Avery Van Brunt. And... Avery Van Brunt, don't be nervous. She won't eat you. She's only a woman, and not a bad-looking one at that. Oriental, rather, than aborigine. Eyes large and fairly wide apart, with just the faintest hint of Mongol obliquity. Thom, you're an anomaly. You're out of place here among these Eskimos, even if your father is one. Where did your mother come from, or your grandmother? And Thom, my dear, you're a beauty, a frigid, frozen little beauty, with Alaskan lava in your blood. And please don't look at me that way. He laughed and stood up. Her insistent stare disconcerted him. A dog was prowling among the grub sacks. He would drive it away and place them into safety against Fairfax's return. But Thom stretched out a detaching hand, and stood up facing him. You, she said, in the arctic tongue which differs little from Greenland to Point Barrow, you, and the swift expression of her face demanded all for which you stood, his reason for existence, his presence there, his relation to her husband, everything. Brother, he answered in the same tongue, with a sweeping gesture to the south, brothers we be, your man and I, she shook her head. It is not good that you be here. After one sleep I go. And my man? She demanded with tremulous eagerness. Van Brunt shrugged his shoulders. He was aware of a certain secret shame, of an impersonal sort of shame, and an anger against Fairfax. And he felt the warm blood in his face as he regarded the young savage. She was just a woman. That was all. A woman. The whole sordid story, over again, over and over again, as old as Eve and young as the last new love light. My men, my men, my men, she was reiterating vehemently, her face passionately dark, and the ruthless tenderness of the eternal woman, the mate woman, looking out at him from her eyes. Tom, he said gravely in English, you were born in the Northland forest, and you have eaten fish and meat, and fought with frost and famine, and lived simply all the days of your life. And there are many things, indeed not simple, which you do not know, and cannot come to understand. You do not know what it is to long for the flesh pots afar. You cannot understand what it is to yearn for a fair woman's face. And the woman is fair. Thom, the woman is nobly fair. You have been woman to this man, and you have been your all. But your all is very little, very simple, too little and too simple. And he is an alien man. Him you have never known. You can never know. It is so ordained. You held him in your arms, but you never held his heart. This man with his blurring seasons and his dreams of a barbaric end. Dreams and dream dust. That is what he has been to you. You clutched at form and gripped shadow. Gave yourself to a man and bedded with the wraith of a man. In such manner of old did the daughters of men whom the gods found fair. And Thom, Thom, I should not like to be John Fairfax in the night watches of the years to come. In the night watches, when his eyes shall see, not the sun-gloried hair of the woman by his side, but the dark tresses of a mate forsaken in the forests of the north. Though she did not understand, she had listened with intense attention, as though life 
hung on his speech. But she caught at her husband's name and cried out in Eskimo, Yes, yes, Fairfax, my man. Poor little fool, how could he be your man? But she could not understand his English tongue and deemed that she was being trifled with. The dumb, insensate anger of the mate woman flamed in her face, and it almost seemed to the man as though she crouched panther-like for the spring. He cursed softly to himself and watched the fire fade from her face in the soft, luminous glow of the appealing woman spring up, of the appealing woman who foregoes strength and panoplies herself wisely in her weakness. He is my man, she said gently. Never have I known other. It cannot be that I should ever know other, nor can it be that he should go from me. Who has said he shall go from thee? he demanded sharply, half in exasperation, half in impotence. It is for thee to say he shall not go from me, she answered softly, a half sob in her throat. Van Brunt kicked the embers of the fire savagely and sat down. It is for thee to say, he is my man, before all women he is my man. Thou art big, thou art strong, and behold I am very weak. See, I am at thy feet. It is for thee to deal with me. It is for thee. Get up! He jerked her roughly erect and stood up himself. Thou art a woman, wherefore the dirt is no place for thee, nor the feet of any man. He is my man. Then Jesus forgive all men, Van Brunt cried out passionately. He is my man, she repeated monotonously, beseechingly. He is my brother, he answered. My father is Chief Tantalach. He is a power over five villages. I will see that the five villages be searched for thy choice of all maidens, that thou mayest stay here by thy brother, and dwell in comfort. After one sleep I go. And my man? Thy man comes now, behold! From among the gloomy spruces came the light caroling of Fairfax's voice. As the day is quenched by a sea of fog, so his song smote the light out of her face. It is the tongue of his own people, she said. The tongue of his own people. She turned with the free movement of a lithe young animal and made off into the forest. It's all fixed, Fairfax called as he came up. His regal highness will receive you after breakfast. Have you told him? Van Brunt asked. No, nor shall I tell him till we're ready to pull out. Van Brunt looked with moody affection over the sleeping forms of his men. I shall be glad when we are a hundred leagues upon our way, he said. Thom raised the skin flap of her father's lodge. Two men sat with him, and the three looked at her with swift interest. But her face betokened nothing as she entered and took seat quietly, without speech. Tantlach drummed with his knuckles on a spear heft across his knees, and gazed idly along the path of a sunray, which pierced a lacing hole and flung a glittering track across the murky atmosphere of the lodge. To his right, at his shoulder, crouched Chungungat, the shaman. Both were old men, and the weariness of many years brooded in their eyes, but opposite them sat Keen, a young man and chief favorite in the tribe. He was quick and alert of movement, and his black eyes flashed from face to face, in ceaseless scrutiny and challenge. Silence reigned in the place. Now and again camp noises penetrated, and from the distance, faint and far, like the shadows of voices, came the wrangling of boys in thin, shrill tones. A dog thrust his head into the entrance and blinked wolfishly at them for a space, the slaver dripping from his ivory-white fangs. After a time he growled tentatively, and then, awed by the immobility of the human figures, lowered his head and groveled away backward. Tantalach glanced apathetically at his daughter. And thy man, how is it with him and thee? He sings strange songs, Thom made answer, and there is a new look on his face. So he hath spoken. Nay, but there is a new look on his face, a new light in his eyes, and with the new comer, he sits by the fire, and they talk and talk, and the talk is without end. Chungungat whispered in his master's ear, and Keen leaned forward from his hips. There must be something calling him from afar, 
she went on, and he seems to sit and listen, and to answer, singing, in his own people's tongue. Again, Chung Gun got, whispered, and Keen leaned forward, and Thom held her speech till her father nodded his head, that she might proceed. It be known to thee, O Tantlach, that the wild goose and the swan and the little ringed duck be born here, in the low-lying lands. It be known that they go away before the face of the frost to unknown places. And it be known, likewise, that always do they return, when the sun is in the land and the waterways are free. Always do they return to where they were born, that new life may go forth. The land calls to them, and they come. And now there is another land that calls, and it is calling to my man, the land where he was born, and he hath it in mind to answer the call. Yet he is my man, before all women is he my man. Is it well, Tantlach? Is it well? Chungungat demanded, with the hint of menace in his voice. Ay, it is well, King cried boldly. The land calls to its children, and all lands call their children home again. As the wild goose and the swan and the little ringed duck are called, so is called this stranger man who has lingered with us and who now must go. Also, there be the call of kind, the goose mates with the goose, nor does the swan mate with the little ringed duck. It is not well that the swan should mate with the little ringed duck, nor is it well that the stranger men should mate with the women of our villages. Wherefore I say the man should go, to his own kind, in his own land. He is my own man, Thom answered, and he is a great man. Aye, he is a great man, Chungungat lifted his head with a faint recrudescence of youthful vigor. He is a great man, and he put strength in thy arm, O Tantlach, and gave thee power, and made thy name to be feared in the land, to be feared and to be respected. He is very wise, and there be much profit in his wisdom. To him are we beholden for many things, for the cunning in war, and the secrets of the defense of a village, and a rush in the forest, for the discussion in council, and the undoing of enemies by word of mouth and the hard-sworn promise, for the gathering of game, and the making of traps, and the preserving of food, for the curing of sickness and mending of hurts of trail and fight. Thou, Tantlach, wert a lame old man this day, were it not that the stranger man came into our midst and attended on thee. And ever, when in doubt on strange questions, have we gone to him, that out of his wisdom he might make things clear. And ever has he made things clear. And there be questions yet to arise, and needs upon his wisdom yet to come, and we cannot bear to let him go. It is not well that we should let him go. Tantlach continued to drum on the spear haft, and gave no sign that he had heard. Thumb studied his face in vain, and Chungungat seemed to shrink together and drooped down as the weight of years descended upon him again. "'No man makes my kill,' Keen smote his breast as a valorous blow. "'I make my own kill. I am glad to live when I make my own kill. When I creep through the snow upon the great moose, I am glad, and when I draw the bow, so, with my full strength, and drive the arrow fierce and swift and to the heart, I am glad. And the meat of no man's kill tastes as sweet as the meat of my kill.' I am glad to live, glad in my own cunning and strength, glad that I am a doer of things, a doer of things for myself. Of what other reason to live than that? Why should I live if I delight not in myself and the things I do? And it is because I delight and am glad that I go forth to hunt and fish. And it is because I go forth to hunt and fish that I grow cunning and strong. The man who stays in the lodge by the fire grows not cunning and strong. He is not made happy in the eating of my kill, nor is living to him a delight. He does not live. And so I say it is well this stranger man should go. His wisdom does not make us wise. If he be cunning, there is no need that we be cunning. If need arise, we go to him for his cunning. We eat the meat of his kill, and it tastes unsweet. We merit by his strength, and in it there is no delight. We do not live... When he does our living for us, we grow fat and like women, and we are afraid to work, and we forget how to do things for ourselves. Let the man go, O Tantlach, that we may be men. I am keen, a man, and I make my own kill. Tantlach turned a gaze upon him, in which seemed the vacancy of eternity. Keen waited the decision expectantly, but the lips did not move, and the old chief turned toward his daughter. That which be given cannot be taken away 
she burst forth. I was but a girl when the stranger man, who was my man, came among us. And I knew not men, or the ways of men, and my heart was in the play of girls. When thou, Tentlatch, thou and none other, didst call me to thee, and press me into the arms of the stranger man. Thou and none other, Tentlatch, and as thou didst give me to the man, so didst thou give the man to me. He is my man, in my arms has he slept, and from my arms he cannot be taken. It were well, O Tantalach, Keen followed quickly with a significant glance at Tom. It were well to remember that that which be given cannot be taken away. Chugangat straightened up. Out of thy youth, Keen, come the words of thy mouth. As for ourselves, O Tantalach, we be old men, and we understand. We too have looked into the eyes of women, and felt our blood go hot with strange desires. But the years have chilled us, and we have learned the wisdom of the council the shrewdness of the cool head and hand, and we know that the warm heart be overwarm and prone to rashness. We know that Keen found favor in thy eyes. We know that Dom was promised him in the old days when she was yet a child. And we know that the new days came, and the stranger man, and that out of our wisdom and desire for welfare was Dom lost to Keen and the promise broken. The old shaman paused and looked directly at the young man. And be it known that I, Chugan Gat, did advise that the promise be broken. Nor have I taken other women to my bed, Keen broke in, and I have builded my own fire, and cooked my own food, and ground my teeth in my loneliness. Chugan Gat waved his hand that he had not finished. I am an old man, and I speak from understanding. It be good to be strong, and grasp for power. It be better to forego power, that good come out of it. In the old days I sat at thy shoulder, Tantalach, and my voice was heard over all in the council, and my advice taken in affairs of moment, and I was strong and held power. Under Tantalach I was the greatest man. Then came the stranger man, and I saw that he was cunning and wise and great, and in that he was wiser and greater than I. It was plain that greater profit should arise from him than from me. And I had thy ear, Tantalach, and thou didst listen to my words, and the stranger man was given power and place, and thy daughter, Thom. And the tribe prospered under the new laws and the new days, and so shall it continue to prosper with the stranger man in our midst. We be old men, we too, old Tantalach, thou and I, and this be an affair of head, not heart. Hear my words, Tantalach, hear my words. The man remains. There was a long silence. The old chief pondered with the massive certitude of God, and Chugungat seemed to wrap himself in the mists of a great antiquity. Keen looked with yearning upon the woman, and she, unnoting, held her eyes steadfastly upon her father's face. The wolf-dog shoved the flap aside again, and plucking courage at the quiet wormed forward on his belly. He sniffed curiously at Thom's listless hand, and cocked ears challengingly at Chugungat and hunched down upon his haunches before Tantlach. The spear rattled to the ground, and the dog, with a frightened yell, sprang sideways, snapping in mid-air, and on the second leap cleared the entrance. Tantlach looked from face to face, pondering each one long and carefully. Then he raised his head with rude royalty, and gave judgment in cold and even tones. The man remains. Let the hunters be called together. Send a runner to the next village with word to bring on the fighting men. I shall not see the newcomer. Do thou, Chugungat, have talk with him. Tell him he may go at once, if he would go in peace. And if fight there be, kill, kill, kill to the last man. But let my word go forth, that no harm befall our man, the man whom my daughter hath wedded. It is well. Chugungat rose and tottered out. Thumb followed. But as Keen stooped to the entrance, the voice of Tantalach stopped him. Keen, it were well to hearken to my word. The man remains. Let no harm befall him. Because of Fairfax's instructions in the art of war, the tribesmen did not hurl themselves forward boldly and with clamor. Instead, there was great restraint and self-control, and they were content to advance silently, creeping and crawling from shelter to shelter. By the river bank and partly protected by a narrow open space, crouched the Crees and voyageurs. 
Their eyes could see nothing, and only in vague ways did their ears hear, but they felt the thrill of life which ran through the forest, the indistinct, indefinable movement of an advancing host. Damn them, Fairfax muttered. They have never faced powder, but I taught them the trick. Avery Van Brunt laughed, knocked the ashes out of his pipe, and put it carefully away with the pouch, and loosened the hunting knife in its sheath at his hip. Wait, he said. We'll wither the face of the charge and break their hearts. They'll rush scattered if they remember my teaching. Let them. Magazine rifles were made to pump. We'll... Good, first blood, extra tobacco, loon. Loon, a Cree, had spotted an exposed shoulder, and with a stinging bullet apprised its owner of his discovery. If we can tease them into breaking forward, Fairfax muttered. If we can only tease them into breaking forward. Van Brunt saw a head peer from behind a distant tree, and with a quick shot sent the man sprawling to the ground in a death struggle. Michael potted a third, and Fairfax and the rest took a hand, firing at every exposure and into each clump of agitated brush. In crossing one little swale out of cover, five of the tribesmen remained on their faces, and to the left, where the covering was sparse, a dozen men were struck. But they took the punishment with sullen steadiness, coming on cautiously, deliberately, without haste and without lagging. Ten minutes later, when they were quite close, all movement was suspended. The advance ceased abruptly, and the quietness that followed was portentous, threatening. Only could be seen the green and gold of the woods and undergrowth, shivering and trembling to the first faint puffs of the day wind. The wan white morning sun mottled the earth with long shadows and streaks of light. A wounded man lifted his head and crawled painfully out of the swale, Michael following him with his rifle, but forbearing to shoot. A whistle ran along the invisible line from left to right, and a flight of arrows arched through the air. "'Get ready,' Van Brunt commanded, a new metallic note in his voice. "'Now!' They broke cover simultaneously. The forest heaved into sudden life. A great yell went up, and the rifles barked back sharp defiance. Tribesmen knew their deaths in mid-leap, and as they fell, their brothers surged over them in a roaring, irresistible wave. In the forefront of the rush, hair flying and arms swinging free, flashing past the tree trunks and leaping the obstructing logs, came Thumb. Fairfax sighted on her and almost pulled the trigger ere he knew her. "'The woman! Don't shoot!' he cried. "'See, she is unarmed!' The Crees never heard, nor Michael and his brother Voyageur, nor Van Brunt who was keeping one shell continuously in the air. But Thom bore straight on, unharmed, as the heels of a skin-clad hunter who had veered in before her from the side. Fairfax emptied his magazine into the men to the right and left of her, and swung his rifle to meet the big hunter. But the man, seeming to recognize him, swerved suddenly aside and plunged his spear into the body of Michael. On the moment, Thom had one arm passed around her husband's neck, and twisting half about, with voice and gesture, was splitting the mass of charging warriors. A score of men hurled past on either side in Fairfax, for a brief instant's space, stood looking upon her in her bronze beauty, thrilling, exulting, stirred to unknown deeps, visioning strange things, dreaming, immortally dreaming. Snatches and scraps of old-world philosophies and new-world ethics floated through his mind, and things wonderfully concrete and woefully incongruous, hunting scenes, Stretches of somber forest, vastnesses of silent snow, the glittering of ballroom lights, great galleries and lecture halls, a fleeting shimmer of glistening test tubes, long rows of book-lined shelves, the throb of machinery, and the roar of traffic, a fragment of forgotten song, faces of dear women and old chums, a lonely watercourse amid upstanding peaks, a shattered boat on a pebbly strand, quiet moonlit fields. Fat veils, the smell of hay. A hunter, struck between the eyes with a rifle ball, pitched forward lifeless, and with the momentum of his charge slid along the ground. Fairfax came back to himself. His comrades, those that lived, had been swept far back among the trees beyond. He could hear the fierce, hya hya of the hunters as they closed in and cut and thrust with their weapons of bone and ivory. The cries of the stricken men smote him like blows, he knew the fight was over, the cause was lost. But all his race traditions and race loyalty impelled him into the welter, that he might die at least with his kind. 
My man, my man, Thom cried. Thou art safe. He tried to struggle on, but her dead weight clogged his steps. There is no need. They are dead, and life be good. She held him close around the neck and twined her limbs about his till he tripped and stumbled, reeled violently to recover footing, tripped again, and fell backward to the ground. His head struck a jutting root, and he was half stunned and could struggle but feebly. In the fall she had heard the feathered swish of an arrow darting past, and she covered his body with hers, as with a shield, her arms holding him tightly, her face and lips pressed upon his neck. Then it was that Keen rose up from a tangled thicket a score of feet away. He looked about him with care. The fight had swept on, and the cry of the last man was dying away. There was no one to see. He fitted an arrow to the string and glanced at the man and woman. Between her breast and arm, the flesh of the man's side showed white. Keen bent the bow and drew back the arrow to its head. Twice he did so, calmly and for certainty, and then drove the bone-barbed missile straight home to the white flesh, gleaming yet more white in the dark-armed, dark-breasted embrace. End of section one. Chapter Two of Children of the Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Children of the Frost by Jack London. The Law of Life. Old Koshkush listened greedily. Though his sight had long since faded, his hearing was still acute, and the slightest sound penetrated to the glimmering intelligence which yet abode behind the withered forehead, but which no longer gazed forth upon the things of the world. Ah, that was Sikkumtuha, shrilly anathematizing the dogs as she cuffed and beat them into the harnesses. Sikkumtuha was his daughter's daughter, but she was too busy to waste a thought upon her broken grandfather, sitting alone there in the snow, forlorn and helpless. Camp must be broken. The long trail waited while the short day refused to linger. Life called her and the duties of life, not death. And he was very close to death now. The thought made the old man panicky for the moment, and he stretched forth a palsied hand, which wandered tremblingly over the small heap of dry wood beside him. Reassured that it was indeed there, his hand returned to the shelter of his mangy furs, and he again fell to listening. The sulky crackling of half-frozen hides told him that the chief's moose-skin lodge had been struck, and even then was being rammed and jammed into portable compass. The chief was his son, stalwart and strong, head man of the tribesmen, and a mighty hunter, as the women toiled with the camp luggage, his voice rose, chiding them for their slowness. Old Koshkush strained his ears. It was the last time he would hear that voice. There went Gihau's lodge, and Tuskin's. Seven, eight, nine, only the shamans could be still standing. There. They were at work upon it now. He could hear the shaman grunt as he piled it on the sled. A child whimpered, and a woman soothed it with soft, crooning gutturals. Little Kuti, the old man thought, a fretful child, and not overstrong. It would die soon, perhaps, and they would burn a hole through the frozen tundra, and pile rocks above 
who keep the wolverines away. Well, what did it matter? A few years at best, and as many an empty belly as a full one. And in the end, death waited, ever hungry and hungriest of them all. What was that? Oh, the men lashing the sleds and drawing tight the thongs. He listened, who would listen no more. The whiplashes snarled and bit among the dogs. Hear them whine. How they hated the work and the trail. They were off. Sled after sled turned slowly away into the silence. They were gone. They had passed out of his life, and he faced the last bitter hour alone. No, the snow crunched beneath a moccasin. A man stood beside him, upon his head, a hand rested gently. His son was good to do this thing. He remembered other old men whose sons had not waited after the tribe, but his son had. He wandered away into the past till the young man's voice brought him back. Is it well with you? he asked. And the old man answered, It is well. There be wood beside you, the younger man continued, and the fire burns bright. The morning is grey, and the cold has broken. It will snow presently. Even now is it snowing. Aye, even now it is snowing. The tribesmen hurry. Their bales are heavy, and their bellies flat with lack of feasting. The trail is long, and they travel fast. I go now. It is well? It is well. I am as last year's leaf, clinging lightly to the stem. The first breath that blows, and I fall. My voice has become like an old woman's. My eyes no longer show me the way of my feet and my feet are heavy, and I am tired. It is well. He bowed his head in content, till the last noise of the complaining snow had died away, and he knew his son was beyond recall. Then his hand crept out in haste to the wood, it alone stood between him and the eternity that yawned in upon him. At last the measure of his life was a handful of faggots. One by one they would go to feed the fire, and just so, step by step, death would creep upon him. When the last stick had surrendered up its heat, the frost would begin to gather strength. First his feet would yield, then his hands, and the numbness would travel slowly from the extremities to the body. His head would fall forward upon his knees, and he would rest. It was easy. All men must die. He did not complain. It was the way of life, and it was just. He had been born close to the earth. Close to the earth had he lived, and the law thereof was not new to him. It was the law of all flesh. Nature was not kindly to the flesh. She had no concern for that concrete thing called the individual. Her interest lay in the species, the race. This was the deepest abstraction old Koshkush's barbaric mind was capable of, but he grasped it 
firmly. He saw it exemplified in all life. The rise of the sap, the bursting greenness of the willow bud, the fall of the yellow leaf. In this alone was told the whole history. But one task did nature set the individual. Did he not perform it? He died. Did he perform it? It was all the same. He died. Nature did not care. There were plenty who were obedient, and it was only the obedience in this matter, not the obedient, which lived and lived always. The tribe of Koshkush was very old. The old men he had known when a boy had known old men before them. Therefore it was true that the tribe lived, that it stood for the obedience of all its members, way down into the forgotten past, whose very resting places were unremembered. They did not count. They were episodes. They had passed away like clouds from a summer day. He also was an episode, and would pass away. Nature did not care. To life she set one task, gave one law. To perpetuate was the task of life. Its law was death. A maiden was a good creature to look upon, full-breasted and strong with spring to her step and light in her eyes. But her task was yet before her. The light in her eyes brightened, her step quickened. She was now bold with the young men, now timid, and she gave them of her own unrest. And ever she grew fairer and yet fairer to look upon till some hunter, able no longer to withhold himself, took her to his lodge, to cook and toil for him, and to become the mother of his children. And with the coming of her offspring, her looks left her, her limbs dragged and shuffled, her eyes dimmed and bleared, and only the little children found joy against the withered cheek of the old squaw by the fire. Her task was done. But a little while, on the first pinch of famine, or the first long trail, and she would be left, even as he had been left, in the snow, with a little pile of wood. Such was the law. He placed a stick carefully upon the fire and resumed his meditations. It was the same everywhere, with all things. The mosquitoes vanished with the first frost. The little tree squirrel crawled away to die. When age settled upon the rabbit, it became slow and heavy and could no longer outfoot its enemies. Even the big, bald face grew clumsy and blind and quarrelsome, in the end to be dragged down by a handful of yelping huskies. He remembered how he had abandoned his own father on the upper reach of the Klondike one winter, the winter before the missionary came with his talk books and his box of medicines. Many a time had Koshkush smacked his lips over the recollection of that box, though now his mouth refused to moisten. The painkiller had been especially good. But the missionary was a bother after all, for he brought no meat into the camp, and he ate heartily, and the hunters grumbled but he chilled his lungs on the divide by the mayo, 
and the dogs afterwards nosed the stones away and fought over his bones. Koshkush placed another stick on the fire and harked back deeper into the past. There was the time of the great famine, when the old men crouched empty-bellied to the fire and let fall from their lips dim traditions of the ancient day when the Yukon ran wide open for three winters and then lay frozen for three summers. He had lost his mother in that famine. In the summer, the salmon run had failed, and the tribe looked forward to the winter and the coming of the caribou. Then the winter came, but with it there were no caribou. Never had the like been known, not even in the lives of the old men. But the caribou did not come, and it was the seventh year, and the rabbits had not replenished, and the dogs were not but bundles of bones. And through the long darkness the children wailed and died, and the women and the old men, and not one in ten of the tribe lived to meet the sun when it came back in the spring. That was a famine. But he had seen times of plenty, too, when the meat spoiled on their hands, and the dogs were fat and worthless with overeating, times when they let the game go unkilled, and the women were fertile, and the lodges were cluttered with sprawling men-children and women-children. Then it was the men became high-stomached, and revived ancient quarrels, and crossed the divides to the south to kill the Pellies, and to the west that they might sit by the dead fires of the Tananas. He remembered when a boy, during a time of plenty, when he saw a moose pulled down by the wolves, Zing Ha lay with him in the snow and watched. Zing Ha, who later became the craftiest of hunters, and who, in the end, fell through an air hole on the Yukon. They found him a month afterward, just as he had crawled halfway out and frozen stiff to the ice. But the moose, Zing Ha and he had gone out that day to play at hunting after the manner of their fathers. On the bed of the creek they struck the fresh track of a moose, and with it the tracks of many wolves. An old one, Zing Ha, who was quicker at reading the sign, said, an old one who cannot keep up with the herd. The wolves have cut him out from his brothers, and they will never leave him. And it was so. It was their way. By day and by night, never resting, snarling on his heels, snapping at his nose, they would stay by him to the end. Housing Ha and he felt the bloodlust quicken. The finish would be a sight to see. Eager-footed, they took the trail, and even he, Koshkush, slow of sight and an unversed tracker, could have followed it blind. It was so wide. Hot were they on the heels of the chase, reading the grim tragedy, fresh written at every step. Now they came to where the moose had made a stand. Thrice the length of a grown man's body in every direction had the snow been stamped about and up-tossed. In the midst were the deep impressions of the splay-hoofed game, and all about, everywhere, were the lighter footmarks of the wolves. Some, while their brothers harried the kill, 
had lain to one side and rested. The full-stretched impress of their bodies in the snow was as perfect as though made the moment before. One wolf had been caught in a wild lunge of the maddened victim and trampled to death. A few bones, well picked, bore witness. Again they ceased the uplift of their snowshoes at a second stand. Here the great animal had fought desperately. Twice had he been dragged down, as the snow attested, and twice had he shaken his assailants clear and gained footing once more. He had done his task long since, but none the less was life dear to him. Xing Ha said it was a strange thing, a moose once down to get free again, but this one certainly had. The shaman would see signs and wonders in this when they told him. And yet again they come to where the moose had made to mount the bank and gain the timber, but his foes had laid on from behind till he reared and fell back upon them, crushing two deep into the snow. It was plain the kill was at hand, for their brothers had left them untouched. Two more stands were hurried past, brief in time length and very close together. The trail was red now, and the clean stride of the great beast had grown short and slovenly. Then they heard the first sounds of the battle, not the full-throated chorus of the chase, but the short, snappy bark which spoke of close quarters and teeth to flesh. Crawling up the wind, Xing Ha bellied it through the snow, and with him crept he, Koshkush, who was to be chief of the tribesmen in the years to come. Together they shoved aside the underbranches of a young spruce and peered forth. It was the end they saw. The picture, like all of youth's impressions, was still strong with him, and his dim eyes watched the end played out as vividly as in that far-off time. Koshkush marveled at this. For in the days which followed, when he was a leader of men and a head of counselors, he had done great deeds and made his name a curse in the mouth of the Pelles, to say naught of the strange white man he had killed, knife to knife in open fight. For long he pondered on the days of his youth, till the fire died down and the frost bit deeper. He replenished it with two sticks this time, and gauged his grip on life by what remained. If Sit come to Ha had only remembered her grandfather and gathered a larger armful, his hours would have been longer. It would have been easy, but she was ever a careless child, and honored not her ancestors from the time the beaver son of the son of Xing Ha, first cast eyes upon her. Well, what mattered it? Had he not done likewise in his own quick youth? For a while he listened to the silence. Perhaps the heart of his son might soften, and he would come back with the dogs to take his old father on with the tribe to where the caribou ran thick and the fat hung heavy upon them. He strained his ears, his restless brain for the moment stilled. Not a stir, nothing. He alone took breath in the midst of the great silence. It was very lonely. Hark! What was that? A chill passed over his body. The familiar, long-drawn howl broke the void, and it was close at hand. Then on his darkened eyes was projected the vision of the moose, 
the old bull moose, the torn flanks and bloody sides, the riddled mane and the great branching horns down low and tossing to the last. He saw the flashing forms of gray, the gleaming eyes, the lolling tongues, the slavered fangs. And he saw the inexorable circle close in till it became a dark point in the midst of the stamped snow. A cold muzzle thrust against his cheek, and at its touch his soul leaped back to the present. His hand shot into the fire and dragged out a burning faggot. Overcome for the nonce by his hereditary fear of man, the brute retreated, raising a prolonged call to his brothers, and greedily they answered, till a ring of crouching, jaw-slobbered gray was stretched round about. The old man listened to the drawing in of this circle. He waved his brand wildly, and the sniffs turned to snarls. But the panting brutes refused to scatter. Now one wormed his chest forward, dragging his haunches after, now a second, now a third, but never a one drew back. Why should he cling to life, he asked, and dropped the blazing stick into the snow. It sizzled and went out. The circle grunted uneasily, but held its own. Again he saw the last stand of the old bull moose, and Koshkush dropped his head wearily upon his knees. What did it matter, after all? Was it not the law of life? End of chapter 2 Read by Kiri Adams Your book voice At Mesa, Arizona On the 15th of October, 2022
She struggled to her feet and tottered down the sand. She stumbled over a baby lying in the sun, and the mother hushed its crying and hurled harsh words after the old woman, who took no notice. The children ran down the beach in advance of her, and as the man in the bidarka drew closer, nearly capsizing with one of his ill-directed strokes, the women followed. Kuga dropped his walrus tusk and went also, leaning heavily upon his staff, and after him loitered the men in twos and threes. The bedarka turned a broadside and the ripple of surf threatened to swamp it. Only a naked boy ran into the water and pulled the bow. The man stood up and sent a questioning glance along the line of villagers. A rainbow sweater, dirty and worse for wear, clung loosely to his broad shoulders, and a red cotton handkerchief was knotted in a sailor fashion about his throat. A fisherman's tamar shanter on his close-clipped head and dungaree trousers and heavy brogans completed his outfit. But he was nonetheless a striking personage to these simple fisher folk of the great Yukon Delta, who, all their lives, had stared out on the Bering Sea and in that time seen but two white men, the census enumerator and a lost Jesuit priest. They were a poor people, with neither gold in the crown nor valuable furs in hand, so the whites had passed them afar. Also, Yukon, through the thousands of years, had shoaled that portion of the sea with the detritus of Alaska till vessels grounded out of sight of land. So the sodden coast, with its long inside reaches and huge mudland archipelagos, was avoided by the ships of men, and the fisher folk knew not that such things were. Kuga, the bone scratcher, retreated backward in sudden haste, tripping over his staff and falling to the ground. Nambok, he cried as he scrambled wildly for footing. Nambok, who was blown off to sea, come back. The men and women shrank away and the children scuttled off between their legs. Only Opiquan was brave, as befitted the head man of the village. He strode forward and gazed long and earnestly at the newcomer. It is Nambok, he said at last. At the conviction in his voice, the women wailed apprehensively and drew further away. The lips of the stranger moved indecisively, and his brown throat writhed and wrestled with the unspoken words. Lala, it is Nambok, Basquawan, croaked, peering up into his face. Ever did I say Nambok would come back. Ah, it is Nambok come back. This time it was Nambok himself who spoke, putting a leg over the side of the Badarka and standing with one foot afloat and one ashore. Again his throat writhed and wrestled as he grappled after forgotten words, and when the words came forth they were strange of sound and spluttering of the lips accompanied the gutturals. Greeting of brothers, he said, brothers of old time, before I went away with the offshore wind. He stepped out with both feet on the sand, and Opiquan waved him back. Thou art dead, Nembok, he said. Nembok laughed. I am fat. Dead men are not fat, Opiquan confessed. Thou hast fared well, but it is strange. No man may mate with the offshore wind and come back on the heels of years. I have come back, Nambok answered simply. Mayhap thou art a shadow then, a passing shadow of the Nambok that was. Shadows come back. I am hungry. Shadows do not eat, but Opiquan doubted and brushed his hand across his brow in sore puzzlement. Nambok was likewise puzzled, and as he looked up and down the line, found no welcome in the eyes of the fisher folk. The men and women whispered together. The children stole timidly back among their elders, and bristling dogs fawned up to him and sniffed suspiciously. I bore thee, Nambok and I gave thee suck when thou wast little, Basquawan whimpered, drawing closer, and shadow though thou be, or no shadow, I will give thee to eat now. Nambok made to come to her, but a growl of fear and menace warned him back. He said something in a strange tongue, which sounded like, God damn, and added, No shadow am I, 
but a man. Who may know concerning the things of mystery? Opiquan demanded, half of himself and half of his tribe's people. We are, and in a breath, we are not. If the man may become a shadow, may not the shadow become a man? Nambok was, but is not. This we know, but we do not know if this be Nambok or the shadow of Nambok. Nambok cleared his throat and made the answer. In the old time long ago, thy father's father, Opiquan, went away and came back on the heels of the years. Nor was a place by the fire denied him. It is said, he paused significantly, and they hung on to his utterance. It is said, he repeated, driving his point home with deliberation, that Sip-Sip, his klooch, bore him two sons after he came back. But he had no doings with the offshore wind, Apequan retorted. He went away into the heart of the land, and it is in the nature of things that a man may go on and on into the land. And likewise the sea. But that is neither here nor there. It is said that thy father's father told strange tales of the things he saw. Aye, strange tales he told. I too have strange tales to tell. Nimbok stated insidiously, and, as they wavered, and presents likewise. He pulled from the Badarka a shawl, marvelous of texture and color, and flung it about his mother's shoulders. The women voiced a collective sigh of admiration, and old Basquawan ruffled the gay material, and patted it, and crooned in childish joy. He has tales to tell, Kuka muttered. In presence, a woman seconded, and Opiquan knew that his people were eager, and further, he was himself aware of an itching curiosity concerning those untold tales. The fishing has been good, he said judiciously, and we have oil in plenty, so come, Nembok, let us feast. Two of the men hoisted the badarka on their shoulders and carried it up to the fire. Nembok walked by the side of Opiquan and the villagers followed after, save those women who lingered a moment to lay caressing fingers on the shawl. There was little talk while the feast went on, though many and curious were the glances stolen at the son of Basquawan. This embarrassed him, not because he was modest of spirit, however, but for the fact that the stench of the seal oil had robbed him of his appetite and that he keenly desired to conceal his feelings on the subject. Eat, thou art hungry, Opiquan commanded, and Nambok shut both his eyes and shoved his fist into the big pot of putrid fish. Lala, be not ashamed. The seal were many this year, and strong men are ever hungry. And Basquawan sopped a particularly offensive chunk of salmon into the oil, and passed it fondly and dripping to her son. In despair, when premature symptoms warmed him that his stomach was not so strong as of old, he filled his pipe and struck up a smoke. The people fed noisily and watched. Few of them could boast of intimate acquaintance with the precious weed, though now and again small quantities and abominable quantities were obtained in trade from the Eskimos to the northward. Kuga, sitting next to him, indicated that he was not adverse to taking a draw, and between two mouthfuls, with the oil thick on his lips, sucked away at the amber stem, and thereupon Nambok held his stomach with a shaky hand and declined the preferred return. Kuga could keep the pipe, he said, for he had intended so to honor him from the first, and the people licked their fingers and approved of his liberality. Opiquan rose to his feet, and now, Nambok, the feast is ended, and we would listen concerning the strange things you have seen. The fisherfolk applauded with their hands, and gathering about them their work, prepared to listen. The men were busy fashioning spears and carving on ivory, while the women scraped the fat from the hides of hair seal and made them pliable or sewed mukluks with threads of sinew. 
Nambok's eyes roved over the scene, but there was not the charm about it that his recollection had warranted him to expect. During the years of his wandering, he had looked forward to just this scene, and now that it had come, he was disappointed. It was a bare and meager life, he deemed, and not to be compared to the one which he had become used to. Still, he would open their eyes a bit, and his own eyes sparkled at the thought. Brothers, he began, with the smug complacency of a man about to relate the big things he has done. It was late summer of many summers back, with much such weather as this promises to be when I went away. You all remember the day, when the gulls flew low and the wind blew strong from the land. I could not hold my bedarka against it. I tied the covering of the bedarka about me so that no water could get in, and all of the night I fought with the storm, and in the morning there was no land, only the sea and the offshore wind held me close in its arms and bore me along. Three such nights whitened into dawn and showed me no land, and the offshore wind would not let me go. And when the fourth day come I was as a madman, I could not dip my paddle for want of food, and my head went round and round. What if the thirst was upon me? But the sea was no longer angry, and the soft south wind was blowing and as I looked about me I saw a sight that made me think I was indeed mad. Nambok paused to pick away a sliver of salmon lodged between his teeth, and the men and women with idle hands and heads craned forward, waited. It was a canoe, a big canoe. Of all the canoes I've ever seen were made into one canoe, it would not be so large. There were exclamations of doubt, and Kuga whose years were many, shook his head. If each Badarka were as a grain of sand, Nambok defiantly continued, and if there were as many Badarkas as there be grains of sand in this beach, still would they not make so big a canoe as I saw on the morning of the fourth day. It was a very big canoe, and it was called a schooner. I saw this thing of wonder, this great schooner coming after me, and on it I saw men. Hold on, Nambok, Opiquan broke in. What manner of men were they? Big men? Nay, mere men, like you and me. Did the big canoe come fast? Aye. The sides were tall, the men short, Opiquan stated the premises with conviction. And did these men dip with long paddles? Nambok grinned. There were no paddles, he said. Mouths remained open, and a long silence dropped down. Opie Kwan borrowed Kuga's pipe for a couple of contemplative sucks. One of the younger women giggled nervously and drew upon herself angry eyes. There were no paddles, Opie Kwan asked softly, returning the pipe. The south wind was behind, Nambok explained but wind drift is slow. The schooner had wings, thus. He sketched a diagram of masts and sails in the sand, and the men crowded around and studied it. The wind was blowing briskly, and for more graphic elucidation, he seized the corners of his mother's shawl and spread them out till it bellied like a sail. Basquawan scolded and struggled, but was blown down the beach for a score of feet and left breathless and stranded in a heap of driftwood. The men uttered sage grunts of comprehension, but Kuga suddenly tossed back his hoary head. Ha oh, oh, ha, he laughed. A foolish thing, this big canoe, a most foolish thing, a plaything of the wind. Wheresoever the wind goes, it goes too. No man who journeys therein may name the landing beach, for always, he goes with the wind, and the wind goes everywhere, but no man knows where. It is so, Opiquan supplemented gravely. Where the wind is going is easy, but against the wind a man striveth hard, and for that they had no paddles. These men on the big canoe did not strive at all. Small need to strive, Nambok cried angrily. The schooner went likewise against the wind. And what said you made the sk 
schooner go, Kuga asked, tripping craftily over the strange word. The wind was the impatient response. Then the wind made the schooner go against the wind. Old Kuga dropped an open leer to Obi Kwan, and the laughter growing around him continued. The wind blows from the south and blows the schooner south. The wind blows against the wind. The wind blows one way and the other at the same time. It's very simple. We understand, Nambok. We clearly understand. Thou art a fool. Truth falls from thy lips, Kuga answered meekly. I was overlong in understanding, and the thing was simple. But Nambok's face was dark, and he said rapid words which they had never heard before. Bone scratching and skin scraping resumed, but he shut his lips tightly on the tongue that could not be believed. This sc- schooner, Kuga imperturbably asked, it was made of a big tree. It was made of many trees, Nembok snapped shortly. It was very big. He lapsed into sullen silence again, and Opiquan nudged Kuga, who shook his head with slow amazement and murmured, It is very strange. Nambok took the bait. That is nothing, he said airily. You should see the steamer, as the grain of sand is to the Badarka, as the Badarka is to the schooner. So the schooner is to the steamer. Further, the steamer is made of iron. It is all iron. Nay, nay, Nambok, cried the head man. How could it be? Always iron goes to the bottom, for behold, I received an iron knife in trade from the head man of the next village, and yesterday the iron knife slipped from my fingers and went down, down into the sea. To all things there be law. Never was there one thing outside the law. This we know, and moreover we know things of a kind have one law, and that all iron has one law, so unsay thy words, Nambok, that we may yet honor thee. It is so, Nambok persisted, the steamer is all iron and doesn't sink. Nay, nay, this cannot be. With my own eyes I saw it. It is not in the nature of things. But tell me, Nambok, Kuga interrupted, for fear the tale would go no further. Tell me the manner of these men finding their way across the sea when there is no land by which to steer. The sun points out the path. But how? At midday the head man of the schooner takes a thing through which his eyes look at the sun. Then he makes the sun climb down out of the sky to the edge of the earth. Now this be evil medicine, cried Obiquan, aghast at the sacrilege. The men held their hands in horror, and the women moaned, This be evil medicine. It is not good to misdirect the great sun which drives away the night and gives us the seal, the salmon, and the warm weather. What if it be evil medicine? Nambok demanded truculently. I, too, have looked through the thing at the sun and made the sun climb down out of the sky. Those who were nearest drew from him hurriedly, and a woman covered the face of a child at her breast, so that his eye may not fall upon it. But on the morning of the fourth day, O Nambok, Kuga suggested, on the morning of the fourth day, when the schooner came after thee, I had little strength left in me and could not run away, so I was taken aboard, and water was poured down my throat and good food given to me. Twice, my brothers, you have seen a white man. These men were all white, and as many as I have, fingers and toes, and when I saw they were full of kindness, I took heart, and I resolved to bring away with me report of all that I saw, and they taught me the work that they did, and gave me good food and a place to sleep. And day after day we went over the sea, and each day the head man drew the sun down out of the sky and made it tell where we were. And when the waves were kind, we hunted for fur seal, and I marveled much, for always did they fling the meat and fat away, and save only the skin. Opi Kwan's mouth was twitching violently, and he was about to make denunciation of such waste when Kuga kicked him to be still. After a weary time, when the sun was gone and the bite of frost came into the air, the headman pointed the nose of the schooner south. 
south and east we travelled for days upon days with never the land in sight and we were near to the village from which hailed the men how did they know they were near opiquan unable to contain himself longer demanded there was no land to see nam buck glowered on him wrathfully did i not say the head man brought the sun down out of the sky Kuka interposed, and Nambok went on. As I say, when we were near to that village, a great storm blew up, and in the night we were helpless and knew not where we were. Thou just said the head man knew. Ah, oh, peace, oh, be Quan, thou art a fool and cannot understand. As I say, we were helpless in the night, when I heard above the roar of the storm the sound of the sea on the beach and next we were struck with a mighty crash, and I was in the water swimming. It was rock-bound coast with one patch of beach in many miles, and the law was that I should dig my hands in the sand and draw myself clear of the surf. The other men must have pounded against the rocks, for none of them came ashore but the head man, and him I knew only by the ring on his finger. When day came, there being nothing of the schooner, I turned my face to the land and journeyed into it, that I might get food and look upon the faces of the people. And when I came to a house I was taken in and given to eat, for I had learned their speech, and the white men are ever kindly. And it was a house, bigger than all the houses built by us and our fathers before us. It was a mighty house, Coogan said, masking his unbelief with wonder and many trees went into the making of such a house opiquan added taking the cue that is nothing nembok shrugged his shoulders in a belittling fashion as our houses are to that house so this house was to the houses i was yet to see and they are not big men nay mere men like you and me nembok answered I had cut a stick that I might walk in comfort, and remembering that I was to bring report to you, my brothers, I cut a notch in the stick for each person who lived in that house, and I stayed there many days, and worked, for which they gave me money, a thing of which you know nothing but which is very good, and one day I departed from that place to go farther into the land, and as I walked I met many people and I cut smaller notches in the stick that there might be room for all. Then I came upon a strange thing. On the ground before me was a bar of iron, as big in thickness as my arm, and a long step away was another bar of iron. Then thou wert a rich man, Obiquan asserted, for iron be worth more than anything else in the world. It would have made many knives. Nay, it was not mine. It was a find, and a find be lawful. Not so. The white men had placed it there. And further, these bars were so long that no man could carry them away. So long that as far as I could see there was no end to them. Nambok. That is very much iron, Obi-Wan cautioned. Ay, it was hard to believe with my own eyes upon it, but I could not gainsay my eyes. And as I looked, I heard. He turned abruptly to the headman. Opiquan, thou hast heard the sea lion bellow in his anger. Make it plain in thy mind of as many sea lions as there be waves to the sea, and make it plain that all these sea lions be made into one sea lion, and as that one sea lion would bellow, so bellowed the thing I heard. The fisher folk cried aloud in astonishment and Opiquan's jaw lowered and remained lowered, and in the distance I saw a monster unlike a thousand whales. It was one-eyed and vomited smoke, and it snorted with exceeding loudness. I was afraid and ran with shaking legs along the path between the bars, but it came with the speed of the wind, this monster, and I leaped the iron bars with its hot breath on my face. Opiquan gained control of his jaw again, and... And then, O Nambok? Then it came by on the bars, and harmed me not, and when my legs could hold me up again it was gone from sight. 
and it is a very common thing in that country. Even the women and children are not afraid. Men make them do work, these monsters. As we make our dogs do work, Kuga asked with skeptic twinkle in his eye. Aye, as we make our dogs do work. And how do they breed, these things, Obi-Wan questioned. They breed not at all. Men fashion them cunningly of iron and feed them with stone and give them water to drink. The stone becomes fire and the water becomes steam and the steam of the water is the breath of their nostrils and... There, there, Anambok, Obi-Wan interrupted. Tell us of other wonders. We grow tired of this, which we may not understand. You do not understand? Nambok asked despairingly. Nay, we do not understand, the men and women wailed back. We cannot understand. Nambok thought of the combined harvester, and of the machines wherein visions of living men were to be seen, and of the machines from which came the voices of men, and he knew his people could never understand. Dare I say I rode this iron monster through the land? he asked bitterly. Opiquan threw his hands up, palms outward, in open incredulity. Say on, say anything, we listen. Then I did ride the iron monster, for which I gave money. Thou saidest it was fed with stone. And likewise, thou fool, I said money was a thing of which you know nothing. As I say, I rode the monster through the land and through many villages, until I came to a big village on a salt arm of the sea, and the houses shoved their roofs among the stars of the sky, and the clouds drifted by them, and everywhere was much smoke, and the roar of that village was like the roar of the sea in a storm, and the people were so many that I flung away my stick and no longer remembered the notches upon it. Hadst thou made small notches, Kuga reproved, thou might have brought report. Nambok whirled upon him in anger. Had I made small notches, listen, Kuga, thou scratcher of bone, had I made small notches, neither stick nor twenty sticks could have borne them. Nay, not all the driftwood of all the beaches between this village and the next. And of all of you, the women and children as well, were twenty times as many, and if you had twenty hands each, and in each hand a stick and a knife, still the notches could not be cut for the people I saw. So many were they, and so fast did they come and go. There cannot be so many people in all the world, Obi-Kwan objected, for he was stunned, and his mind could not grasp such a magnitude of numbers. What dost thou know of all the world and how large it is, Nambok demanded? but there cannot be so many people in one place. Who art thou to say what can be and what cannot be? It stands to reason there cannot be so many people in one place. Their canoes would clutter the sea till there was no room, and they could empty the sea each day of its fish and not all be fed. So it would seem, Nimbok made final answer. Yet it was so. With my own eyes I saw, and I flung my stick away. He yawned heavily and rose to his feet. I have paddled far. The day has been long, and I am tired. Now I will sleep, and tomorrow we will have further talk upon the things I have seen. Vasquawan, hobbling fearfully in advance, proud indeed, yet awed by her wonderful son, led him to her igloo and stowed him away among the greasy, ill-smelling furs. But the men lingered by the fire, and a council was held wherein there was much whispering and low voice discussion. An hour passed, and a second, and Nambok slept, and the talk went on. The evening sun dipped toward the northwest, and at eleven at night was nearly due north. Then it was the head man and the bone scratcher separated themselves from the council and aroused Nambok. He blinked up into their faces and turned on his side to sleep again. Opiquan gripped him by the arm and kindly, but firmly, shook his senses back into him. Come, Nambok, arise, he commanded. It be time. Another feast, Nambok cried. Nay, nay, I'm not hungry. Go on with the eating and let me sleep. Time to be gone, Kuga thundered. But Opiquan spoke more softly. 
Thou wast the dark a mate with me when we were boys, he said. Together we first chased the seal and drew the salmon from the traps. And thou didst drag me back to life, Nambok, when the sea closed over me and I was sucked down to the black rocks. Together we hungered and bore the chill of the frost, and together we crawled beneath one fur and lay close together. And because of these things and the kindness in which I stood to thee, it grieves me sore that thou shouldst return such a remarkable liar. We cannot understand, and our heads be dizzy with the things thou hast spoken. It is not good, and there has been much talk in the council. Wherefore we send thee away, that our heads may remain clear and strong, and not be troubled by the unaccountable things. These things thou speakest of be shadows, Kuka took up the strain. From the shadow world thou hast brought them, and to the shadow world thou must return them. Thy Bedarka be ready, and the tribe's people wait. They may not sleep until thou art gone. Nembok was perplexed, but he hearkened to the voice of the head man. If thou art, Nambok, Opiquan was saying, thou art a fearful and most wonderful liar. If thou art the shadow of Nambok, then thou speakest of shadows, concerning which it is not good that living men have knowledge. This great village thou hast spoken of we deem the village shadows. Therein flutter the souls of the dead, for the dead be many and the living few. The dead do not come back. Never have the dead come back, save thou with thy wonder tales. It is not meet that the dead come back, and should we permit it, great trouble may be our portion. Nambok knew his people well, and was aware that the voice of the council was supreme so he allowed himself to be led down to the water's edge, where he was put aboard his bedarka, and a paddle thrust into his hand. A stray wild fowl honked somewhere to the seaward, and the surf broke limply and hollowly on the sand. A dim twilight brooded over land and water, and in the north the sun smoldered, vague and troubled, and draped about with blood-red mists. The gulls were flying low, the offshore wind blew keen and chill, and the black massed clouds behind it gave promise of bitter weather. Out of the sea thou earnest, Opi Kwan chanted oracly, and back into the sea thou goest. Thus it is balance achieved, and all things brought to law. Basquawan limped to the froth mark and cried, I bless thee, Nambok, for thou remembered me. But Kuga, shoving Nambok clear of the beach, tore the shawl from her shoulders and flung it into the bedarka. It is cold in the long night, she wailed, and the frost is prone to nip old bones. The thing is a shadow, the bone scratcher answered, and shadows cannot keep thee warm. Nambok stood up, that his voice might carry. O Basquawan, mother that bore me, he called. Listen to the words of Nambok, thy son. There be room in this Bedarka for two, and he that would thou comest with him. For his journey is to where there are fish and oil in plenty. There the frost comes not, and life is easy, and the things of iron do the work of men. Will thou come, O Basquawan? She debated a moment, while the Bedarka drifted swiftly from her, then raised her voice to a quavering treble. I'm old, Nambok, and soon I shall pass down among the shadows. But I have no wish to go before my time. I am old, Nambok, and I am afraid. The shaft of light shot across the dim-lit sea and wrapped the boat and man in splendor of gold and red. Then... A hush fell upon the fisher folk, and only was heard the moan of the offshore wind and the cries of the gulls flying low in the air. End of section three. Section four of the Children of the Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Master of Mystery by Jack London. There was complaint in the village. The women chattered together with shrill, high-pitched voices. The men were glum and doubtful of aspect, and the very dogs wandered dubiously about, alarmed in vague ways by the unrest of the camp, and ready to take to the woods on the first outbreak of trouble. The air was filled with suspicion. No man was sure of his neighbor, and each was conscious that he stood in like unsureness with his fellows. Even the children were oppressed and solemn, and little Diya, the cause of it all, had been soundly thrashed, first by Hunia, his mother, and then by his father, Bon, and was now whimpering and looking pessimistically out upon the world from the shelter of the big overturned canoe on the beach. And to make the matter worse, Skundu, the shaman, was in disgrace, and his known magic could not be called upon to seek out the evildoer. Forsooth, a month gone, he had promised a fair south wind so that the tribe might journey to the potlatch at Tonkin, where Taku Jim was giving away the savings of twenty years. And when the day came, lo, a grievous north wind blew, and of the first three canoes to venture forth, one was swamped in the big seas, and two were pounded to pieces on the rocks, and a child was drowned. He had pulled the string of the wrong bag, he explained, a mistake, but the people refused to listen. The offerings of meat and fish and fur ceased to come to his door, and he sulked within, so they thought, fasting in bitter penance, in reality, eating generously from his well-stored cash and meditating upon the fickleness of the mob. The blankets of Hunia were missing. They were good blankets of most marvelous thickness and warmth, and her pride in them was greatened in that they had been come by so cheaply. Tai Kwan, of the next village but one, was a fool to have so easily parted with them, but then she did not know they were the blankets of the murdered Englishman, because of whose take-off the United States cutter nosed along the coast for a time, while its launches puffed and snorted among the secret inlets, and not knowing that Tai Kwan had disposed of them in haste, so that his own people might not have to render account to the government. Hunia's pride was unshaken, and because the women envied her, her pride was without end and boundless, till it filled the village and spilled over along the Alaskan shore from Dutch Harbor to St. Mary's. Her totem had become justly celebrated, and her name was known on the lips of men wherever men fished and feasted, what of the blankets and their marvelous thickness and warmth. It was a most mysterious happening, the manner of their going. I but stretched them up in the sun by the side wall of the house, Hunia disclaimed for the thousandth time to her Lingat sisters. I but stretched them up and turned my back, for Diya, doe thief and eater of raw flour that he is, with head into the big iron pot, overturned and stuck there, his legs waving like the branches of a forest tree in the wind, and I did but drag him out and twice knock his head against the door for riper understanding, and behold, the blankets were not. The blankets were not, the women repeated in awed whispers. A great loss, one added. A second, never were there such blankets. And a third, we be sorry, Hunia, for thy loss. Yet each woman of them was glad in her heart that the odious, dissension-breeding blankets were gone. I but stretched them up in the sun, Hunia began for the thousand and first time. Yea, yea, Bon spoke up wearied, but there were no gossips in the village from other places. Wherefore it be plain that some of our own tribes people have laid unlawful hand upon the blankets. How can that be, O oh Bon? the women chorused indignantly. Who should there be? Then there has been witchcraft, Bon continued stolidly enough, though he stole a sly glance at their faces. Witchcraft! And at the dread word their voices hushed, and each looked fearfully at each. Ay, Hunia affirmed, the latent malignancy of her nature flashing into a moment's exultation. And word has been sent to cluck no tongue and strong paddles. Truly shall he be here with the afternoon tide. The little groups broke up and fear descended upon the village. Of all misfortune, witchcraft was the most appalling. With the intangible and unseen things only the shamans could cope, and neither man, woman, nor child could know, until the moment of ordeal, whether devils possessed their souls or not. And of all shamans, Klok no Tan, who dwelt in the next village, 
was the most terrible. None found more evil spirits than he. None visited his victims with more frightful tortures. Even had he found, once, a devil residing within the body of a three-months babe, a most obstinate devil, which could only be driven out when the babe had lain for a week on thorns and briars. The body was thrown into the sea after that, but the waves tossed it back again and again as a curse upon the village, nor did it finally go away till two strong men were staked out at low tide and drowned. And Hunia had sent for this clock no ton. Better had it been if Skundu, their own shaman, were undisgraced, for he had ever a gentler way, and he had been known to drive forth two devils from a man who afterward begat seven healthy children. But clock no ton! They shuddered with dire foreboding at thought of him, and each one felt himself the center of accusing eyes, and looked accusingly upon his fellows, each one and all, save Sime. And Sime was a scoffer whose evil end was destined with a certitude his successes could not shake. Ho, ho, he laughed, devils and clock no ton, than whom no greater devil can be found in blinket land. Thou fool, even now he cometh with witcheries and sorceries, so beware thy tongue, lest evil befall thee and thy days be short in the land. So spoke La La, otherwise the cheater, and Sime laughed scornfully. I am Sime, unused to fear, unafraid of the dark. I am a strong man, as my father before me, and my head is clear. Nor you nor I have seen with our eyes the unseen evil things, but Skundu hath, La La made answer, and likewise clop no ton, this we know. How dost thou know, son of a fool? Sime thundered the choleric blood darkening his thick bull neck. By the word of their mouths, even so. Sime snorted. A shaman is only a man. May not his words be crooked, even as thine and mine? Bah! Bah! And once more, bah! And this for thy shamans, and thy shaman's devils, and this, and this! And snapping his fingers to right and left, Sime strode through the onlookers, who made overzealous and fearsome way for him. A good fisher and strong hunter, but an evil man, said one. Yet does he flourish, speculated another. Wherefore be thou evil and flourish? Sime retorted over his shoulder. And were all evil, there would be no need for shamans. Bah, you children afraid of the dark. And when clock no ton arrived on the afternoon tide, Sime's defiant laugh was unabated, nor did he forbear to make a joke when the shaman tripped on the sand in the landing. Clop no ton looked at him sourly, and without greeting, stalked straight through their midst to the house of Skundu. Of the meeting with Skundu, none of the tribe's people might know, for they clustered reverently in the distance, and spoke in whispers while the masters of mystery were together. Greeting, O Skundu, Clop no ton rumbled, wavering perceptibly from doubt of his reception. He was a giant in stature, and towered massively above little Skundu, whose thin voice floated upward like the faint far rasping of a cricket. Greeting, clock no ton, he returned. The day is fair with thy coming. Yet it would seem, clock no ton hesitated. Yea, yea, the little shaman put in impatiently, that I have fallen on ill days, else would I not stand in gratitude to you, in that you do my work. It grieves me, friend Skondu. Nay, I am made glad, clock no ton but will I give thee half of that which be given me? Not so, good clock no ton, murmured Skundu, with a deprecatory wave of the hand. It is I who am thy slave, and my days shall be filled with desire to befriend thee, as I, as thou now, befriendest me. That being so, it is then a bad business, these blankets of the woman, Hunia? The big shaman blundered tentatively in his quest and Skundu smiled a wan gray smile, for he was used to reading men, and all men seemed very small to him. Ever hast thou dealt in strong medicine, he said. Doubtless the evil doer will be briefly known to thee. Aye, briefly known when I set eyes upon him. Again Clock no ton hesitated. Have there been gossips from other places, he asked. Skundu shook his head. Behold, is this not a most excellent muckluck? He held up the foot covering of sealskin and walrus hide, and his visitor examined it with secret interest. It did come to me by a close-driven bargain. Clock no ton nodded attentively. 
I got it from the man, La La. He is a remarkable man, and often have I thought so. Clock no tan ventured impatiently. Often have I thought, Skundu concluded, his voice falling as he came to a full pause. It is a fair day, and thy medicine be strong, Clock no tan. Clock no tan's face brightened. Thou art a great man, Skundu, a shaman of shamans. I go now. I shall remember thee always, and the man, la la, as you say, is a remarkable man. Skandu smiled yet more wan and gray, closed the door on the heels of his departing visitor, and barred and double-barred it. Sime was mending his canoe when Clock No Tun came down the beach, and he broke off from his work only long enough to ostentatiously load his rifle and place it near him. The shaman noted the action and called out, Let all the people come together on this spot. It is the word of Clock No Tun, devil seeker and driver of devils. He had been minded to assemble them at Hunia's house, but it was necessary that all should be present, and he was doubtful of Sime's obedience and did not wish trouble. Sime was a good man to let alone, his judgment ran, and withal, a bad one for the health of any shaman. Let the woman Hunia be brought, Cloak No Tan commanded, glaring ferociously about the circle and sending chills up and down the spines of those he looked upon. Hunia waddled forward, head bent, and gaze averted. Where be thy blankets? I but stretched them up in the sun, and behold, they were not, she whined. So? It was because of D. Ya. So? Him have I beaten sore, and he shall yet be beaten, for that he brought trouble upon us who be poor people. The blankets! Clock No Tun bellowed hoarsely, foreseeing her desire to lower the price to be paid. The blankets, woman! Thy wealth is known. I but stretch them up in the sun, she sniffled, and we be poor people and have nothing. He stiffened suddenly, with a hideous distortion of the face, and Hunia shrank back. But so swiftly did he spring forward, with in-turned eyeballs and loosened jaw, that she stumbled and fell down groveling at his feet. He waved his arms about, wildly flagellating the air, his body writhing and twisting in torment. An epilepsy seemed to come upon him. A white froth flecked his lips and his body was convulsed with shiverings and tremblings. The women broke into a wailing chant, swaying backward and forward in abandonment, while one by one the men succumbed to the excitement till only Sime remained. He, perched upon his canoe, looked on in mockery. Yet the ancestors whose seed he bore pressed heavily upon him, and he swore his strongest oaths that his courage might be cheered. Clock no ton was horrible to behold. He had cast off his blanket and torn his clothes from him, so that he was quite naked, save for a girdle of eagle claws about his thighs. Shrieking and yelling, his long black hair flying like a blot of night, he leaped frantically about the circle. A certain rude rhythm characterized his frenzy, and when all were under its sway, swinging their bodies in accord with his and venting their cries in unison, he sat bolt upright, with arm outstretched and long talon-like finger extended. A low moaning, as of the dead, greeted this, and the people cowered with shaking knees as the dread finger passed them slowly by. For death went with it, and life remained with those who watched it go, and being rejected, they watched with eager intentness. Finally, with a tremendous cry, the fateful finger rested upon La La. He shook like an aspen, seeing himself already dead, his household goods divided, and his widow married to his brother. He strove to speak to deny, but his tongue clove to his mouth and his throat was sanded with an intolerable thirst. Clock no ton seemed to half swoon away, now that his work was done, but he waited with closed eyes, listening for the great blood cry to go up, the great blood cry familiar to his ear from a thousand conjurations, when the tribespeople flung themselves like wolves upon the trembling victim. But only was there silence, then a low tittering from nowhere in particular, which spread and spread into a vast laughter welled up to the sky. Wherefore, he cried. Na, na, the people laughed. Thy medicine be ill, O clock, no ton. It be known to all, La La stuttered. For eight weary months have I been gone afar with the sea wash sealers, but this day am I come back to find the blankets of Hunia gone ere I came. It be true, they cried with one accord. The blankets of Hunia were gone ere he came. And thou shalt be paid nothing for thy medicine, which is of no avail, 
announced Hunia, on her feet once more, and smarting from a sense of ridiculousness. But Clock No Tun saw only the face of Skundu and its wan gray smile, heard only the faint bar crickets rasping. I got it from the man Lala, and often have I thought, and it is a fair day, and thy medicine be strong. He brushed by Hunia, and the circle instinctively gave way for him to pass. Sime flung a jeer from the top of the canoe. The women stickered in his face. Cries of derision rose in his wake. But he took no notice, pressing onward to the house of Skundu. He hammered on the door, beat it with his fists, and howled vile imprecations. Yet there was no response, save that in the lulls, Skundu's voice rose eerily in incantation. Clock no tun raged about like a madman, but when he attempted to break in the door with a huge stone, murmurs arose from the men and women, and he, Clock no tun, knew that he stood shorn of his strength and authority before an alien people. He saw a man stoop for a stone, and a second, and a bodily fear ran through him. Harm not Skundu, who is a master, a woman cried out. Better you return to your own village, a man advised menacingly. Clock no tun turned on his heel and went down among them to the beach, a bitter rage at his heart, and in his head a just apprehension for his defenseless back. But no stones were cast. The children swarmed mockingly about his feet, and the air was wild with laughter and derision, but that was all. Yet he did not breathe freely until the canoe was well out upon the water, when he rose up and laid a futile curse upon the village and its people, not forgetting to particularly specify Skundu, who had made a mock of him. Ashore there was a clamor for Skundu, and the whole population crowded his door, entreating and imploring in confused babble, until he came forth and raised his hand. In that ye are my children, I pardon freely, he said, but never again. For the last time thy foolishness goes unpunished. That which ye wish shall be granted, and it be already known to me. This night, when the moon has gone behind the world to look upon the mighty dead, let all the people gather in the blackness before the house of Hunia. Then shall the evil doer stand forth and take his merited reward. I have spoken. It shall be death, Bond vociferated, for that it hath brought worry upon us and shame. So be it. Skundu replied and shut his door. Now shall all be made clear and plain, and content rest upon us once again, La La declaimed oracularly. Because of Skundu, the little man, Sime sneered. Because of the medicine of Skundu, the little man, La La corrected. Children of foolishness, these flinket people, Sime smote his thigh a resounding blow. It passeth understanding that grown women and strong men should get down in the dirt to dream things and wonder tales. I am a traveled man, La La answered. I have journeyed on the deep seas and seen signs and wonders, and I know that these things be so. I am La La, the cheater, so called, but the far journeyer right named. I am not so great a traveler, Sime began. Then hold thy tongue, Bond cut in, and they separated in anger. When the last silver moonlight had vanished beyond the world, Skundu came among the people, huddled about the house of Hunia. He walked with a quick, alert step, and those who saw him in the light of Hunia's slush lamp noticed that he came empty-handed, without rattles, masks, or shaman's paraphernalia, save for a great sleepy raven carried under one arm. "'Is there wood gathered for a fire, so that all may see when the work be done?' he demanded. "'Yea!' Vaughn answered, there be wood in plenty. Then let all listen, for my words be few. With me have I brought Jelks, the raven, diviner of mystery and seer of things. Him, in his blackness, shall I place under the big black pot of Hunia, in the blackest corner of her house. The slush lamp shall cease to burn, and all remain in outer darkness. It is very simple. One by one shall you go into the house, lay hand upon the pot for the space of one long intake of the breath, and withdraw again. Doubtless Jelks will make outcry when the hand of the evildoer is nigh him, or who knows but otherwise he may manifest his wisdom. Are ye ready? We be ready, came the multi-voiced response. Then I will call the name aloud, each in his turn and hers, till all are called. Thereat La La was first chosen, and he passed in at once. 
every ear strained and through the silence they could hear his footsteps creaking across the rickety floor but that was all jelks made no outcry gave no sign bon was next chosen for it well might be that a man should steal his own blankets with intent to cast shame upon his neighbors hunia followed and other women and children but without result Sime, Skundu called out. Sime, he repeated, but Sime did not stir. Art thou afraid of the dark? Lala, his own integrity being proved, demanded fiercely. Sime chuckled. I laugh at it all, for it is a great foolishness, yet I will go in, not in belief and wonders, but in token that I am unafraid. And he passed in boldly and came out still mocking. Some day shalt thou die with great suddenness, Lala whispered, righteously indignant. I doubt not, the scoffer answered airily. Few men of us die in our beds, what of the shamans in the deep sea? When half the villagers had safely undergone the ordeal, the excitement, because of its repression, was painfully intense. When two-thirds had gone through, a young woman, close on her first childbed, broke down, and in nervous shrieks and laughter gave form to her terror. Finally the turn came for the last of all to go in, and nothing had happened, and D. Ya was the last of all. It must surely be he, Hunia let out a lament to the stars, while the rest drew back from the luckless lad. He was half dead from fright, and his legs gave under him so that he staggered on the threshold and nearly fell. Skundu shoved him inside and closed the door. A long time went by, during which could be heard only the boys weeping. Then, very slowly, came the creak of his steps to the far corner, a pause, and the creaking of his return. The door opened and he came forth. Nothing had happened, and he was the last. Let the fire be lighted, Skundu commanded. The bright flames rushed upward, revealing faces yet marked with vanishing fear, but also clouded with doubt. Surely the thing has failed. Hunia whispered hoarsely. Yea, Bon answered complacently. Skundu groweth old, and we stand in need of a new shaman. Where now is the wisdom of Jelks? Sime snickered in La La's ear. La La brushed his brow in a puzzled manner and said nothing. Sime threw his chest out arrogantly and strutted up to the little shaman. Ho, ho, as I said, nothing has come of it. So it would seem, so it would seem. Skundu answered meekly, and it would seem strange to those unskilled in the affairs of mystery. As thou, Sime queried audaciously, mayhap even as I, Skundu spoke quite softly, his eyelids drooping, slowly drooping down, down, till his eyes were all but hidden. So I am minded of another test. Let every man, woman, and child, now and at once, hold their hands well up above their heads. So unexpected was the order, and so imperatively was it given, that it was obeyed without question. Every hand was in the air. Let each look on the other's hands, and let all look, Skundu commanded, so that, but a noise of laughter, which was more of wrath, drowned his voice. All eyes had come to rest upon Sime. Every hand but his was black with soot, and his was guiltless of the smirch of Hunia's pot. A stone hurled through the air and struck him on the cheek. It is a lie, he yelled, a lie. I know not of Hunia's blankets. A second stone gashed his brow. A third whistled past his head. The great blood cry went up, and everywhere were people groping on the ground for missiles. He staggered and half sank down. It was a joke, only a joke, he shrieked, but I took them for a joke. Where hast thou hidden them? Skundu's shrill, sharp voice cut through the tumult like a knife. In the large skin bale in my house, the one slung by the ridge pole, came the answer. But it was a joke, I say only. Skundu nodded his head, and the air went thick with flying stones. Sime's wife was crying silently, her head upon her knees, but his little boy, with shrieks and laughter, was flinging stones with the rest. Hunia came waddling back with the precious blankets. Skundu stopped her. We be poor people and have little, she whimpered. So be not hard upon us, O Skundu. The people ceased from the quivering stone pile they had builded, and looked on. Nay, it was never my way, good Hunia, Skundu made answer, reaching for the blankets. In token that I am not hard, these only shall I take. Am I not wise, my children? he demanded. 
Thou art indeed wise, O Skundu, they cried in one voice. And he went away into the darkness, the blankets around him, and Jelks nodding sleepily under his arm. End of section 4《セクション5 Children of the Frost》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Xu Shan.《Children of the Frost》by Jack London. The Sunlanders. Mandel is an obscure village on the rim of the polar sea. It is not large, and the people are peaceable, more peaceable even than those of the adjacent tribes. There are few men in Mandel and many women, wherefore a wholesome and necessary polygamy is in practice. The women bear children with ardor, and the birth of a man child is hailed with acclamation. Then there is Ayab Wayak, whose head rests always on one shoulder, as though at some time the neck had become very tired and refused forevermore its wonted duty. The cause of all these things, the peaceableness and the polygamy in the tired neck of Ayab Wayak, goes back among the years to the time when the schooner search dropped anchor in Mandel Bay, and when Tai Yi, chief man of the tribe, conceived a scheme of sudden wealth. To this day the story of things that happened is remembered and spoken of with bated breath by the people of Mandel, who are cousins to the hungry folk who live in the West. Children draw closer when the tale is told, and marvel sagely to themselves at the madness of those who might have been their forebears had they not provoked the Sunlanders and come to bitter ends. It began to happen when six men came ashore from the search, with heavy outfits, as though they had come to stay, and quartered themselves in Niga's igloo. Not but that they paid well in flour and sugar for the lodging, but Niga was aggrieved because Mesaki, his daughter, elected to cast her fortunes and seek food and blanket with Bill Man, who was leader of the party of white men. She is worth a price, Niga complained to the gathering by the council fire when the six white men were asleep. She is worth a price, for we have more men than women, and the men be bidding high. The hunter Unenk offered me a kayak, new made, and a gun which he got in trade from the hungry folk. This was I offered, and behold, now she is gone, and I have nothing. I too did bid for Mesaki, grumbled a voice in tones not altogether joyless, and Pilo shoved his broad-cheeked jovial face for a moment into the light. Thou too, Niga affirmed, and there were others. Why is there such a restlessness upon the Sunlanders? he demanded petulantly. Why do they not stay at home? The snow people do not wander to the lands of the Sunlanders. Better were it to ask why they come, cried a voice from the darkness, and Ayab Wayak pushed his way to the front. Aye, why they come, clamored many voices, and Ayab Wayak waved his hand for silence. Men do not dig in the ground for nothing, he began. And I have it in mind of the whale people, who are likewise Sunlanders, and who lost their ship in the sea. You all remember the whale people, who came to us in their broken boats, and who went away into the south with dogs and sleds when the frost arrived and the snow covered the land. And you remember, while they waited for the frost, that one man of them dug in the ground, and then two men, and three, and then all men of them, with great excitement and much disturbance. What they dug out of the ground we do not know, for they drove us away so we could not see. But afterward, when they were gone, we looked and found nothing. Yet there be much ground, and they did not dig it all. Ay, ay, Abwayak, ay, cried the people in admiration. Wherefore I have it in mind, he concluded, that one Sunlander tells another, and that these Sunlanders have been so told and are come to dig in the ground. But how can it be that Billman speaks our tongue? demanded a little weazened old hunter. Billman, upon whom never before our eyes have rested. Billman has been other times in the snowlands, Ayabwayak answered. Else would he not speak the speech of the bear people, which is like the speech of the hungry folk, which is very like the speech of the Mandels. For there have been many Sunlanders among the bear people, few among the hungry folk, 
and none at all among the Mandels, save the whale people and those who sleep now in the igloo of Niga. Their sugar is very good, Niga commented, and their flour. They have great wealth, Unenk added. Yesterday I was to their ship and beheld most cunning tools of iron and knives and guns and flour and sugar and strange foods without end. It is so, brothers. Tai stood up and exulted inwardly at the respect and silence his people accorded him. They be very rich, these Sunlanders. Also they be fools, for behold, they come among us boldly, blindly, and without thought for all of their great wealth. Even now they snore, and we are many and unafraid. They have, they too are unafraid, being great fighters, the weasened little old hunter objected. But Tai scowled upon him. Nay, it would not seem so. They live to the south under the path of the sun and are soft as their dogs are soft. You remember the dog of the whale people? Our dogs ate him the second day, for he was soft and could not fight. The sun is warm and life easy in the sunlands, and the men are as women and the women as children. Heads nodded in approval, and the women craned their necks to listen. It is said they are good to their women who do little work, tittered Lakita, a broad-hipped, healthy young woman, daughter to Tai himself. Thou wouldst follow the feet of Mesaki, eh? he cried angrily. Then he turned swiftly to the tribesmen. Look you, brothers, this is the way of the Sunlanders. They have eyes for our women and take them one by one. As Misaki has gone, cheating Niga of her prize, so will Likita go, so will they all go, and we be cheated. I have talked with the hunter from the bear people, and I know. There be hungry folk among us. Let them speak if my words be true. The six hunters of the hungry folk attested the truth and fell each to telling his neighbor of the Sunlanders and their ways. There were mutterings from the younger men who had wives to seek, and from the older men who had daughters to fetch prices, and a low hum of rage rose higher and clearer. They are very rich, and have cunning tools of iron and knives and guns without end, Tai suggested craftily, his dream of sudden wealth beginning to take shape. I shall take the gun of Billman for myself, Ayab Wayak suddenly proclaimed. Nay, it shall be mine, shouted Niga. For there is the price of Masaki to be reckoned. Peace, O oh brothers, Tai swept the assembly with his hands. Let the women and children go to their igloos. This is the talk of men. Let it be for the ears of men. There be guns in plenty for all, he said when the women had unwillingly withdrawn. I doubt not there will be two guns for each man, without thought of the flour and sugar and other things. The six Sunlanders in Niga's igloo will be killed tonight while they sleep. Tomorrow will we go in peace to the ship to trade, and there, when the time favors, kill all their brothers. And tomorrow night there shall be feasting and merriment and division of wealth, and the least man shall possess more than did ever the greatest before. Is it wise, that which I have spoken, brothers? A low growl of approval answered him, and preparation for the attack was begun. The six hungry folk, as became members of a wealthier tribe, were armed with rifles and plenteously supplied with ammunition. But it was only here and there that a Mandel possessed a gun, many of which were broken, and there was a general slackness of powder and shells. This poverty of war weapons, however, was relieved by myriads of bone-headed arrows and casting spears for work at a distance and for close quarters steel knives of Russian and Yankee make. Let there be no noise, Tai finally instructed, but be there many on every side of the igloo and close, so that the Sunlanders may not break through. Then do you, Niga, with six of the young men behind, crawl in to where they sleep. Take no guns which be prone to go off at unexpected times, but put the strength of your arms into the knives. And be it understood that no harm befall Misaki, who is worth the price, Niga whispered hoarsely. Flat upon the ground, the small army concentrated on the igloo, and behind, deliciously expectant, crouched many women and children, 
come out to witness the murder. The brief August night was passing, and in the gray of dawn could be dimly discerned the creeping forms of Niga and the young men. Without pause, on hands and knees, they entered the long passageway and disappeared. Taiyi rose up and rubbed his hands. All was going well. Head after head in the big circle lifted and waited. Each man pictured the scene according to his nature. The sleeping men, the plunge of the knives, and the sudden death in the dark. A loud hail in the voice of a sunlander rent the silence and a shot rang out. Then an uproar broke loose inside the igloo. Without premeditation, the circle swept forward into the passageway. On the inside, half a dozen repeating rifles began to chatter, and the Mandales jammed in the confined space were powerless. Those at the front strove madly to retreat from the fire-spitting guns in their very faces, and those in the rear pressed as madly forward to the attack. The bullets from the big forty-five nineties drove through half a dozen men at a shot, and the passageway, gorged with surging, helpless men, became a shambles. The rifles, pumped without aim into the mass, withered it away like a machine gun, and against that steady strum of death no man could advance. "'Never was there the like!' panted one of the hungry folk. "'I did but look in, and the dead were piled like seals on the ice after a keeling. "'Did I not say, mayhap, they were fighters?' cackled the weazened old hunter. "'It was to be expected,' Ayabwayak answered stoutly. "'We fought in a trap of our making.' "'Oh, ye fools!' Taiyi chided. "'Ye sons of fools! "'It was not planned, this thing ye have done. "'To Niga and the six young men only was it given to go inside. "'My cunning is superior to the cunning of the Sunlanders, "'but ye take away its edge and rob me of its strength "'and make it worse than no cunning at all!' No one made reply, and all eyes centered on the igloo, which loomed vague and monstrous against the clear northeast sky. Through a hole in the roof, the smoke from the rifles curled slowly upward in the pulseless air, and now and again a wounded man crawled painfully through the gray. Let each ask of his neighbor for Niga and the six young men, Taiyi commanded. And after a time the answer came back, Niga and the six young men are not... "'And many more are not,' wailed a woman to the rear. "'The more wealth for those who are left,' Taiyi grimly consoled. "'Then turning to Ayabwayak, he said, "'Go thou and gather together many sealskins filled with oil. "'Let the hunters empty them on the outside wood of the igloo and of the passage, "'and let them put fire to it ere the Sunlanders make holes in the igloo for their guns.' Even as he spoke, a hole appeared in the dirt plastered between the logs, a rifle muzzle protruded, and one of the hungry folk clapped hand to his side and leaped in the air. A second shot through the lungs brought him to the ground. Taiyi and the rest scattered to either side out of direct range, and Ayabwayak hastened the men forward with the skins of oil. Avoiding the loopholes which were making on every side of the igloo, they emptied the skins on the dry drift logs brought down by the Mandel River from the tree lands to the south. Unenk ran forward with the blazing brand, and the flames leaped upward. Many minutes passed without sign, and they held their weapons ready as the fire gained headway. Taiyi rubbed his hands gleefully as the dry structure burned and crackled. Now we have them, brothers, in the trap. And no one may gainsay me the gun of Billman, Ayabwayak announced. Save Billman, squeaked the old hunter, for behold, he cometh now. Covered with a singed and blackened blanket, the big white man leaped out of the blazing entrance, and on his heels, likewise shielded, came Misaki and the five other Sunlanders. The hungry folk tried to check the rush with an ill directed volley, while the Mandels hurled in a cloud of spears and arrows but the Sunlanders cast their flaming blankets from them as they ran, and it was seen that each bore on his shoulders a small pack of ammunition. Of all their possessions, they had chosen to save that. Running swiftly and with purpose, they broke the circle and headed directly for the great cliff, which towered blackly in the brightening day a half mile to the rear of the village. But Taiyi knelt on one knee and lined the sights of his rifle on the rearmost Sunlander. A great shout went up when he pulled the trigger, and the man fell forward, struggled partly up, and fell again. Without regard for the rain of arrows, another Sunlander ran back, 
bent over him and lifted his arm across his shoulders. But the Mandel spearmen were crowding up into closer range, and a strong cast transfixed the wounded man. He cried out and became swiftly limp as his comrade lowered him to the ground. In the meanwhile, Bill Man and the three others had made a stand and were driving a leaden hail into the advancing spearmen. The fifth Sunlander bent over his stricken fellow, felt the heart, and then coolly cut the straps of the pack and stood up with the ammunition and extra gun. Now is he a fool, cried Tai, leaping high as he ran forward, to clear the squirming body of one of the hungry folk. His own rifle was clogged so that he could not use it, and he called out for someone to spear the Sunlander, who had turned and was running for safety under the protecting fire. The little old hunter poised his spear on the throwing stick, swept his arm back as he ran, and delivered the cast. By the body of the wolf, say I, it was a good throw, Tai praised, as the fleeing man pitched forward, the spear standing upright between his shoulders and swaying slowly forward and back. The little weazened old man coughed and sat down. A streak of red showed on his lips and welled into a thick stream. He coughed again, and a strange whistling came and went with his breath. They too are unafraid, being great fighters, he wheezed, pawing aimlessly with his hands. And behold, Bill Man comes now. Tai glanced up. Four Mandels and one of the hungry folk had rushed upon the fallen man and were spearing him from his knees back to the earth. In the twinkling of an eye, Tai saw four of them cut down by the bullets of the Sunlanders. The fifth, as yet unhurt, seized the two rifles, but as he stood up to make off, he was whirled almost completely around by the impact of a bullet in the arm, steadied by a second, and overthrown by the shock of a third. A moment later, and Billman was on the spot, cutting the pack straps and picking up the guns. This Tai saw, and his own people falling as they straggled forward, and he was aware of a quick doubt, and resolved to lie where he was and see more. For some unaccountable reason, Misaki was running back to Billman. But before she could reach him, Tai saw Pilo run out and throw arms about her. He essayed to sling her across his shoulder, but she grappled with him, tearing and scratching at his face. Then she tripped him, and the pair fell heavily. When they regained their feet, Pilo had shifted his grip so that one arm was passed under her chin, the wrist pressing into her throat and strangling her. He buried his face in her breast, taking the blows of her hands on his thick mat of hair, and began slowly to force her off the field. Then it was, retreating with the weapons of his fallen comrades, that Billman came upon them. As Mesaki saw him, she twirled the victim around and held him steady. Billman swung the rifle in his right hand and, hardly easing his stride, delivered the blow. Tai saw Pilo drive to the earth as smote by a falling star, and the Sunlander and Niga's daughter fleeing side by side. A bunch of Mandels led by one of the hungry folk made a futile rush which melted away into the earth before the scorching fire. Tai caught his breath and murmured, Like the young frost in the morning sun. As I say, they are great fighters, the old hunter whispered weakly, far gone in hemorrhage. I know, I have heard. They be sea robbers and hunters of seals, and they shoot quick and true, for it is their way of life and the work of their hands. Like the young frost in the morning sun, Tai repeated, crouching for shelter behind the dying man and peering at intervals about him. It was no longer a fight, for no Mandel man dared venture forward, and as it was, they were too close to the Sunlanders to go back. Three tried it, scattering and scurrying like rabbits, but one came down with a broken leg, another was shot through the body, and the third, twisting and dodging, fell on the edge of the village. So the tribesmen crouched in the hollow places and burrowed into the dirt in the open, while the Sunlander's bullets searched the plain. Move not, Tai pleaded, as Ayabwayak came worming over the ground to him. Move not, good Ayabwayak. Also, you bring death upon us. Death sits upon many, 
Ayabwayak laughed. Wherefore, as you say, there will be much wealth in division. My father breathes fast and short behind the big rock yawn, and behold, twisted like in a knot lieth my brother. But their share shall be my share, and it is well. As you say, good Ayabwayak, and as I have said, but before division must come that which we may divide, and the Sunlanders be not yet dead. A bullet glanced from a rock before them, and singing shrilly rose low over their heads on its second flight. Tai ducked and shivered, but Ayab Wayak grinned and sought vainly to follow it with his eyes. So swiftly they go, one may not see them, he observed. But many be dead of us, Tai went on. And many be left, was the reply. And they hug close to the earth, for they have become wise in the fashion of fighting. Further they are angered. Moreover, when we have killed the Sunlanders on the ship, there will remain but four on the land. These may take long to kill, but in the end it will happen. How may we go down to the ship when we cannot go this way or that? Tai questioned. It is a bad place where lie Bill Man and his brothers, Ayabwayak explained. We may come upon them from every side, which is not good. So they aim to get their backs against the cliff and wait until their brothers of the ship come to give them aid. Never shall they come from the ship, their brothers. I have said it. Tai was gathering courage again, and when the Sunlanders verified the prediction by retreating to the cliff, he was light-hearted as ever. There be only three of us, complained one of the hungry folk as they came together for counsel. Therefore, instead of two, shall you have four guns each, was Tai's rejoinder. We did good fighting. Eh, and if it should happen that two of you be left, then will you have six guns each. Therefore, fight well. And if there be none of them left, Ayabwayak whispered slyly, then will we have the guns, you and I? Tai whispered back. However, to propitiate the hungry folk, he made one of them leader of the ship expedition. This party comprised fully two-thirds of the tribe's men, and departed for the coast, a dozen miles away, laden with skins and things to trade. The remaining men were disposed in a large half-circle about the breastwork which Bill Man and his Sunlanders had begun to throw up. Tai was quick to note the virtues of things, and at once set his men to digging shallow trenches. The time will go before they are aware, he explained to Ayab Wayak, and their minds being busy, they will not think over much of the dead that are, nor gather trouble to themselves. And in the dark of night they may creep closer, so that when the Sunlanders look forth in the morning light, they will find us very near. In the midday heat the men ceased from their work and made a meal of dried fish and seal oil which the women brought up. There was some clamor for the food of the Sunlanders in the igloo of Niga, but Tai refused to divide it until the return of the ship party. Speculations upon the outcome became rife, but in the midst of it a dull boom drifted up over the land from the sea. The keen-eyed ones made out a dense cloud of smoke, which quickly disappeared and which they averred was directly over the ship of the Sunlanders. Tai was of the opinion that it was a big gun, Ayab Wayak did not know, but thought it might be a signal of some sort. Anyway, he said, it was time something happened. Five or six hours afterward, a solitary man was descried coming across the wide flat from the sea, and the women and children poured out upon him in a body. It was Unenk, naked, winded, and wounded. The blood still trickled down his face from a gash on the forehead. His left arm, frightfully mangled, hung helpless at his side. But most significant of all, there was a wild gleam in his eyes which betokened the women knew not what. Where be Pishak? an old squaw queried sharply. And Olitli, and Polak, and Makuk, the voices took up the cry. But he said nothing, brushing his way through the clamorous mass and directing his staggering steps toward Tai. The old squaw raised the wail, and one by one the women joined her as they swung in behind. The men crawled out of their trenches and ran back to gather about Tai, and it was noticed that the Sunlanders climbed upon their barricade to see. Unenk halted, swept the blood from his eyes, and looked about. 
He strove to speak, but his dry lips were glued together. Lakita fetched him water, and he grunted and drank again. Was it a fight? Tai demanded finally. A good fight? Ho, ho, ho! So suddenly and so fiercely did Unink laugh that every voice hushed. Never was there such a fight! So I say, I, Unink, fighter before time of peace of men, and ere I forget, let me speak fat words and wise. By fighting will the Sunlanders teach us Mandel folk how to fight, and if we fight long enough, we shall be great fighters, even as the Sunlanders, or else we shall be dead. Ho, 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 it was a fight. Where be thy brothers? Tai shook him till he shrieked from the pain of his hurts. My brothers? They are not. And Pom Li? cried one of the two hungry folk. Pom Li, the son of my mother. Pom Li is not, Unenk answered in a monotonous voice. And the Sunlanders? from Ayabwayak. The Sunlanders are not. Then the ship of the Sunlanders, and the wealth and guns and things, Tai demanded. Neither the ship of the Sunlanders nor the wealth and guns and things was the unvarying response. All are not, nothing is, I only am. And thou art a fool. It may be so, Unenk answered unruffled. I have seen that which would well make me a fool. Tai held his tongue and all waited till it should please Unenk to tell the story in his own way. We took no guns, O Tai, he at last began. No guns, my brothers, only knives and hunting bows and spears. And in twos and threes in our kayaks we came to the ship. They were glad to see us, the Sunlanders, and we spread our skins, and they brought out their articles of trade, and everything was well. And Pomli waited, waited till the sun was well overhead, and they sat at meat, when he gave the cry, and we fell upon them. Never was there such a fight, and never such fighters. Half did we kill in the quickness of surprise, but the half that was left became as devils, and they multiplied themselves, and everywhere they fought like devils. Three put their backs against the mast of the ship, and we ringed them with our dead before they died, and some got guns and shot with both eyes wide open very quick and sure and one got a big gun from which at one time he shot many small bullets and so behold Unenk pointed to his ear neatly pierced by a buckshot but I Unenk drove my spear through his back from behind and in such fashion one way and another did we kill them all all save the headman and him we were about, many of us, and he was alone when he made a great cry and broke through us, five or six dragging upon him, and ran down inside the ship. And then, when the wealth of the ship was ours, and only the head man down below whom we could kill presently, why then there was a sound as of all the guns in the world, a mighty sound, and like a bird I rose up in the air, and the living Mandel folk, and the dead Sunlanders, the little kayaks, the big ship, the guns, the wealth, everything rose up in the air. So I say, I, Unink, who tell the tale, am the only one left. A great silence fell upon the assemblage. Tai looked at Ayabwayak with awe-struck eyes, but forbore to speak. Even the women were too stunned to wail the dead. Unenk looked about him with pride. I only am left, he repeated. But at that instant, a rifle cracked from Billman's barricade, and there was a sharp spat and thud on the chest of Unenk. He swayed backward and came forward again, a look of startled surprise on his face. He gasped, and his lips writhed in a grim smile. There was a shrinking together of the shoulders and a bending of the knees. He shook himself as might a drowsing man and straightened up. But the shrinking and bending began again, and he sank down slowly, quite slowly, to the ground. 
It was a clean mile from the pit of the Sunlanders, and death had spanned it. A great cry of rage went up, and in it there was much of blood vengeance, much of the unreasoned ferocity of the brute. Tai and Ayabwayok tried to hold the Mandel folk back, were thrust aside and could only turn and watch the mad charge. But no shots came from the Sunlanders, and ere half the distance was covered, many, affrighted by the mysterious silence of the pit, halted and waited. The wilder spirits bore on, and when they had cut the remaining distance in half, the pit still showed no sign of life. At two hundred yards they slowed down and bunched. At one hundred they stopped, a score of them, suspicious and conferred together. Then a wreath of smoke crowned the barricade, and they scattered like a handful of pebbles thrown at random. Four went down, and four more, and they continued swiftly to fall, one and two at a time, till but one remained, and he in full flight with death singing about his ears. It was Nock, a young hunter, long-legged and tall, and he ran as never before. He skimmed across the naked open like a bird, and soared and sailed and curved from side to side. The rifles in the pit rang out in solid volley. They flut, 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 flutted in ragged sequence, and still Nock rose and dipped and rose again, unharmed. There was a lull in the firing, as though the Sunlanders had given over, and Nock curved less and less in his flight, till he darted straight forward at every leap. And then, as he leaped cleanly and well, one lone rifle barked from the pit, and he doubled up in midair, struck the ground in a ball, and like a ball bounced from the impact and came down in a broken heap. Who so swift as the swift-winged lead? Ayabwayak pondered. Tai grunted and turned away. The incident was closed, and there was more pressing matter at hand. One hungry man and forty fighters, some of them hurt, remained, and there were four Sunlanders yet to reckon with. We will keep them in their hole by the cliff, he said, and when famine has gripped them hard, we will slay them like children. But of what matter to fight? queried Oluf, one of the younger men. The wealth of the Sunlanders is not only remains that in the igloo of Niga, a paltry quantity. He broke off hastily as the air by his ear split sharply to the passage of a bullet. Tai laughed scornfully. Let that be thy answer. What else may we do with this mad breed of Sunlanders which will not die? What a thing is foolishness, Oluf protested, his ears furtively alert for the coming of other bullets. It is not right that they should fight so, these Sunlanders. Why will they not die easily? They are fools not to know that they are dead men, and they give us much trouble. We fought before for great wealth. We fight now that we may live, Ayabwayak summed up succinctly. That night there was a clash in the trenches and shots exchanged, and in the morning the igloo of Niga was found empty of the Sunlanders' possessions. These they themselves had taken, for the signs of their trail were visible to the sun. Oluf climbed to the brow of the cliff to hurl great stones down into the pit, but the cliff overhung, and he hurled down abuse and insult instead, and promised bitter torture to them in the end. Billman mocked him back in the tongue of the bear folk, and Tai, lifting his head from a trench to see, had his shoulder scratched deeply by a bullet. And in the dreary days that followed, and in the wild nights when they pushed the trenches closer, there was much discussion as to the wisdom of letting the Sunlanders go. But of this they were afraid, and the women raised a cry always at the thought. This much they had seen of the Sunlanders. They cared to see no more. All the time the whistle and blub-blub of bullets filled the air, and all the time the death list grew. In the golden sunrise came the faint, far crack of a rifle, and a stricken woman would throw up her hands on the distant edge of the village. In the noonday heat, men in the trenches heard the shrill sing-song and knew their deaths, or in the gray afterglow of evening the dirt kicked up in puffs by the winking fires. And through the long nights the long, Wahoo-ha, wahoo-ha, of a mourning woman held dolorous sway. 
as Taiyi had promised in the end famine gripped the sunlanders and once when an early fall gale blew one of them crawled through the darkness past the trenches and stole many dried fish but he could not get back with them and the sun found him vainly hiding in the village so he fought the great fight by himself and in a narrow ring of mandel folk shot four with his revolver and ere they could lay hands on him for the torture turned it on himself and died this threw a gloom upon the people aloof put the question if a man die so hard how hard will die the three who yet are left then misaki stood up on the barricade and called in by name three dogs which had wandered close meat and life which set back the day of reckoning and put despair in the hearts of the mandel folk and on the head of misaki were showered the curses of a generation the days dragged by the sun hurried south the nights grew long and longer and there was a touch of frost in the air and still the sunlanders held the pit hearts were breaking under the unending strain and taiyi thought hard and deep then he sent forth word that all the skins and hides of all the tribe be collected these he had made into huge cylindrical bales and behind each bale he placed a man when the word was given the brief day was almost spent and it was slow work and tedious rolling the big bales forward foot by foot the bullets of the sunlanders blub-lubbed and thudded against them but could not go through and the men howled their delight but the dark was at hand and taiyi secure of success called the bales back to the trenches in the morning in the face of an unearthly silence from the pit the real advance began at first with large intervals between the bales slowly converged as the circle drew in at a hundred yards they were quite close together so that taiyi's order to halt was passed along in whispers the pit showed no sign of life they watched long and sharply but nothing stirred the advance was taken up and the maneuver repeated at fifty yards still no sign nor sound taiyi shook his head and even ayab wayak was dubious but the order was given to go on and go on they did till bale touched bale and a solid rampart of skin and hide bowed out from the cliff above the pit and back to the cliff again taiyi looked back and saw the women and children clustering blackly in the deserted trenches he looked ahead at the silent pit the men were wriggling nervously and he ordered every second bale forward this double line advanced till bale touched bale as before then ayab wayak of his own will pushed one veil forward alone when it touched the barricade he waited a long while after that he tossed unresponsive rocks over into the pit and finally with great care stood up and peered in a carpet of empty cartridges a few white picked dog bones and a soggy place where water dripped from a crevice met his eyes that was all the sunlanders were gone there were murmurings of witchcraft vague complaints dark looks which foreshadowed to taiyi dread things which yet might come to pass and he breathed easier when ayab wayak took up the trail along the base of the cliff the cave taiyi cried they foresaw my wisdom of the skin bales and fled away into the cave the cliff was honeycombed with a labyrinth of subterranean passages which found vent in an opening midway between the pit and where the trench tapped the wall thither and with many exclamations the tribesmen followed ayab wayak and arrived they saw plainly where the sunlanders had climbed to the mouth twenty and odd feet above now the thing is done taiyi said rubbing his hands let word go forth that rejoicing be made for they are in the trap now these sunlanders in the trap the young men shall climb up and the mouth of the cave be filled with stones so that billman and his brothers and masaki shall by famine be pinched to shadows and die cursing in the silence and dark cries of delight and relief greeted this and hauga the last of the hungry folk swarmed up the steep slant and drew himself crouching upon the lip of the opening but as he crouched a muffled report rushed forth and as he clung desperately to the slippery edge a second 
His grip loosed with reluctant weakness, and he pitched down at the feet of Taiyi, quivered for a moment like some monstrous jelly, and was still. How should I know they were great fighters and unafraid? Taiyi demanded, spurred to defense by recollection of the dark looks and vague complaints. We were many and happy, one of the men stated baldly. Another fingered his spear with a prurient hand, but aloof cried them cease. Give ear, my brothers, there be another way. As a boy I chanced upon it playing along the steep. It is hidden by the rocks, and there is no reason that a man should go there. Wherefore it is secret, and no man knows. It is very small, and you crawl in your belly a long way, and then you are in the cave. Tonight we will so crawl without noise on our bellies, and come upon the Sunlanders from behind. And tomorrow we will be at peace, and never again will we quarrel with the Sunlanders in the years to come. Never again, chorused the weary man. Never again, and Taiyi joined with them. That night, with the memory of their dead in their hearts, and in their hands stones and spears and knives, the horde of women and children collected about the known mouth of the cave. Down the twenty and odd precarious feet to the ground, no Sunlander could hope to pass and live. In the village remained only the wounded men, while every able man, and there were thirty of them, followed Oluf to the secret opening. A hundred feet of broken ledges and insecurely heaped rocks were between it and the earth, and because of the rocks which might be displaced by the touch of hand or foot, but one man climbed at a time. Oluf went up first, called softly for the next to come on, and disappeared inside. A man followed, a second and a third, and so on till only Taiyi remained. He received the call of the last man, but a quick doubt assailed him, and he stayed to ponder. Half an hour later, he swung up to the opening and peered in. He could feel the narrowness of the passage, and the darkness before him took on solidity. The fear of the walled-in earth chilled him, and he could not venture. All the men who had died, from Niga, the first of the Mandels, to Hauga, the last of the hungry folk, came and sat with him, but he chose the terror of their company rather than face the horror which he felt to lurk in the thick blackness. He had been sitting long when something soft and cold fluttered lightly on his cheek, and he knew the first winter snow was falling. The dim dawn came, and after that the bright day, when he heard a low guttural sobbing which came and went at intervals along the passage, and which drew closer each time and more distinct. He slipped over the edge, dropped his feet to the first ledge, and waited. That which sobbed made slow progress, but at last, after many halts, it reached him, and he was sure no Sunlander made the noise. So he reached a hand inside, and where there should have been a head felt the shoulders of a man uplifted on bent arms. The head he found later, not erect, but hanging straight down so that the crown rested on the floor of the passage. Is it you, Taiyi? the head said. For it is I, Ayabwayak, who am helpless and broken as a rough lung spear. My head is in the dirt, and I may not climb down unaided. Taiyi clambered in, dragged him up with his back against the wall, but the head hung down on the chest and sobbed and wailed. Ow, ow, it went. Olu forgot, but Masaki likewise knew the secret and showed the Sunlanders, else they would not have waited at the end of the narrow way. Wherefore I am a broken man and helpless. Ow, ow. And did they die, the cursed Sunlanders, at the end of the narrow way? Taiyi demanded. How should I know they waited? Hayab Wayat gurgled. For my brothers had gone before many of them, and there was no sound of struggle. How should I know why there should be no sound of struggle? And ere I knew, two hands were about my neck so that I could not cry out and warn my brothers yet to come. And then there were two hands more on my head, and two more on my feet, 
In this fashion, the three Sunlanders had me. And while the hands held my head in the one place, the hands on my feet swung my body around. And as we wring the neck of a duck in the marsh, so my neck was wrung. But it was not given that I should die, he went on, a remnant of pride yet glittering. I only am left. Aloof and the rest lie on their backs in a row, and their faces turn this way and that, and the faces of some be underneath where the backs of their heads should be. It is not good to look upon, for when life returned to me I saw them all by the light of a torch which the Sunlanders left, and I had been laid with them in the row. So, so, Tai mused, too stunned for speech. He started suddenly and shivered, for the voice of Billman shot out at him from the passage. It is well, it said. I look for the man who crawls with the broken neck, and lo, do I find Tai. Throw down the gun, Tai, so that I may hear it strike among the rocks. Tai obeyed passively, and Billman crawled forward into the light. Tai looked at him curiously. He was gaunt and worn and dirty, and his eyes burned like twin coals in their cavernous sockets. I am hungry, Tai, he said, very hungry. And I am dirt at thy feet, Tai responded. Thy word is my law. Further, I commanded my people not to withstand thee. I counseled. But Billman had turned and was calling back into the passage. Hey, Charlie, Jim, fetch the woman along and come on. We go now to eat, he said, when his comrades and Misaki had joined them. Tai rubbed his hands deprecatingly. We have little, but it is nine. After that we go south on the snow, Billman continued. May you go without hardship and the trail be easy. It is a long way. We will need dogs and food, much. Thine the pick of our dogs and the food they may carry. Billman slipped over the edge of the opening and prepared to descend. But we come again, Tai, we come again, and our days shall be long in the land. And so they departed into the trackless south, Billman, his brothers, and Misaki. And when the next year came, the search number two rode at anchor in Mandel Bay. The few Mandel men who survived because their wounds had prevented their crawling into the cave went to work at the best of the Sunlanders and dug in the ground. They hunt and fish no more, but receive a daily wage, with which they buy flour, sugar, calico, and such things which the search number two brings on her yearly trip from the Sunlands. And this mine is worked in secret, as many Northland mines have been worked. And no white man outside the company, which is Billman, Jim, and Charlie, knows the whereabouts of Mandel on the rim of the Polar Sea. Ayab Wayak still carries his head on one shoulder, is become an oracle, and preaches peace to the younger generation, for which he receives a pension from the company. Tai is foreman of the mine, but he has achieved a new theory concerning the Sunlanders. They that live under the path of the sun are not soft, he says, smoking his pipe and watching the day shift take itself off and the night shift go on. For the sun enters into their blood and burns them with a great fire till they are filled with lusts and passions. They burn always so that they may not know when they are beaten. Further, there is an unrest in them which is a devil, and they are flung out over the earth to toil and suffer and fight without end. I know I am Tai. End of section five. Section six of Children of the Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Vogel. Children of the Frost by Jack London The Sickness of Lone Chief This is a tale that was told to me by two old men. We sat in the smoke of a mosquito smudge in the cool of the day, which was midnight, 
and ever and anon throughout the telling we smote lustily and with purpose at such of the winged pests as braved the smoke for a snack at our hides. To the right, beneath us, twenty feet down the crumbling bank, the Yukon gurgled lazily. To the left, on the rose-leaf rim of the low-lying hills, smoldered the sleepy sun, which saw no sleep that night, nor was destined to see sleep for many nights to come. The old men who sat with me and valorously slew mosquitoes were Lone Chief and Mutsak, erstwhile comrades in arms, and now withered repositories of tradition and ancient happening. They were the last of their generation, and without honor among the younger set, which had grown up on the farthest fringe of a mining civilization. Who cared for tradition in these days, when spirits could be evoked from black bottles, and black bottles could be evoked from the complacent white men for a few hours' sweat or a mangy fur? Of what potency the fearful rites and masked mysteries of shamanism when daily that living wonder, the steamboat, coughed and spluttered up and down the Yukon in defiance of all law, a veritable, fire-breathing monster. And of what value was hereditary prestige, when he who now chopped the most wood, our best conned a stern-wheeler through the island mazes, attained the chiefest consideration of his fellows. Of a truth, having lived too long, they had fallen on evil days, these two old men, Lone Chief and Mutsak, and in the new order they were without honor or place, so they waited drearily for death. And the while, their hearts warmed to the strange white man who shared with them the torments of the mosquito smudge and lent ready ear to their tales of old time before the steamboat came. So a girl was chosen for me, Lone Chief was saying, his voice shrill and piping, ever and again dropped plummet-like into a hoarse and rattling bass, and just as one became accustomed to it, soaring upward into a thin treble, alternate cricket chirpings and bullfrog croakings, as it were. So a girl was chosen for me, he was saying. For my father, who was Kastaka, the otter, was angered because I looked not with a needful eye upon women. He was an old man and chief of his tribe. I was the last of his sons to be alive, and through me only could he look to see his blood go down among those to come after and as yet unborn. But know, O oh white man, that I was very sick, and when neither the hunting nor the fishing delighted me, and by meat my belly was not made warm, how should I look with favor upon women, or prepare for the feast of marriage, or look forward to the prattle and troubles of little children? I, Matsak interrupted, for had not Lone Chief fought in the arms of a great bear till his head was cracked and blood ran from out his ears? Lone Chief nodded vigorously. Matsak speaks true. In the time that followed, my head was well and it was not well, for though the flesh healed and the sore went away, yet was I sick inside. When I walked, my legs shook under me, and when I looked at the light, my eyes became filled with tears, and when I opened my eyes, the world outside went round and around, and when I closed my eyes, my head inside went around and around, and all the things I had ever seen went around and around inside my head, and above my eyes there was a great pain, as though something heavy rested always upon me, or like a band that is drawn tight and gives much hurt, and speech was slow to me, and I waited long for each right word to come to my tongue, and when I waited not long, all manner of words crowded in, and my tongue spoke foolishness. 
I was very sick. And when my father, the otter, brought the girl Kassan before me, who was a young girl and strong, my sister's child, Matsak broke in. Strong hip for children was Kassan and straight-legged and quick of foot. She made better moccasins than all of the young girls, and the bark rope she braided was the stoutest, and she had a smile in her eyes and a laugh on her lips, and her temper was not hasty, nor was she unmindful that men give the law and women ever obey. As I say, I was very sick, Lone Chief went on, and when my father, the otter, brought the girl Kassan before me, I said rather should they make me ready for burial than for marriage. Whereat the face of my father went black with anger, and he said that I should be served according to my wish, and that I, who was yet alive, should be made ready for death as one already dead. Which be not the way of our people, O white man, spoke up Matsak, for know that these things that were done to Lone Chief, it was our custom to do only to dead men. But Otter was very angry. Aye, said Lone Chief, my father the Otter was a man short of speech and swift of deed, and he commanded the people to gather before the lodge wherein I lay. And when they were gathered, he commanded them to mourn for his son, who is dead. And before the lodge they sang the death song. wailed Matsak, in so excellent an imitation that all the tendrils of my spine crawled and curved in sympathy. And inside the lodge, continued Lone Chief, my mother blackened her face with soot and flung ashes upon her head and mourned for me as one already dead, for so had my father commanded. So Okiakuda, my mother, mourned with much noise and beat her breasts and tore her hair, and likewise Honiak, my sister, and Sanata, my mother's sister, and the noise they made caused a great ache in my head, and I felt that I would surely and immediately die. And the elders of the tribe gathered about me where I lay and discussed the journey my soul must take. One spoke of the thick and endless forests where lost souls wandered crying, and where I too might chance to wander and never see the end. And another spoke of the big rivers, rapid with bad water, where evil spirits shrieked and lifted up their formless arms to drag one down by the air. For these rivers, all said together, a canoe must be provided me. And yet another spoke of the storms, such as no live man ever saw, when the stars rained down out of the sky and the earth gaped wide in many cracks, and all the rivers in the heart of the earth rushed out and in. Whereupon they that sat by me flung up their arms and wailed loudly, and those outside heard and wailed more loudly, and as to them I was as dead, so was I to my own mind dead. I did not know when or how, yet did I know that I had surely died." And Okiakuta, my mother, laid beside me my squirrel skin parka. Also, she laid beside me my parka of caribou hide, and my raincoat of seal gut, and my wet weather mucklucks, that my soul should be warm and dry on its long journey. Further, there was mention made of a steep hill thick with briars and devil's club and she fetched me heavy moccasins to make the way easy for my feet. And when the elders spoke of the great beasts I should have to slay, the young men laid beside me my strongest bow and straightest arrows, my throwing stick, my spear and knife. And when the elders spoke of the darkness and the silence of the great spaces my soul must wander through, 
my mother wailed yet more loudly and flung yet more ashes upon her head. And the girl, Kassan, crept in, very timid and quiet, and dropped a little bag upon the things for my journey. And in the little bag I knew were the flint and steel and the well-dried tinder for the fires my soul must build. And the blankets were chosen which were to be wrapped around me. Also were the slaves selected that were to be killed that my soul might have company. There were seven of these slaves. For my father was rich and powerful, and it was fit that I, his son, should have proper burial. These slaves we had got in war from the Muckamucks who lived down the Yukon. On the morrow, Skolka, the shaman, would kill them one by one so that their souls should go questing with mine through the unknown. Among other things, they would carry my canoe till we came to the big river rapid with bad water, and there being no room and their work being done, they would come no further but remain and howl forever in the dark and endless forest. And as I looked on my fine, warm clothes in my blankets and weapons of war, and as I thought of the seven slaves to be slain, I felt proud of my burial and knew that I must be the envy of many men. And all the while my father, the otter, sat silent and black, and all that day and night the people sang my death song and beat the drums till it seemed that I had surely died a thousand times. But in the morning my father arose and made talk. He had been a fighting man all his days, he said, as the people knew. Also the people knew that it were a greater honor to die fighting in battle than on the soft skins by the fire. And since I was to die anyway, it were well that I should go against the Muckamucks and be slain. Thus would I attain honor and chieftainship in the final abode of the dead, and thus would honor remain to my father, who was the otter. Wherefore he gave command that a war party be made ready to go down the river, and that when we came upon the Muckamucks, I was to go forth alone from my party, giving semblance of battle, and so be slain. Nay, but hear, O white man, cried Matsak, unable longer to contain himself. Skolka the shaman whispered long that night in the ear of the otter, and it was his doing that Lone Chief should be sent forth to die. For the otter, being old, and Lone Chief the last of his sons, Skolka had it in mind to become chief himself over the people. And when the people made great noise for a day and a night, and Lone Chief was yet alive, Skolka had become afraid that he would not die. So it was the counsel of Skolka, with fine words of honor and deeds, that spoke through the mouth of the otter. I, replied Lone Chief, well did I know it was the doing of Skolka. But I was unmindful, being very sick. I had no heart for anger, nor belly for stout words, and I cared little one way or the other. Only I cared to die and have done with it all. So, O oh white man, the war party was made ready. No tried fighters were there, nor elders crafty and wise, not but five score of young men who had seen little fighting and all the village gathered together above the bank of the river to see us depart. And we departed amid great rejoicing and the singing of my praises. Even thou, O white man, wouldst rejoice at sight of a young man going forth to battle, even though doomed to die. And so we went forth, the five score young men, and Matsak came also, for he was likewise young and untried, and by command of my father, the otter, my canoe was lashed on either side to the canoe of Matsak and the canoe of Kanakut. Thus was my strength saved me from the work of the paddles, so that for all my sickness I might make a brave show at the end, 
and thus we went down the river. Nor will I weary thee with the tale of the journey, which was not long, and not far above the village of the Muckamucks, we came upon two of their fighting men in canoes that fled at the sight of us. And then, according to the command of my father, my canoe was cast loose, and I was left to drift down all alone. Also, according to his command, were the young men to see me die, so that they might return and tell the manner of my death. Upon this, my father the otter and Skolka the shaman had been very clear, with stern promises of punishment in case they were not obeyed. I dipped my paddle and shouted words of scorn after the fleeing warriors, and the vile things I shouted made them turn their heads in anger when they beheld that the young men held back and that I came on alone. Whereupon, when they had made a safe distance, the two warriors drew their canoes somewhat apart and waited side by side for me to come between. And I came between, spear in hand, and singing the war song of my people. Each flung a spear, but I bent my body, and the spears whistled over me, and I was unhurt. Then, and we were all together, we three, I cast my spear at the one to the right, and it drove into his throat, and he pitched backward into the water. Great was my surprise thereat, for I had killed a man. I turned to the one on the left and drove strong with my paddle to meet death face to face. But the man's second spear, which was his last, but bit into the flesh of my shoulder. Then was I upon him, making no cast but pressing the point into his breast and working it through him with both my hands. And while I worked, Pressing with all my strength, he smote me upon my head once and twice with the broad of his paddle. Even as the point of the spear sprang out his back, he smote me upon the head. There was a flash, as of a bright light inside my head. I felt something give with a snap, just like that, with a snap and the weight that pressed above my eyes so long was lifted, and the band that bound my brows so tight was broken, and a great gladness came upon me, and my heart sang with joy. This be death, I thought, wherefore I thought that death was very good, and then I saw the two empty canoes, and I knew that I was not dead, but well again, the blows of the man upon my head had made me well. I knew that I had killed, and the taste of the blood made me fierce. And I drove my paddle into the breast of the Yukon and urged my canoe toward the village of the Muckamucks. The young men behind me gave a great cry. I looked over my shoulder and saw the water foaming white from their paddles. I... It foamed white from our paddles, said Mutsak, for we remembered the command of the otter and of Skolka that we behold with our own eyes the manner of Lone Chief's death. A young man of the Muckamucks, on his way to a salmon trap, beheld the coming of Lone Chief and of the five score men behind him, and the young man fled in his canoe straight for the village that the alarm might be given and preparation made. But Lone Chief hurried after him, and we hurried after Lone Chief to behold the manner of his death. Only in the face of the village, as the young man leaped to the shore, Lone Chief rose up in his canoe and made a mighty cast, and the spear entered the body of the young man above the hips, and the young man fell upon his face. Whereupon Lone Chief leaped up the bank, war club in hand and a great war cry on his lips, and dashed into the village. The first man he met was Itwili, chief of the Muckamucks, and him Lone Chief smote upon the head with his war club, so that he fell dead upon the ground. And for fear we might not behold the manner of his death, we too, the five score young men, leaped to the shore and followed Lone Chief into the village. 
only the muckamucks did not understand and thought we had come to fight, so their bothongs sang, and their arrows whistled among us, whereat we forgot our errand and fell upon them with our spears and clubs, and they, being unprepared, there was great slaughter. With my own hands I slew their shaman, proclaimed Lone Chief, his withered face a work with memory of that old-time day. With my own hands I slew him, who was a greater shaman than Skoldcock, our own shaman. And each time I faced a man, I thought, Now cometh death. And each time I slew the man, and death came not. It seemed the breath of life was strong in my nostrils, and I could not die. And we followed Lone Chief the length of the village and back again, continued Matsak. Like a pack of wolves we followed him back and forth and here and there, till there were no more muckamucks left to fight. Then we gathered together five score men slaves and double as many women and countless children, and we set fire and burned all the houses and lodges and departed. And that was the last of the Muckamucks. And that was the last of the Muckamucks, Lone Chief repeated exultantly. And when we came to our own village, the people were amazed at our burden of wealth and slaves, and in that I was still alive, they were more amazed. And my father, the otter, came trembling with gladness at the things I had done, for he was an old man, and I the last of his sons. And all the tried fighting men came, and the crafty and wise, till all the people were gathered together. And then I arose, and with a voice like thunder, commanded Skulka the shaman to stand forth. I, O white man, exclaimed Matsak, with a voice like thunder, that made the people shake at the knees and become afraid. And when Skulka had stood forth, Lone Chief went on, I said that I was not minded to die. Also, I said it were not well that disappointment come to the evil spirits that wait beyond the grave. Wherefore, I deemed it fit that the soul of Skolka fare forth into the unknown, where doubtless it would howl forever in the dark and endless forest. And then I slew him. As he stood there in the face of all the people, even I, lone chief, with my own hands, slew Skolka the shaman in the face of all the people. And when a murmuring arose, I cried aloud, With a voice like thunder, prompted Matsak. I, with a voice like thunder, I cried aloud, Behold, O ye people, I am lone chief, slayer of Skolka, the false shaman. Alone among men have I passed down through the gateway of death and returned again. Mine eyes have looked upon the unseen things. Mine ears have heard the unspoken words. Greater am I than Skolka the shaman. Greater than all the shamans am I. Likewise am I a greater chief than my father, the otter. All his days did he fight with the Muckamucks. And lo, in one day, I have destroyed them all, as with the breathing of a breath have I destroyed them. Wherefore, my father the otter being old, and Skolka the shaman being dead, I shall be both chief and shaman. Henceforth shall I be both chief and shaman to you, O my people. And if any man dispute my word, let that man stand forth. I waited, but no man stood forth. Then I cried, Ho! Oh, I have tasted blood. Now bring meat, for I am hungry. Break open the cotches, tear down the fish racks, and let the feast be big. Let there be merriment and songs, not a burial, but marriage. And last of all, let the girl Kassan be brought. The girl Kassan who is to be the mother of the children 
of Lone Chief. And at my words, and because that he was very old, my father, the otter, wept like a woman and put his arms about my knees. And from that day, I was both chief and shaman, and great honor was mine, and all men yielded me obedience until the steamboat came, Matsat prompted. I said, Lone Chief, until the steamboat came. End of section six. Section seven of Children of the Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Children of the Frost by Jack London. Quiche, the son of Quiche. Thus will I give six blankets, warm and double, six files, large and hard, six Hudson Bay knives, keen-edged and long, two canoes, the work of Mogum, the maker of things. Ten dogs, heavy-shouldered and strong in the harness, and three guns, the trigger of one be broken, but it is a good gun and can doubtless be mended. Kish paused and swept his eyes over the circle of intent faces. It was the time of the great fishing, and he was bidding to Nob for Susu, his daughter. The place was the St. George Mission by the Yukon, and the tribes had gathered for many a hundred miles, from north, south, east, and west they had come even from Tozakakat and far Tananao. And further, O Nob, thou art chief of the Tananao, and I, Kish, the son of Kish, am chief of the Tlungat. Wherefore, when my seed springs from the loins of thy daughter, there shall be a friendship between the tribes, a great friendship, and Tananao and Tlungat shall be brothers of the blood in the time to come. What I have said I will do, that I will do. And how is it with you, O Nob, in this matter? Nob nodded his head gravely, his gnarled and age-twisted face inscrutably masking the soul that dwelt behind. His narrow eyes burned like twin coals through their narrow slits as he piped in a high-cracked voice. But that is not all. What more? Kish demanded. Have I not offered full measure? Was there ever yet a Tananao maiden who fetched so great a price? Then name her! An open snicker passed round the circle, and Kish knew that he stood in shame before these people. Nay, nay, good Kish, thou dost not understand. Nob made a soft, stroking gesture. The price is fair. It is a good price. Nor do I question the broken trigger. But that is not all. What of the man? Aye, what of the man? The circle snarled. It is said, Nob's shrill voice piped, it is said that Kish does not walk in the way of his fathers. It is said that he has wandered in the dark after strange gods, and that he has become afraid. The face of Kish went dark. It is a lie, he thundered. Kish is afraid of no man. It is said... Old Nob piped on, that he has hearkened to the speech of the white man up at the big house, and that he bends head to the white man's god, and moreover that blood is displeasing to the white man's god. Kish dropped his eyes, and his hands clenched passionately. The savage circle laughed derisively, and in the ear of Nob whispered Madwan, the shaman, high priest of the tribe and maker of medicine. The shaman poked among the shadows on the rim of the firelight and roused up a slender young boy whom he had brought face to face with Kish, and in the hand of Kish he thrust a knife. Nob leaned forward. Kish, O oh Kish, darest thou to kill a man? Behold, this be Kit's new, a slave. Strike, O oh Kish, strike with the strength of thy arm. The boy trembled and waited the stroke. Kish looked at him and thoughts of Mr. Brown's higher morality floated through his mind, and strong upon him was a vision of the leaping flames of Mr. Brown's particular brand of hellfire. The knife fell to the ground, and the boy sighed and went out beyond the firelight with shaking knees. At the feet of Nob sprawled a wolf-dog, 
which bared its gleaming teeth and prepared to spring after the boy. But the shaman ground his foot into the brute's body, and so doing gave Nob an idea. And then, O Kish, what wouldst thou do, should a man do this thing to you? As he spoke, Nob held a ribbon of salmon to White Fang, and when the animal attempted to take it, smote him sharply on the nose with a stick. And afterward, O Kish, wouldst thou do thus? White Fang was cringing back on his belly and fawning to the hand of Nob. Listen, leaning on the arm of Madwan, Nob had risen to his feet. I am very old, and because I am very old, I will tell thee things. Thy father, Kish, was a mighty man, and he did love the song of the bowstring in battle. And these eyes have beheld him cast a spear till the head stood out beyond a man's body. But thou art unlike, since thou left the raven to worship the wolf. Thou art become afraid of blood, and thou makest thy people afraid. This is not good, for behold, when I was a boy, even as Kits knew there, there was no white man in all the land, but they came one by one, these white men, till now they are many, and they are a restless breed, never content to rest by the fire with a full belly, and let the morrow bring its own meat. A curse was laid upon them, it would seem, and they must work it out and toil in hardship. Kish was startled. A recollection of a hazy story told by Mr. Brown of one atom of old time came to him, and it seemed that Mr. Brown had spoken true. So they lay hands upon all they behold, these white men, and they go everywhere and behold all things, and ever do more follow in their steps, so that if nothing be done they will come to possess all the land, and there will be no room for the tribes of the raven. Wherefore it is meet that we fight with them till none are left. Then will we hold the passes and the land, and perhaps our children and our children's children shall flourish and grow fat. There is a great struggle to come when wolf and raven shall grapple, but Kish will not fight, nor will he let his people fight. So it is not well that he should take to him my daughter. Thus have I spoken, I, Nob, chief of the Tananao. But the white men are good and great, Kish made answer. The white men have taught us many things. The white men have given us blankets and knives and guns, such as we have never made and never could make. I remember in what manner we lived before they came. I was unborn then, but I have it from my father. When we went on the hunt, we must creep so close to the moose that a spear cast would cover the distance. Today we use the white man's rifle, and farther away than can a child's cry be heard. We ate fish and meat and berries, there was nothing else to eat, and we ate without salt. How many be there among you who cared to go back to the fish and meat without salt? It would have sunk home had not Madwan leaped to his feet, ere silence could come. And first a question to thee, Kish. The white man up at the big house tells you that it is wrong to kill, yet we do not know that the white men kill. Have we forgotten the great fight on the Koyokuk, or the great fight at Nukluk Yeto? where three white men killed twenty of the Tozakakats? Do you think we no longer remember the three men of the Tananao that the white man Makalrath killed? Tell me, O Kish, why does the shaman Brown teach you that it is wrong to fight when all his brothers fight? Nay, nay, there is no need to answer, Nob piped while Kish struggled with the paradox. It is very simple. The good man Brown would hold the raven tight whilst his brothers pluck the feathers. He raised his voice. But so long as there is one Tananao to strike a blow, or one maiden to bear a man-child, the raven shall not be plucked. Nob turned to a husky young man across the fire. And what sayest thou, Makamuk, who art brother to Susu? Makamuk came to his feet. A long face scar lifted his upper lip into a perpetual grin which belied the glowing ferocity of his eyes. This day, he began with cunning irrelevance, I came by the traitor Makalrath's cabin, and in the door I saw a child laughing at the sun, and the child looked at me with the traitor Makalrath's eyes, and it was frightened. The mother ran to it and quieted it. The mother was Ziska, the Thlunget woman. 
A snarl of rage rose up and drowned his voice, which he stilled by turning dramatically upon Kish, with outstretched arm and accusing finger. So, you give your women away, you slung it, and come to the Tana now for more? But we have need of our women, Kish, for we must breed men, many men, against the day when the raven grapples with the wolf. Through the storm of applause, Nob's voice shrilled clear. And out, Nasabak, who art her favorite brother. The young fellow was slender and graceful, with the strong aquiline nose and high brows of his type, but from some nervous affliction the lid of one eye drooped at odd times in a suggestive wink. Even as he arose, it so drooped and rested a moment against its cheek, but it was not greeted with the accustomed laughter. Every face was grave. I, too, passed by the traitor Magalras' cabin, he rippled in soft girlish tones, wherein there was much of youth and much of his sister, and I saw Indians with the sweat running into their eyes and their knees shaking with weariness. I say I saw Indians groaning under the logs for the store which the traitor Macklerath is to build, and with my eyes I saw them chopping wood to keep the shaman Brown's big house warm through the frost of the long nights. This be squaw work. Never shall the Tananao do the like. We shall be blood brothers to men, not squaws, and the Thlunget be squaws. A deep silence fell, and all eyes centered on Kish. He looked about him carefully, deliberately, full into the face of each grown man. So, he said passionlessly, and so, he repeated, then turned on his heel without further word and passed out into the darkness. Wading among sprawling babies and bristling wolf dogs, he threaded the great camp, and on its outskirts came upon a woman at work by the light of a fire. With strings of bark stripped from the long roots of creeping vines, she was braiding rope for the fishing. For some time without speech, he watched her deft hands bringing law and order out of the unruly mass of curling fibers. She was good to look upon, swaying there to her task, strong-limbed, deep-chested, and with hips made for motherhood. And the bronze of her face was golden in the flickering light, her hair blue-black, her eyes jet. Oh, Susu, he spoke finally, thou hast looked upon me kindly in the days that have gone, and in the days yet young. I look kindly upon thee for that thou wert chief of the Thlunget, she answered quickly, and because thou wert big and strong. Aye, but that was in the old days of the fishing, she hastened to add, before the shaman Brown came and taught thee ill things and let thy feet on strange trails. But I would tell thee the... She held up one hand in a gesture which reminded him of her father. Nay, I know already the speech that stirs in thy throat, O Kish, and I make answer now. It so happeneth that the fish of the water and the beasts of the forest bring forth after their kind, and this is good. Likewise it happeneth to women. It is for them to bring forth their kind, and even the maiden, while she is yet a maiden, feels the pain of the birth and the pain of the breast and the small hands at the neck. And when such feeling is strong, then does each maiden look about her with secret eyes for the man, for the man who shall be fit to father her kind. So have I felt, so did I feel, when I looked upon thee and found thee big and strong, a hunter and fighter of beasts and men, well able to win meat when I should eat for two, well able to keep danger afar off when my helplessness drew nigh. But that was before the day the shaman Brown came into the land, and taught thee. But it is not right, Susu. I have it on good word. It is not right to kill. I know what thou wouldst say. Then breathe thou after thy kind, the kind that does not kill. But come not on such quest among the Tana now, for it is said in the time to come that the raven shall grapple with the wolf. I do not know, for this be the affair of men, but I do know that it is for me to bring forth men against that time. Susu, Kish broke in. Thou must hear me. A man would beat me with a stick and make me hear, she sneered. But thou, here, she thrust a bunch of bark into his hand. I cannot give thee myself, but this, yes, it looks fittest in thy hands. It is squaw work, so braid away. He flung it from him, the angry blood pounding a muddy path under his bronze. One thing more, she went on. 
There be an old custom which thy father and mine were not strangers to. When a man falls in battle, his scalp is carried away in token. Very good. But thou, who have forsworn the raven, must do more. Thou must bring me not scalps, but heads, two heads, and then will I give thee, not bark, but a brave beaded belt, and sheath, and long Russian knife. Then will I look kindly upon thee once again, and all will be well. So, the man pondered, so. Then he turned and passed out through the light. Nay, O Kish, she called after him, not two heads, but three at least. But Kish remained true to his conversion, lived uprightly, and made his tribespeople obey the gospel as propounded by the Reverend Jackson Brown. Through all the time of the fishing he gave no heed to the Tananao, nor took notice of the sly things which were said, nor of the laughter of the women of the many tribes. After the fishing, Nob and his people with great store of salmon, sun-dried and smoke-cured, departed for the hunting on the head reaches of the Tananao. Kish watched them go but did not fail in his attendance at mission service, where he prayed regularly and led the singing with his deep bass voice. The Reverend Jackson Brown delighted in that deep bass voice, because of his sterling qualities deemed him the most promising convert. McElrath doubted this. He did not believe in the efficacy of the conversion of the heathen, and he was not slow in speaking his mind. But Mr. Brown was a large man in his way, and he argued it out with such convincingness, all of one long fall night, that the traitor, driven from position after position, finally announced in desperation, Knock out my brains with apples, Brown. If I don't become a convert myself, if Keish holds fast, true blue for two years. Mr. Brown never lost an opportunity. So he clinched the matter on the spot with a virile hand grip, and thenceforth the conduct of Keish was to determine the ultimate abiding place of McElrath's soul. But there came news one day after the winter's rhyme had settled down over the land sufficiently for travel. A Tananal man arrived at the St. George mission in quest of ammunition, and bringing information that Susu had set eyes on Ni Ku, a nervous young hunter who had bid brilliantly for her by old Nob's fire. It was at about this time that the Reverend Jackson Brown came upon Kish by the wood trail, which leads down to the river. Kish had his best dogs in the harness, and shoved under the sled lashings was his largest and finest pair of snowshoes. "'Where goest thou, O Kish, hunting?' Mr. Brown asked, falling into the Indian manner. Kish looked him steadily in the eyes for a full minute, then started up his dogs. Then again, turning his deliberate gaze upon the missionary, he answered, No, I go to hell. In an open space, striving to burrow into the snow as though for shelter from appalling desolateness, huddled three dreary lodges. Ringed all about, a dozen paces away, was the somber forest. Overhead there was no keen blue sky of naked space, but a vague misty curtain, pregnant with snow, which had drawn between. There was no wind, no sound, nothing but the snow and silence. Nor was there even the general stir of life about the camp, for the hunting party had run upon the flank of the caribou herd, and the kill had been large. Thus, after the period of fasting, had come the plenitude of feasting, and thus... In broad daylight they slept heavily under their roofs of moose hide. By a fire before one of the lodges, five pairs of snowshoes stood on end in their element, and by the fire sat Susu. The hood of her squirrel-skin parka was about her hair, and well drawn up around her throat, but her hands were unmittened and nimbly at work with needle and sinew, completing the last fantastic design on a belt of leather faced with bright scarlet cloth. A dog, Somewhere at the rear of one of the lodges raised a short, sharp bark, then ceased as abruptly as it had begun. Once her father in the lodge at her back gurgled and grunted in his sleep. Bad dreams, she smiled to herself. He grows old, and that last joint was too much. She placed the last bead, knotted the sinew, and replenished the fire. Then after gazing long into the flames, she lifted her head to the harsh crunch, crunch of a moccasined foot against the flinty snow granules. Kish was at her side, bending slightly forward to a load which he bore upon his back. This was wrapped loosely in a soft-hand moose hide, and he dropped it carelessly into the snow and sat down. They looked at each other long and without speech. "'It is a far fetch, O Kish,' 
she said at last. A far fetch from St. George Mission by the Yukon. Aye, he made answer absently, his eyes fixed keenly upon the belt and taking note of its girth. But where is the knife? he demanded. Here. She drew it from inside her parka and flashed its naked length in the firelight. It is a good knife. Give it me, he commanded. Nay, O Quiche, she laughed. It may be that thou was not born to wear it. Give it me, he reiterated without change of tone. I was so born. But her eyes, glancing coquettishly past him to the moose hide, saw the snow about it slowly reddening. It is blood, Quiche? she asked. Aye, it is blood, but give me the belt and the long Russian knife. She felt suddenly afraid, but thrilled when he took the belt roughly from her. Thrilled to the roughness. She looked at him softly and was aware of a pain at the breast, and of small hands clutching her throat. It was made for a smaller man, he remarked grimly, drawing in his abdomen and clasping the buckle at the first hole. Susu smiled, and her eyes were yet softer. Again she felt the soft hands at her throat. He was good to look upon, and the belt was indeed small, made for a smaller man. But what did it matter? She could make many belts. But the blood? she asked, urged on by a hope newborn and growing. The blood quiche? Is it... are they... heads? Aye. They must be very fresh, else would the blood be frozen. Aye, it is not cold, and they be fresh, quite fresh. Oh, quiche! Her face was warm and bright. And for me? Aye, for thee. He took hold of a corner of the hide, flirted it open, and rolled the heads out before her. Three, he whispered savagely. Nay, four at least. But she sat transfixed. There they lay, the soft-featured Ni Ku, the gnarled old face of Nob, Makamuk, grinning at her with his lifted upper lip, and lastly, Nasabak, his eyelid up to its old trick, drooped on his girlish cheek in a suggestive wink. There they lay, the firelight flashing upon and playing over them, and from each of them a widening circle dyed the snow to scarlet. Thawed by the fire, the white crust gave way beneath the head of Nob, which rolled over like a thing alive, spun around, and came to rest at her feet. But she did not move. Quiche, too, sat motionless, his eyes, unblinking, centered steadfastly upon her. Once in the forest, an overburdened pine dropped its load of snow, and the echoes reverberated hollowly down the gorge, but neither stirred. The short day had been waning fast, and the darkness was wrapping round the camp when White Fang trotted up toward the fire. He paused to reconnoiter, but not being driven back, came closer. His nose shot swiftly to the side, nostrils a-tremble, and bristles rising along the spine, and straight and true he followed the sudden scent to his master's head. He sniffed it gingerly at first and licked the forehead with his red lolling tongue. Then he sat abruptly down, pointed his nose up at the first faint star, and raised the long wolf howl. This brought Susu to herself. She glanced across at Quiche, who had unsheathed the Russian knife and was watching her intently. His face was firm and set, and in it she read the law. Slipping back the hood of her parka, she bared her neck and rose to her feet. There she paused and took a long look about her, at the rimming forest, at the faint stars in the sky, at the camp, at the snowshoes in the snow. A last, long, comprehensive look at life. A light breeze stirred her hair from the side, and for the space of one deep breath she turned her head and followed it around until she met it full-faced. Then she thought of her children, ever to be unborn, and she walked over to Quiche and said, I am ready. End of section 7「Section eight of Children of the Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Children of the Frost by Jack London. The Death of Lagaon. Blood for Blood 
rank for rank. It's linked code. Hear now the death of Lagaun. The speaker ceased, or rather suspended utterance, and gazed upon me with an eye of understanding. I held the bottle between our eyes and the fire, indicated with my thumb the depth of the drought, and shoved it over to him. For was he not Politlum, the drinker? Many tales had he told me, and long had I waited for the scriptless scribe to speak of the things concerning Lagaun, for he of all men living knew these things best. He tilted back his head with a grunt that slid swiftly into a gurgle, and the shadow of a man's torso, monstrous beneath a huge inverted bottle, wavered and danced on the frown of the cliff at our backs. Palitlum released his lips from the glass with a caressing suck and glanced regretfully up into the ghostly vault of the sky where played the wan white light of the summer borealis. It be strange, he said, cold like water and hot like fire. To the drinker it giveth strength, and from the drinker it taketh away strength. It maketh old men young, and young men old. To the man who is wary, it leadeth him to get up and go onward, and to the man unwary it burdeneth him into sleep. My brother was possessed of the heart of a rabbit, yet did he drink of it, and forthwith slay four of his enemies. My father was like a great wolf, showing his teeth to all men, yet did he drink of it, and was shot through the back, running swiftly away. It be most strange. It is three-star, and a better than what they poison their bellies with down there, I answered, sweeping my hand, as it were, over the yawning chasm of blackness, and down to where the beach fires glinted far below, tiny jets of flame which gave proportion and reality to the night. Politlum sighed and shook his head. Wherefore I am here with thee. And here he embraced the bottle and me in a look, which told more eloquently than speech of his shameless thirst. Nay, I said, snuggling the bottle in between my knees. Speak now of Lagaun. Of the three-star we will hold speech hereafter. There be plenty, and I am not wearied, he pleaded brazenly, but the feel of it on my lips, and I will speak great words of Lagaun in his last days. From the drinker it taketh away strength, I mocked, and to the man unwary it burdeneth him into sleep. Thou art wise, he rejoined without anger and pridelessly, like all of thy brothers, thou art wise. Waking or sleeping, the three-star be with thee. Yet never have I known thee to drink overlong or overmuch. And the while you gather to you the gold that hides in our mountains, and the fish that swim in our seas. And Politlum, and the brothers of Politlum, dig the gold for thee, and net the fish, and are glad to be made glad when out of thy wisdom thou deemest it fit that the three-star should wet our lips. I was minded to hear of Lagaun, I said impatiently. The night grows short, and we have a sore journey tomorrow. I yawned and made as though to rise, but Polythlum betrayed a quick anxiety, and with abruptness began. It was Lagaun's desire in his old age that peace should be among the tribes. As a young man he had been first of the fighting men, and chief over the war chiefs of the islands and the passes. All his days had been full of fighting. More marks he boasted of bone and lead and iron than any other man. Three wives he had, and for each wife two sons, and the sons, eldest born and last, and all died by his side in battle. Restless as the bald face, he ranged wide and far, north to Unalaska and the shallow sea, south to the Queen of Charlotte's. Ay, even did he go with the cakes, it is told to far Puget Sound, and slay thy brothers in their sheltered houses. But as I say, in his old age he looked for peace among the tribes, not that he was become afraid, or overfond of the corner by the fire and the well-filled pot. For he slew with the shrewdness and blood-hunger of the fiercest, drew in his belly to famine with the youngest, and with the stoutest faced the bitter seas and stinging trail. But because of his many deeds and in punishment, a warship carried him away, even to thy country. O Hareface and Boston man, and the years were many ere he came back, and I was grown to something more than a boy, and something less than a young man. And Lagaun, being childless in his old age, made much of me, and grown wise gave me of his wisdom. It be good to fight, O Politlum, said he. Nay, O Hareface, for I was unknown as Politlum in those days, being called Olo, the ever-hungry. The drink was to come after. 
It be good to fight, spoke Lagaon, but it be foolish. In the Boston man country, as I saw with mine eyes, they are not given to fighting one with another, and they be strong. Wherefore of their strength they come against us of the islands and passes, and we are as camp smoke and sea mist before them. Wherefore I say it be good to fight, most good, but it be likewise foolish. And because of this, Though first always of the fighting men, Lagaon's voice was loudest ever for peace. And when he was very old, being greatest of chiefs and richest of men, he gave a potlatch. Never was there such a potlatch. Five hundred canoes were lined against the river bank, and in each canoe there came not less than ten of men and women. Eight tribes were there. From the first and oldest man to the last and youngest babe were they there. And then there were men from far distant tribes, great travelers and seekers who had heard of the potlatch of Lagaon. And from the length of seven days they filled their bellies with his meat and drink. Eight thousand blankets did he give to them, as I well know. For who but I kept the tally, and apportioned according to degree and rank. And in the end Lagaon was a poor man. But his name was on all men's lips, and other chiefs gritted their teeth in envy that he should be so great. And so, because there was weight to his words, he counseled peace, and he journeyed to every potlatch and feast and tribal gathering that he might counsel peace. And so it came that we journeyed together, Lagaon and I, to the great feast given by Niblak, who was chief over the river Indians of the Scoot, which is not far from the Stikine. This was in the last days, and Lagaon was very old and very close to death. He coughed of cold weather and camp smoke, and often the red blood ran from out of his mouth till we looked for him to die. Nay, he said once, at such time, it were better that I should die when the blood leaps to the knife, and there is a clash of steel and smell of powder, and men crying aloud, what of the cold iron and quick lead? So it be plain, old hairface, that his heart was yet strong for battle. It is very far from the Chilcat to the Scoot, and we were many days in the canoes, and the while the men bent to the paddles, I sat at the feet of Lagaon and received the law. Of small need for me to say the law, O hairface, for it be known to me that in this thou art well skilled. Yet do I speak of the law blood for blood and rank for rank. Also did Lagaon go deeper into the matter, saying, But know this, O Olo, that there be little honor in the killing of a man less than thee. Kill always the man who is greater, and thy honor shall be according to his greatness. But if of two men thou killest the lesser, then is shame thine, for which the very squaws will lift their lips at thee. As I say, peace be good, but remember, O Olo, if kill thou must, that thou killest by the law. It is a way of the thlinket folk. Politlum vouchsafed half apologetically and I remembered the gunfighters and bad men of my own western land, and was not perplexed at the way of the Thlinket folk. In time, Politlum continued, we came to Chief Niblack and the Scoots. It was a feast great almost as the potlatch of Lagaon. There were we of the Chilcat and the Sitkas and the Stikines, who are neighbors to the Scoots, and the Wrangles and the Hunas. There were sundowns and tacos from Port Houghton, and their neighbors, the Alks from Douglas Channel, the Nas River people, and the Tongas from north of Dixon, and the Cakes, who come from the island called Kuprinoff. Then there were the Siwashes from Vancouver, Cassiers from the Gold Mountains, Teslin men, and even Sticks from the Yukon country. It was a mighty gathering, but first of all there was to be a meeting of the chiefs with Niblack, and a drowning of all enmities in Kwas. The Russians it was who showed us the way of making kwas, for so my father told me, my father who got it from his father before him. But to this kwas had Niblack added many things, such as sugar, flour, dried apples, and hops, so that it was a man's drink, strong and good, not so good as three-star, O oh face, yet good. This kwas feast was for the chiefs, and the chiefs only. And there was a score of them, but Lagaon being very old and very great, it was given that I walk with him that he might lean upon my shoulder, and that I might ease him down when he took his seat, and raise him up when he arose. 
At the door of Niblack's house, which was of logs and very big, each chief, as was the custom, laid down his spear or rifle and his knife. For as thou knowest, O Hareface, strong drink quickens, and old hates flame up, and head and hand are swift to act. But I noted that Lagaon had brought two knives, the one he left outside the door, the other slipped under his blanket, snug to the grip. The other chiefs did likewise, and I was troubled for what was to come. The chiefs were ranged, sitting in a big circle about the room. I stood at Lagaon's elbow. In the middle was the barrel of quas, and by it a slave to serve the drink. First, Niblock made oration, with much show of friendship and many fine words. Then he gave a sign, and the slave dipped a gourd full of quas and passed it to Lagaon, as was fit, for his was the highest rank. Lagaon drank it to the last drop, and I gave him my strength to get on his feet so that he, too, might make oration. He had kind speech for the many tribes, noted the greatness of Niblock to give such a feast, counseled for peace, as was his custom, and at the end said that the quas was very good. Then Niblock drank, being next of rank to Lagaon, and after him one chief and another in degree and order, and each spoke friendly words and said that the quas was good, till all had drunk. Dare I say all? Nay, not all, O Hareface, for last of them was one, a lean and cat-like man, young of face with a quick and daring eye, who drank darkly and spat forth upon the ground, and spoke no word. To not say that the quas was good were insult, to spit forth upon the ground were worse than insult, and this very thing did he do. He was known for a chief over the sticks of the Yukon, and further naught was known of him. As I say, it was an insult, but mark this, O Hareface, it was an insult not to Niblock the feast-giver, but to the man chiefest of rank who sat among those of the circle, and that man was Lagaon. There was no sound. All eyes were upon him to see what he might do. He made no movement. His withered lips trembled not in speech, nor did a nostril quiver, nor an eyelid droop. But I saw that he looked wan and grey, as I have seen old men look of bitter mornings when famine pressed. And the women wailed, and the children whimpered, and there was no meat nor sign of meat. And as the old men looked, so looked Lagoon. There was no sound, it were as a circle of the dead, but that each chief felt beneath his blanket to make sure, and that each chief glanced to his neighbor, right and left, with a measuring eye. I was a stripling, the things I had seen were few, yet I knew it to be the moment one meets but once in all a lifetime. The stick rose up, with every eye upon him, and crossed the room till he stood before Lagaon. I am Opitza, the knife, he said. But Lagaon said not, nor looked at him, but gazed unblinkingly at the ground. You are Lagaon, Opitza said. You have killed many men. I am still alive. And still Lagaon said not, though he made the sign to me, and with my strength arose and stood upright on his two feet. He was an old pine, naked and gray, but still a shoulder to the frost and storm. His eyes were unblinking, and as he had not heard Opitza, so it seemed he did not see him. And Opitza was mad with anger, and danced stiff-legged before him, as men do when they wish to give another shame. And Opitza sang a song of his own greatness, and the greatness of his people, filled with bad words for the Chilkats and for Lagaon. And as he danced and sang, Opitza threw off his blanket, and with his knife drew bright circles before the face of Lagaon. And the song he sang was the song of the knife. And there was no other sound, only the singing of Opitza, and the circle of chiefs that were as dead, save that the flash of the knife seemed to draw smoldering fire from their eyes. And Lagaon also was very still, yet did he know his death, and was unafraid. And the knife sang closer, and yet closer to his face. But his eyes were unblinking, and he swayed not to right or left, or this way or that. And Opitza drove in the knife so, twice on the forehead of Lagaon, and the red blood leaped after it. And then it was that Lagaon gave me the sign to bear up under him with my youth, that he might walk. And he laughed with great scorn, full in the face of Opitza the knife. 
and he brushed Opatsa to the side, as one brushes to the side a low-hanging branch on the trail and passes on. And I knew and understood, for there was but shame in the killing of Opatsa before the faces of a score of greater chiefs. I remembered the law, and knew that Lagaon had it in mind to kill by the law, and who chiefest of rank but himself was there but Niblak, and toward Niblak, leaning on my arm, he walked. And to his other arm, clinging and striking, was Opatsa, too small to soil with his blood the hands of so great a man. And though the knife of Opatsa bit in again and again, Lagaon noted it not, nor winced. And in this fashion we three went our way across the room, Niblock sitting in his blanket and fearful of our coming. And now old hates flamed up and forgotten grudges were remembered. Lamuk, a cake, had had a brother drowned in the bad water of the Stikine, and the Stikines had not paid in blankets for their bad water as was the custom to pay. So Lamuk drove straight with his long knife to the heart of Klok Kutz, the Stikine. And Kachahuk, remembering a quarrel of the Nas River people with the Tongas of north of Dixon, and the chief of the Tongas he slew with a pistol, which made much noise. And the blood hunger gripped all the men who sat in the circle, and chief slew chief, or was slain as chance might be. Also did they stab and shoot at Lagawan, for whoso killed him won great honor, and would be unforgotten for the deed. And they were about to kill him like wolves about a moose, only they were so many, they were in their own way, and they slew one another to make room, and there was great confusion. But Lagawan went slowly, without haste, as though many years were yet before him. It seemed that he was certain he would make his kill in his own way, ere they could slay him. And as I say, he went slowly, and knives bit into him, and he was red with blood. And though none sought after me who was a mere stripling, yet did the knives find me, and the hot bullets burn me, and still Lagaon leaned his weight on my youth, and Opatsa struck at him, and we three went forward. And when we stood by Niblock, he was afraid, and covered his head with his blanket. The scoots were ever cowards. And Gulzug and Kadishan, the one a fish-eater and the other a meat-killer, closed together for the honor of their tribes, and they raged madly about, and in their battling swung against the knees of Opatsa, who was overtaken and trampled upon, and a knife, singing through the air, smote Sculpin of the Sitkas in the throat. And he flung his arms out blindly, reeling, and dragged me down in his fall. And from the ground I beheld Lagaon bend over Niblock, and uncover the blanket from his head, and turn up his face to the light. And Lagaon was in no haste. Being blinded with his own blood, he swept it out of his eyes with the back of his hand, so he might see and be sure. And when he was sure that the upturned face was the face of Niblock, he drew the knife across his throat as one draws a knife across the throat of a trembling deer. And then Lagaon stood erect, singing his death song, and swaying gently to and fro. And Sculpin, who had dragged me down, shot with a pistol from where he lay, and Lagaon toppled and fell, as an old pine topples and falls in the teeth of the wind. Pelitlam ceased. His eyes smoldering moodily were bent upon the fire, and his cheek was dark with blood. "'And thou, Politlum, I demanded. "'And thou? I? "'I did remember the law, and I slew Opatsa the knife, which was well, "'and I drew Lagon's own knife from the throat of Niblock, "'and slew Sculpin, who had dragged me down, "'for I was a stripling, and I could slay any man, and it were honor. "'And further, Lagon being dead, there was no need for my youth.' and I laid about me with his knife, choosing the chiefest of rank that yet remained. Politlam fumbled under his shirt and drew forth a beaded sheath, and from the sheath a knife. It was a knife home-wrought and crudely fashioned from a whipsaw file, a knife such as one may find possessed by old men in a hundred Alaskan villages. The knife of Lagaon, I said, and Politlam nodded. And for the knife of Lagaon, I said, Will I give thee ten bottles of three star? But Politlam looked at me slowly. Hairface, I am weak as water and easy as a woman. I have soiled my belly with quass and hooch and three star. My eyes are blunted, my ears have lost their keenness, and my strength has gone into fat. And I am without honor in these days, and am called Politlam the drinker. Yet honor was mine at the potlatch of Niblack on the scoot, and the memory of it and the memory of Lagaon be dear to me. Nay, 
didst thou turn the sea itself into three star and say that it were all mine for the knife, yet would I keep the knife. I am Pudlitlam, the drinker, but I was once Olo, the ever hungry, who bore up Lagaon with his youth. Thou art a great man, Pudlitlam, I said, and I honor thee. Pudlitlam reached out his hand. The three star between thy knees be mine for the tale I have told, he said. And as I looked on the frown of the cliff at our backs, I saw the shadow of a man's torso, monstrous beneath a huge inverted bottle. End of section 8「Section 9 of Children of the Frost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tiffany Wilson Lillard. Children of the Frost by Jack London. Lee Wan the Fair. The sun sinks, Kenim, and the heat of the day is gone. So called Lee Wan to the man whose head was hidden beneath the squirrel skin robe. But she called softly, as though divided between the duty of waking him and the fear of him awake. For she was afraid of this big husband of hers, who was like unto none of the men she had known. The moose meat sizzled uneasily, and she moved the frying pan to one side of the red embers. As she did so, she glanced warily at the two Hudson Bay dogs dripping eager slobber from their scarlet tongues and following her every movement. They were huge, hairy fellows, crouched leeward in the thin smoke wake of the fire to escape the swarming myriads of mosquitoes. As Li Wan gazed down the steep to where the Klondike flung its swollen flood between the hills, one of the dogs bellied its way forward like a worm, and with a deft, cat-like stroke of the paw, dipped a chunk of hot meat out of the pan to the ground. But Li Wan caught him from out of the tail of her eye, and he sprang back with a snap and a snarl, and she wrapped him over the nose with a stick of firewood. Nay, Olo, she laughed, recovering the meat without removing her eye from him. Thou art ever hungry, and for that thy nose leads thee into endless troubles. But the mate of Olo joined him, and together they defied the woman. The hair on their backs and shoulders bristled in recurrent waves of anger, and the thin lips writhed and lifted into ugly wrinkles, exposing the flesh-tearing fangs, cruel and menacing. Their very noses serulated and shook in brute passion, and they snarled as the wolves snarl, with all the hatred and malignity of the breed impelling them to spring upon the woman and drag her down. And thou too, Bash, fierce is thy master, and never out peace with the hand that feeds thee. This is not thy quarrel, so be thine, and that... As she cried, she dove at them with the firewood, but they avoided the blows and refused to retreat. They separated and approached her from either side, crouching low and snarling. Li Wan had struggled with the wolf dog for mastery from the time she toddled among the skin bales of the teepee, and she knew a crisis was at hand. Bash had halted, his muscles stiff and tense for the spring. Olo was yet creeping into striking distance. Grasping two blazing sticks by the charred ends, she faced the brutes. The one held back, but Bash sprang, and she met him in mid-air with a flaming weapon. There were sharp yelps of pain and swift odors of burning hair and flesh as he rolled into the dirt, and the woman ground the fiery embers into his mouth. Snapping wildly, he flung himself sideways out of her reach, and in a frenzy of fear scrambled for safety. Olo, on the other side, had begun his retreat when Li Wan reminded him of her primacy by hurling a heavy stick of wood into his ribs. Then the pair retreated under a rain of firewood, and on the edge of the camp fell to licking their wounds and whimpering by turns and snarling. Li Wan blew the ashes off the meat and sat down again. Her heart had not gone up a beat, and the incident was already old, for this was the routine of life. Kanem had not stirred during the disorder, but instead had set up a lusty snoring. Come, Kanem, she called. The heat of the day is gone, and the trail waits for our feet. The squirrel skin robe was agitated and cast aside by a brown arm. Then the man's eyelids fluttered and drooped again. His pack is heavy, she thought, and he is tired with the work of the morning. A mosquito stung her on the neck, 
and she daubed the unprotected spot with wet clay from a ball she had convenient to hand. All morning, toiling up the divide and enveloped in a cloud of the pest, the man and woman had plastered themselves with the sticky mud, which, drying in the sun, covered their faces with masks of clay. These masks, broken in divers places by the movement of the facial muscles, had constantly to be renewed, so that the deposit was irregular of depth and peculiar of aspect. Liwan shook Kenem gently, but with a persistence, till he rose and sat up. His first glance was to the sun, and after consulting the celestial timepiece, he hunched over to the fire and fell to ravenously onto the meat. He was a large Indian, fully six feet in height, deep-chested and heavy-muscled, and his eyes were keener and vested with greater mental vigor than the average of his kind. The lines of will had marked his face deeply, and this, coupled with the sternness and primitiveness, advertised a native indomitability, unswerving of purpose, and prone, when thwarted, to sullen cruelty. Tomorrow, Liwan, we shall feast. He sucked a marrow bone clean and threw it to the dogs. We shall have flapjacks fried in bacon grease and sugar. Which is more toothsome? Flapjacks? she questioned, mouthing the word curiously. Aye, Kenem answered with superiority, and I shall teach you the new ways of cookery. Of these things I speak you are ignorant, and of many more things besides. You have lived your days in a little corner of the earth, and know nothing, but I, he straightened himself, and looked at her pridefully, I am a great traveler, and have been all places, even among the white people, and I am versed in their ways, and in the ways of many peoples. I am not a tree, born to stand in one place always, and know not where there be over the next hill, for I am Kanem, the canoe, made to go here and there, and to journey and quest up and down the length and breadth of the world. She bowed her head humbly. It is true, I have eaten fish and meat and berries all my days, and lived in a little corner of the earth. Nor did I dream the world was so large, until you stole me from my people, and I cooked and carried for you on the endless trails. She looked up at him suddenly. Tell me, Kenem, does this trail ever end? Nay, he answered. My trail is like the world. It never ends. My trail is the world, and I have traveled it since the time my legs could carry me, and I shall travel it until I die. My father and my mother may be dead, but it is long since I looked upon them, and I do not care. My tribe is like your tribe. It stays in one place, which is far from here. But I care not for my tribe, for I am Kanem the Canoe. And must I, Li Wan, who am weary, travel always your trail until I die? You, Li Wan, are my wife, and the wife travels the husband's trail wherever it goes. It is the law. And were it not the law, yet it would it be the law of Kanem, who is lawgiver unto himself and his. She bowed her head again for she knew no other law than the man that was master of the woman. Be not in haste, Kenem cautioned her, as she began to strap the meager camp outfit to her pack. The sun is yet hot, and the trail leads down and the footing is good. She dropped her work obediently and resumed her seat. Kenem regarded her with speculative interest. You do not squat on your hams like other women, he remarked. No, she answered. It never came easy. It tires me, and I cannot take my rest that way. And why is it your feet point not straight before you? I do not know, save that they are unlike the feet of other women. A satisfied light crept into his eyes, but otherwise he gave no sign. Like other women, your hair is black, but have you ever noticed that it is soft and fine, softer and finer than the hair of other women? I have noticed, she answered shortly, for she was not pleased at such cold analysis of her sex deficiencies. It is a year now since I took you from your people, he went on, and you are nigh and shy and afraid of me as when I first looked upon you. How does this thing be? Li Wan shook her head. I am afraid of you, Kenem. You are so big and strange. And further, before you looked upon me, I was even afraid of the young men. I do not know, I cannot say, only it seemed, somehow, as though I should not be for them. 
as though... I, he encouraged, impatient after her faltering. As though they were not my kind. Not your kind? he demanded slowly. Then what is your kind? I do not know. I... She shook her head in a bewildered manner. I cannot put into words the way I felt. It was strangeness to me. I was unlike other maidens who sought the young men slyly. I could not care for the young men that way. It would have been a great wrong, it seemed, and an ill deed. What is the first thing you remember? Kenem asked with abrupt irreverence. Pawakayan, my mother. And not else before Pawakan? Not else. But Kanem, holding her eyes with his, searched her secret soul and saw it waver. Think, and think hard, Liwan, he threatened. She stammered, and her eyes were piteous and pleading, but his will dominated her and wrung from her lips the reluctant speech. But it was only dreams, Kanem, ill dreams of childhood, Shadows of things not real, visions such as dogs sleeping in the sun warmth, behold and whine out against. Tell me, he commanded, of the things before Pawakan, your mother. They are forgotten memories, she protested. As a child, I dreamed awake, with my eyes open to the day, and when I spoke of the strange things I saw, I was laughed at, and the other children were afraid and drew away from me. And when I spoke of the things I saw to Pawakan, she chided me and said they were evil. Also, she beat me. It was a sickness, I believe, like the falling sickness that comes to old men. And in time, I grew better and dreamed no more. And now, I cannot remember. She brought her hand in a confused manner to her forehead. They are there, somewhere, but I cannot find them, only... Only... Kanam repeated, holding her. Only one thing. But you will laugh at its foolishness. It is so unreal. Nigh, Liwan. Dreams are dreams. They may be memories of other lives we have lived. I was once a moose. I firmly believe I was once a moose. What of the things I have seen in dreams and heard? Strive as he would to hide it, a growing anxiety was manifest. But Liwan, groping after the words with which to paint the picture, took no heed. I see a snow-tramped space among the trees, she began, and across the snow the sign of a man where he has dragged himself heavily on hand and knee. And I see, too, the man in the snow, and it seems I am very close to him when I look. He is unlike real men, for he has hair on his face, much hair, and the hair of his face and head is yellow like the summer coat of the weasel. His eyes are closed, but they open and search about. They are blue like the sky, and look into mine and search no more. And his hand moves, slow as from weakness, and I feel... I? Kenem whispered hoarsely. You feel? No, no, she cried in haste. I feel nothing. Did I say feel? I did not mean it. It could not be that I should mean it. I see, and I see only, and that is all I see. A man in the snow, with eyes like the sky and hair like the weasel. I have seen it many times, and always it is the same. A man of the snow. And do you see yourself? he asked, leaning forward and regarding her intently. Do you ever see yourself and the man in the snow? Why should I see myself? Am I not real? His muscles relaxed and he sank back an exultant satisfaction in his eyes, which he turned from her so that she might not see. I will tell you, Liwan, he spoke decisively. You were a little bird in some life before, a little moose bird, when you saw this thing, and the memory of it is with you yet. It is not strange, I was once a moose, and my father's father after became a bear. So said the shaman, and the shaman cannot lie. Thus, on the trail of the gods we pass from life to life, and the gods know only and understand. Dreams and the shadow of dreams be memories, nothing more, and the dog, whining asleep in the sun warmth, doubtless sees and remembers things gone before. Bash, there, was a warrior once. I do firmly believe he was once a warrior. 
Kenim tossed a bone to the brute and got up to his feet. Come, let us be gone. The sun is yet hot, but it will get no cooler. And these white people? What are they like? Li Wan made bold to ask. Like you and me, he answered, only they are less dark of skin. You will be among them ere the day is dead. Kanem lashed the sleeping robe to his one hundred and fifty pound pack, smeared his face with wet clay, and sat down to rest till Li Wan had finished loading the dogs. Olo cringed at the sight of the club in her hand, and gave no trouble when the bundle of forty pounds and odd were strapped upon him. But Bash was aggrieved and truculent and could not forbear to whimper and snarl as he was forced to receive the burden. He bristled his back and bared his teeth as she drew the straps tight, the while throwing all the malignancy of his nature into the glances shot at her sideways and backward. And Kanem chuckled and said, Did I not say he was once a very great warrior? These furs will bring a price, he remarked, as he adjusted his head strap and lifted his pack clear of the ground. A big price. The white men pay well for such goods, for they have no time to hunt, and are soft to the cold. Soon shall we feast, Liwan, and you have feasted never in all the lives you have lived before. She grunted acknowledgment and gratitude for her lord's condensation, slipped into the harness, and bent forward to the load. The next time I am born, I would be born a white man, he added, and swung off down the trail which divided into the gorge at his feet. The dogs followed close at his heels, and Li Wan brought up the rear. But her thoughts were far away, across the ice mountains to the east, to the little corner of the earth where her childhood had been lived. Ever as a child, she remembered, she had been looked upon as strange, as one with an affliction. Truly she had dreamed awake and been scolded and beaten for the remarkable visions she saw, till, after a time, she had outgrown them but not utterly. Though they troubled her no more waking, they came to her in her sleep, grown woman that she was, and many a night of nightmare was hers, filled with fluttering shapes, vague and meaningless. The talk with Kanem had excited her, and down all the twisted slant of the divide she harked back to the mocking fantasies of her dreams. Let us take breath, Kanem said, when they had tapped midway the bed of the main creek. He rested his pack on a jutting rock, slipped the head strap, and sat down. Liwan joined him, and the dogs sprawled, panting on the ground beside them. At their feet rippled the glacial drip of the hills, but it was muddy and discolored, as if soiled by some commotion of the earth. Why is this? Liwan asked. Because of the white men who work in the ground. Listen. He held up his hand, and they heard the ring of pick and shovel, and the sound of men's voices. They are made mad by gold, and work without ceasing that they may find it. Gold? It is yellow and comes from the ground, and is considered of great value. It is also a measure of price. But Li Wan's roving eyes had called her attention from him. A few yards below, and partly screened by a clump of young spruce, the tiered logs of a cabin rose to meet its overhanging roof of dirt. A thrill ran through her, and all her dream phantoms roused up and stirred about uneasily. Kanem, she whispered in an agony of apprehension. Kanem, what is that? The white man's teepee, in which he eats and sleeps. She eyed it wistfully, grasping its virtues at a glance and thrilling again at the unaccountable sensations it aroused. It must be very warm in time of frost, she said aloud though she felt that she must make strange sounds with her lips. She felt impelled to utter them, but did not, and the next instant Kanem said, It is called a cabin. Her heart gave a great leap. The sounds, the very sounds. She looked about her in sudden awe. How should she know that strange word before ever she heard it? What could be the matter? And then with a shock, half of fear and half of delight, she realized that for the first time in her life there had been sanity and significance in the promptings of her dreams. Cabin, she repeated to herself. Cabin. An incoherent flood of dream stuff welled up and up till her head was dizzy and her heart seemed bursting. Shadows and looming bulks of things and unintelligible associations fluttered and whirled about, 
and she strove vainly with her consciousness to grasp and hold them, for she felt that there, in the welter of memories, was the key of the mystery. Could she but grasp and hold it, all would be clear and plain. O oh, Kenem! O oh, Pawaka'an! O oh, shades and shadows, what was that? She turned to Kenem, speechless and trembling, the dream stuff in mad, overwhelming riot. She was sick and fainting, and could only listen to the ravishing sounds which proceeded from the cabin and wonderful rhythm. Hum, fiddle, Kenem vouchsafed. But she did not hear him, for in the ecstasy she was experiencing, it seemed at last that all things were coming clear. Now, now, she thought. A sudden moisture swept into her eyes, and the tears trickled down her cheeks. The mystery was unlocking, but the faintness was overpowering her. If only she could hold herself long enough. If only. But the landscape bent and crumpled up, and the hills swayed back and forth across the sky as she sprang upright and screamed, Daddy! Daddy! Then the sun reeled, and the darkness smote her, and she pitched forward limp and headlong among the rocks. Kanem looked to see if her neck had been broken by the heavy pack, grunted in satisfaction, and threw water upon her from the creek. She came too slowly, with choking sobs, and sat up. It is not good, the hot sun on the head, he ventured. And she answered, No, it is not good, and the pack bore upon me hard. We shall camp early, so that you may sleep long and win strength, he said gently. And if we go now, we shall be the quicker to bed. Liwan said nothing, but tottered to her feet in obedience and stirred up the dogs. She took the swing of his pace mechanically and followed him past the cabin, scarce daring to breathe. But no sounds issued forth, though the door was open and smoke curling upward from the sheet-iron stovepipe. They came upon a man in the bend of the creek, white of skin and blue of eye, and for a moment Li Wan saw the other man in the snow, but she saw dimly, for she was weak and tired from what she had undergone. Still, she looked at him curiously and stopped with Kenem to watch him at his work. He was washing gravel in a large pan with a circular, tilting movement, and as they looked, giving a deft flirt, he flashed up the yellow gold in a broad streak across the bottom of the pan. Very rich, this creek, Kenem told her as they went on. Sometime I will find such a creek, and then I shall be a big man. Cabins and men grew more plentiful, till they came to where the main portion of the creek was spread out before them. It was the scene of vast devastation. Everywhere the earth was torn and rent as though by a titan's struggle. Where there were no upthrown mounds of gravel, Great holes and trenches yawned, and chasms where the thick rime of the earth had been peeled to bedrock. There was no worn channel for the creek, and its waters dammed up, diverted, flying through the air on giddy flumes, trickling into sinks and low places, and raised by huge water wheels, were used and used again a thousand times. The hills had been stripped of their trees, and the raw sides gored and perforated by a great timber slides and prospect holes, and over all, like a monstrous race of ants, was flung an army of men, mud-covered, dirty, disheveled men, who crawled in and out of the holes of their digging, crept like big bugs along the flumes, and toiled and sweated at the gravel heaps which they kept in constant unrest. Men, as far as the eye could see, even to the rims of the hilltops, digging, tearing, and scouring the face of nature. Li Wan was appalled at the tremendous upheaval. Truly, these men are mad, she said to Kenem. Small wonder. The gold they dig after is a great thing, he replied. It is the greatest thing in the world. For hours they had threaded the chaos of greed, Kenem eagerly intent, Li Wan weak and listless. She knew she had been on the verge of disclosure, and she felt that she was still on the verge of disclosure, but the nervous strain she had undergone had tired her, and she passively waited for the thing, she knew not what, to happen. From every hand her senses snatched up and conveyed to her innumerable impressions, each of which became a dull excitation to her jaded imagination. Somewhere within her, responsive notes were answering to the things without, 
forgotten and undreamed of correspondences were being renewed, and she was aware of it in an incurious way, and her soul was troubled, but she was not equal to the mental exaltation necessary to transmute and understand. So she plodded wearily on the heels of her lord, content to wait for that which she knew, somewhere, somehow, must happen. After undergoing the mad bondage of man, the creek finally returned to its ancient ways, all soiled and smirched from its toil, and coiled lazily among the broad flats and timbered spaces where the valley widened to its mouth. Here the pay ran out, and the men were loath to loiter with the lure yet beyond. And here, as Li Wan paused to prod Ola with her staff, she heard the mellow silver of a woman's laughter. Before a cabin sat a woman, fair of skin and rosy as a child, dimpling with glee at the words of another woman in the doorway. But the woman who sat shook about her great masses of dark, wet hair which yielded up its dampness to the warm caress of the sun. For an instant, Li Wan stood transfixed. Then she was aware of a blinding flash and a snap, as though something gave way, and the woman before the cabin vanished, and the cabin and the tall spruce timber, and the jagged skyline, and Li Wan saw another woman, and the shine of another sun, brushing great masses of black hair and singing as she brushed. And Li Wan heard the words of the song, and she understood, and was a child again. She was smitten with a vision wherein all the troublesome dreams merged and became one, and shapes and shadows took up their accustomed round, and all was clear and plain and real. Many pictures jostled past, strange scenes and trees and flowers and people, and she saw them and knew them all. When you were a little bird, a little moose bird, Kenem said, his eyes upon her and burning into her. When I was a little moose bird, she whispered, so faint and low he scarcely heard, and she knew she lied as she bent her head to the strap and took the swing of the trail. And such was the strangeness of it, the real now became unreal. The male tramp and the pitching of camp by the edge of the stream seemed like a passage in a nightmare. She cooked the meat, fed the dogs, and unlatched the packs as in a dream, and it was not until Kanem began to sketch his next wandering that she became herself again. The Klondike runs into the Yukon, he was saying, a mighty river, mightier than the Mackenzie, of which you know. So we go, you and I, down to Fort O'Yukon. With dogs, in the time of winter, it is twenty sleeps. Then we follow the Yukon away into the west. One hundred sleeps, two hundred, I have never heard. It is very far, and then we come to the sea. You know nothing of the sea, so let me tell you. As the lake is to the island, so the sea is to the land, and the rivers run to it, and it is without end. I have seen it at Hudson Bay. I have yet to see it in Alaska. And then we may take a great canoe upon the sea, you and I, Liwan, or we may follow the land into south many a hundred sleeps. And after that, I do not know, save that I am Kanem the canoe, wanderer and far journeyer over the earth. She sat and listened, and fear ate into her heart as she pondered over this plunge into the illimitable wilderness. It is a weary way, was all she said, head bowed upon the knee in resignation. Then it was a splendid thought that came to her, and at the wonder of it she was all aglow. She went down to the stream and washed the dry clay from her face. When the ripples died away, she stared long at her mirrored features. But sun and weatherbeat had done their work, and what of roughness and bronze, her skin was not soft and dimpled as a child's. But the thought was still splendid, and the glow unabated, as she crept in beside her husband under the sleeping robe. She lie awake, staring up at the blue of the sky, and waiting for Kenem to sink into the first deep sleep. When this came about, she wormed slowly and carefully away, tucked the robe around him, and stood up. At her second step, Bash growled savagely. She whispered persuasively to him and glanced at the man. Kanem was snoring profoundly. Then she turned 
and with swift, noiseless feet, sped up the back trail. Mrs. Evelyn Van Wyck was just preparing for bed. Bored by the duties put upon her by society, her wealth, and her widowed blessedness, she had journeyed into the Northland and gone to housekeeping in a cozy cabin on the edge of the diggings. Here, aided and abetted by her friend and companion, Myrtle Giddings, she played at living close to the soil and cultivated the primitive with refined abandon. She strove to get away from the generations of culture and parlor selection and sought the earth grip her ancestors had forfeited. Likewise, she induced mental states which she fondly believed to approximate those of the stone folk, and just now, as she put upon her hair for the pillow, she was indulging her fancy with a paleolithic wooing. The details consisted principally of cave dwellings and cracked marrow bones, intersprinkled with fierce carnivora, hairy mammoth, and combats with rude, flaked knives of flint. But the sensations were delicious. And as Evelyn Van Wyck fled through the somber forest aisles before the two arduous advances of her slanted brow, skin-clad wooer, the door of the cabin opened, without the courtesy of a knock, and a skin-clad woman, savage and primitive, came in. Mercy! With a leap that would have done credit to a cave woman, Miss Giddings landed in safety behind the table, but Mrs. Van Wyck had held her ground. She noticed that the intruder was laboring under a strong excitement, and cast a swift glance backward to assure herself that the way was clear to the bunk, where the big colt revolvers lay beneath the pillow. Greeting, O oh women of the wondrous hair, said Li Wan, but she said it in her own tongue, the tongue spoken in but a little corner of the earth, and the woman did not understand. Shall I go for help? Miss Giddings quavered. The poor creature is harmless, I think, Mrs. Van Wyck replied, and just look at her skin clothes, ragged and trail-worn and all that. They are certainly unique. I shall buy them for my collection. Get my sack, Myrtle, please, and set up the scales. Lee Wan followed the shaping of the lips, but the words were unintelligible, and then, for the first time she realized in a moment of suspense and indecision, that there was no medium of communication between them and at the passion of her dumbness she cried out, with arms stretched wide apart, O oh, woman, thou art sister of mine. The tears coursed down her cheeks as she yearned towards them, and the break in her voice carried the sorrow she could not utter. But Miss Giddings was trembling, and even Mrs. Van Wyck was disturbed. I would live as you live. The ways are my ways, and our ways be one. My husband is Canem, the canoe, and he is big and strange, and I am afraid. His trail is all the world and never ends, and I am weary. My mother was like you, and her hair was as thine, and her eyes, and life was soft to me then, and the sun warm. She knelt humbly and bent her head at Mrs. Van Wyck's feet, but Mrs. Van Wyck drew away, frightened at her vehemence. Liwan stood up, panting for speech. Her dumb lips could not articulate her overmastering consciousness of kind. Trade? Y you trade? Mrs. Van Wyck questioned, slipping, after the fashion of the superior peoples, into pigeon tongue. She touched Li Wan's ragged skins to indicate her choice, and poured several hundreds of gold into the blower. She stirred the dust about and trickled its yellow luster temptingly through her fingers. But Li Wan saw only the fingers, milk white and shapely, tapering daintily to the rosy, jewel like nails. She placed her own hand alongside, all work-worn and calloused, and wept. Mrs. Van Wickham misunderstood. Gold, she encouraged. Good gold. You trade? You change for change? And she laid her hand again on Li Wan's skin garments. How much? You sell? How much? She persisted, running her hand against the way of the hair, so that she might make sure of the sinew thread seam. But Liwan was deaf as well, and the woman's speech was without significance. Dismay at her failure sat upon her. How could she identify herself with these women? For she knew that they were one of the breed, blood sisters among men and women of men. Her eyes roved wildly about the interior, taking in the soft draperies hanging around, the feminine garments, the oval mirror, 
and the dainty toilet accessories beneath, and the things haunted her, for she had seen like things before, and she had looked at them, her lips involuntarily formed sounds which her throat trembled to utter. Then a thought flashed upon her, and she steadied herself. She must be calm, she must control herself, for there must be no misunderstandings this time, or else. And she shook with a storm of suppressed tears, and steadied herself again. She put her hand on the table. Table, she said clearly and distinctly enunciated. Table, she repeated. She looked at Mrs. Van Wyck, who nodded approbation. Liwan exulted, but brought her will to bear, and held herself steady. Stove, she went on. Stove. And at every nod of Mrs. Van Wyck, Liwan's excitement mounted. Now stumbling and halting, and again in feverish haste, as the recrudences of forgotten words was fast or slow, she moved about the cabin, naming article after article, and when she paused finally, it was a triumph, with body erect and head thrown back, expectant, waiting. Cat, Mrs. Van Wyck laughing spilled out in kindergarten fashion, I see the cat catch the rat. Lee Wan nodded her head seriously. They were beginning to understand her at last, these women. The blood flushed darkly under her bronze at the thought, and she smiled and nodded her head still more vigorously. Mrs. Van Wyck turned to her companion. Received a smattering of mission education somewhere, I fancy, and has come to show it off. Of course, Miss Giddings tittered. Little fool, we shall lose our sleep with her vanity. All the same, I want that jacket. If it is old, the workmanship is good, a most excellent specimen. She returned to her visitor. Changey for changey? You. Changey for changey? How much, eh? How much, you? Perhaps she'd prefer a dress or something, Mrs. Giddings suggested. Mrs. Van Wyck went up to Lee Wan and made signs that she would exchange her wrapper for the jacket. And to further the transaction, she took Lee Wan's hand and placed it amid the lace and ribbons of the flowing bosom and rubbed the fingers back and forth so that they might feel the texture. But the jeweled butterfly which loosely held the fold in place was insecurely fastened, and the front of the gown slipped to the side, exposing a firm white breast, which had never known the lip clasp of a child. Mrs. Van Wyck coolly repaired the mischief, but Lee Wan uttered a loud cry and ripped and tore her at her skin shirt till her own breast showed firm and white as Evelyn Van Wyck's. Murmuring inarticulately and making swift signs, she strove to establish the kinship. A half-breed, Mrs. Van Wyck commented. I thought so from her hair. Mrs. Giddings made a fastidious gesture, proud of her father's white skin. It's beastly. Do give her something, Evelyn, and make her go. But the other woman sighed. Poor creature. I wish I could do something for her. A heavy foot crunched the gravel without. Then the cabin door swung wide and Canem stalked in. Mrs. Giddings saw a vision of sudden death and screamed, but Mrs. Van Wyck faced him composedly. What do you want? she demanded. How do? Canem answered suavely and directly, pointing at the same time to Liwan. Um, my wife. He reached out for her, but she waved him back. Speak, Kenem, tell them that I am... Daughter of Pawakana? Nay, of what is it to them that they should care? Better should I tell them that thou art ill wife, given to creeping from thy husband's bed when sleep is heavy in his eyes. Again, he reached out for her, but she fled away from him to Mrs. Van Wyck, at whose feet she made frenzied appeal, and whose knees she tried to clasp. But the lady stepped back and gave permission with her eyes to Kenem. He gripped Li Wan under the shoulders and raised her to her feet. She fought with him, in a madness of despair till his chest was heaving with exertion, and they had reeled about over half the room. Let me go, Kenem, she sobbed, but he twisted her wrist till she ceased to struggle. The memories of the little moose bird are overstrong and make trouble, he began. I know, I know, she broke in. I see the man in the snow, 
and as never before I see him crawl on hand and knee, and I, who am I a little child, am carried on his back, and this is before Pawakan, and the time I came to live in a little corner of the earth. You know, he answered, forcing her to the door, but you will go with me down the Yukon and forget. Never shall I forget. So long as my skin is white shall I remember. She clutched frantically at the doorpost and looked a last appeal to Mrs. Evelyn Van Wyck. Then I will teach thee to forget. I can am the canoe. As he spoke, he pulled her fingers clear and passed out with her upon the trail. End of section nine. Section 10 of Children of the Frost by Jack London This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker Children of the Frost by Jack London The League of the Old Men At the barracks, a man was being tried for his life. He was an old man, a native from the Whitefish River which empties into the Yukon below Lake Labarge. All Dawson was wrought up over the affair, and likewise the Yukon dwellers for a thousand miles up and down. It has been the custom of the land-robbing and sea-robbing Anglo-Saxon to give the law to conquered peoples, and oft-times this law is harsh. But in the case of Ember the law for once seemed inadequate and weak. In the mathematical nature of things, equity did not reside in the punishment to be accorded him. The punishment was a foregone conclusion. There could be no doubt of that. And though it was capital, Ember had but one life, while the tale against him was one of scores. In fact, the blood of so many was upon his hands that the killings attributed to him did not permit of precise enumeration. Smoking a pipe by the trailside, or lounging around the stove, men made rough estimates of the numbers that had perished at his hand. They had been whites, all of them, these poor murdered people, and they had been slain singly, in pairs, and in parties. And so purposeless and wanton had been these killings, that they had long been a mystery to the mounted police, even in the time of the captains, and later, when the Creeks realized and a governor came from the Dominion to make the land pay for its prosperity. But more mysterious still was the coming of Ember to Dawson to give himself up. It was in the late spring, when the Yukon was growling and writhing under its ice, that the old Indian climbed painfully up the bank from the river trail and stood blinking on the main street. Men who had witnessed his advent noted that he was weak and tottery and that he staggered over to a heap of cabin logs and sat down. He sat there a full day, staring straight before him at the unceasing tide of white men that flooded past. Many a head jerked curiously to the side to meet his stare, and more than one remark was dropped anent the old Siwash with so strange a look upon his face. No end of men remembered afterward that they had been struck by his extraordinary figure, and forever afterward prided themselves upon their swift discernment of the unusual. But it remained for Dickinson, little Dickinson, to be the hero of the occasion. Little Dickinson had come into the land with great dreams, and a pocket full of cash. But with the cash, the dreams vanished, and to earn his passage back to the States, he had accepted a clerical position with the brokerage firm of Holbrook and Mason. Across the street from the office of Holbrook and Mason was the heap of cabin logs upon which Ember sat. Dickinson looked out of the window at him before he went to lunch, and when he came back from lunch he looked out of the window, and the old Siwash was still there. Dickinson continued to look out of the window, and he too forever afterward prided himself upon his swiftness of discernment. He was a romantic little chap, and he likened the immobile old heathen to the genius of the Siwash race, gazing calm-eyed upon the hosts of the invading Saxon. The hour swept along, but Ember did not vary his posture, did not by a hair's breadth move a muscle, and Dickinson remembered the man who once sat upright on a sled in the main street where men passed to and fro. 
they thought the man was resting. But later, when they touched him, they found him stiff and cold, frozen to death in the midst of the busy street. To undouble him, that he might fit into a coffin, they had been forced to lug him to a fire and thaw him out a bit. Dickinson shivered at the recollection. Later on, Dickinson went out on the sidewalk to smoke a cigar and cool off, and a little later Emily Travis happened along. Emily Travis was dainty and delicate and rare, and whether in London or Klondike, she gowned herself as befitted the daughter of a millionaire mining engineer. Little Dickinson deposited his cigar on an outside window ledge, where he could find it again, and lifted his hat. They chatted for ten minutes or so, when Emily Travis, glancing past Dickinson's shoulder, gave a startled little scream. Dickinson turned about to see, and was startled too. Ember had crossed the street and was standing there, a gaunt and hungry-looking shadow, his gaze riveted upon the girl. "'What do you want?' little Dickinson demanded, tremulously plucky. Ember grunted and stalked up to Emily Travis. He looked her over, keenly and carefully, every square inch of her. Especially did he appear interested in her silky brown hair, and in the color of her cheek, faintly sprayed and soft, like the downy bloom of a butterfly wing. He walked around her, surveying her with the calculating eye of a man who studies the lines upon which a horse or a boat is builded. In the course of his circuit, the pink shell of her ear came between his eye and the westering sun, and he stopped to contemplate its rose transparency. Then he returned to her face and looked long and intently into her blue eyes, he grunted and laid a hand on her arm midway between the shoulder and elbow. With his other hand, he lifted her forearm and doubled it back. Disgust and wonder showed in his face, and he dropped her arm with a contemptuous grunt. Then he muttered a few guttural syllables, turned his back upon her, and addressed himself to Dickinson. Dickinson could not understand his speech, and Emily Travis laughed. Ember turned from one to the other, frowning, but both shook their heads. He was about to go away when she called out, Oh, Jimmy, come here. Jimmy came from the other side of the street. He was a big, hulking Indian clad in approved white man style, with an El Dorado King's sombrero on his head. He talked with Ember, haltingly, with throaty spasms. Jimmy was a Sitkin, possessed of no more than a passing knowledge of the interior dialects. Him, whitefish man, he said to Emily Travis. Me save him talk no very much. Him want to look see chief white man. The governor? suggested Dickinson. Jimmy talked some more with the whitefish man, and his face went grave and puzzled. I think um want Captain Alexander, he explained. Him say um kill white man, white woman, white boy. Plenty kill um white people, him want to die. Insane, I guess, said Dickinson. What you call that? queried Jimmy. Dickinson thrust a finger figuratively inside his head, and imparted a rotary motion thereto. Maybe so, maybe so, said Jimmy, returning to Ember, who still demanded the chief man of the white men. A mounted policeman, unmounted for Klondike service, joined the group and heard Ember's wish repeated. He was a stalwart young fellow, broad-shouldered, deep-chested, legs cleanly built and stretched wide apart, and tall, though Ember was, he towered above him by half a head. His eyes were cool and gray, and steady, and he carried himself with the peculiar confidence of power that is bred of blood and tradition. His splendid masculinity was emphasized by his excessive boyishness. He was a mere lad, and his smooth cheek promised to blush as willingly as the cheek of a maid. Ember was drawn to him at once. The fire leaped into his eyes at sight of a saber slash that scarred his cheek. He ran a withered hand down the young fellow's leg and caressed the swelling through. He smote the broad chest with his knuckles and pressed and prodded the thick muscle pads that covered the shoulders like a cuirass. The group had been added to by curious passers-by. Husky miners, mountaineers, and frontiersmen, sons of the long-legged and broad-shouldered generations. Ember glanced from one to another, then he spoke aloud in the whitefish tongue. "'What did he say?' asked Dickinson. 
Him say em all the same one man. Dat policeman, Jimmy interpreted. Little Dickinson was little, and what of Miss Travis he felt sorry for having asked the question. The policeman was sorry for him and stepped into the breach. I fancy there may be something in his story. I'll take him up to the captain for examination. Tell him to come along with me, Jimmy. Jimmy indulged in more throaty spasms. An ember grunted and looked satisfied. But ask him what he said, Jimmy, and what he meant when he took hold of my arm. So spoke Emily Travis, and Jimmy put the question and received the answer. Him say you no afraid, said Jimmy. Emily Travis looked pleased. Him say you no skookum, no strong, all the same very soft like little baby. Him break you in um two hands, two little pieces. Him think much funny, very strange, how you can be mother of men so big, so strong, like that policeman. Emily Travis kept her eyes up and unfaltering, but her cheeks were sprayed with scarlet. Little Dickinson blushed and was quite embarrassed. The policeman's face blazed with his boy's blood. Come along, you, he said gruffly, setting his shoulder to the crowd and forcing away. Thus it was that Ember found his way to the barracks, where he made full and voluntary confession, and from the precincts of which he never emerged. Ember looked very tired. The fatigue of hopelessness and age was in his face. His shoulders drooped depressingly, and his eyes were lackluster. His mop of hair should have been white, but sun and weather beat had burned and bitten it, so that it hung limp and lifeless and colorless. He took no interest in what went on around him. The courtroom was jammed with the men of the creeks and trails, and there was an ominous note in the rumble and grumble of their low-pitched voices, which came to his ears like the growl of the sea from deep caverns. He sat close by a window, and his apathetic eyes rested now and again on the dreary scene without. The sky was overcast, and a gray drizzle was falling. It was flood time on the Yukon. The ice was gone, and the river was up in the town. Back and forth on the main street, in canoes and poling boats, passed the people that never rested. Often he saw these boats turn aside from the street and enter the flooded square that marked the barracks parade ground. Sometimes they disappeared beneath him, and he heard them jar against the house logs and their occupants scramble in through the window. After that came the slush of water against men's legs as they waded across the lower room and mounted the stairs. Then they appeared in the doorway, with doffed hats and dripping sea boots, and added themselves to the waiting crowd. And while they centered their looks on him, and in grim anticipation enjoyed the penalty he was to pay, Ember looked at them, and mused on their ways, and on their law that never slept, but went on unceasing, in good times and bad, in flood and famine, through trouble and terror and death, and which would go on unceasing, it seemed to him, to the end of time. A man rapped sharply on a table, and the conversation droned away into silence. Ember looked at the man. He seemed one in authority, Yet Ember divined the square-browed man who sat by a desk farther back to be the one chief over them all, and over the man who had rapped. Another man by the same table uprose and began to read aloud from many fine sheets of paper. At the top of each sheet, he cleared his throat. At the bottom, moistened his fingers. Ember did not understand his speech, but the others did, and he knew that it made them angry. Sometimes it made them very angry and once a man cursed him in single syllables, stinging and tense, till a man at the table wrapped him to silence. For an interminable period the man read. His monotonous, sing-song utterance lured Ember to dreaming, and he was dreaming deeply when the man ceased. A voice spoke to him in his own whitefish tongue, and he roused up without surprise to look upon the face of his sister's son, a young man who had wandered away years agone to make his dwelling with the whites. Thou dost not remember me, he said by way of greeting. Nay, Ember answered, thou art Hawkwan, who went away. Thy mother be dead. She was an old woman, said Hawken. But Ember did not hear, and Hawken, with hand upon his shoulder, roused him again. 
I shall speak to thee what the man has spoken, which is the tale of the troubles thou hast done, and which thou hast told, O fool, to the captain Alexander. And thou shalt understand and say if it be true, talk, or talk not true. It is so commanded. Hauken had fallen among the mission folk, and been taught by them to read and write. In his hands he held the many fine sheets from which the man had read aloud, and which had been taken down by a clerk, when Imber first made confession, through the mouth of Jimmy to Captain Alexander. Hauken began to read. Imber listened for a space, when a wonderment rose up in his face and he broke in abruptly. That be my talk, Hauken, yet from thy lips it comes when thy ears have not heard. Hauken smirked with self-appreciation. His hair was parted in the middle. Nay, from the paper it comes, O Imber. Never have my ears heard. From the paper it comes, through my eyes, into my head, and out of my mouth, to thee. Thus it comes. Thus it comes? It be there in the paper? Imber's voice sank in whisperful awe as he crackled the sheets, twixt thumb and finger, and stared at the charactery scrawled thereon. It be a great medicine, Haukan, and thou art a worker of wonders. It be nothing, it be nothing. The young man responded carelessly and pridefully. He read it hazard from the document. In that year before the break of ice came an old man, and a boy who was lame of one foot. These also did I kill, and the old man made much noise. It be true, Imber interrupted breathlessly. He made much noise, and would not die for a long time. But how dost thou know, Hauken? The chief man of the white men told thee mayhap. No one beheld me, and him alone have I told. Hauken shook his head with impatience. Have I not told thee it be there in the paper, O fool? Ember stared hard at the ink-scrawled surface. As the hunter looks upon the snow and says, Here but yesterday there passed a rabbit, And here by the willow scrub it stood, And listened and heard, and was afraid, And here it turned upon its trail, And here it went with great swiftness, leaping wide, And here with greater swiftness and wider leapings Came a lynx, and here, where the claws cut deep into the snow, the lynx made a very great leap. And here it struck, with the rabbit under, and rolling belly up. And here leads off the trail of the lynx alone, and there is no more rabbit. As the hunter looks upon the markings of the snow, and says thus and so, and here, dost thou, too, look upon the paper, and say thus and so, and here, be the things old Imber hath done? Even so said Hauken. And now do thou listen and keep thy woman's tongue between thy teeth till thou art called upon for speech? Thereafter, and for a long time, Hauken read to him the confession, and Imber remained musing and silent. At the end he said, It be my talk, and true talk, but I am grown old, Hauken, and forgotten things come back to me which were well for the head man there to know. First there was the man who came over the ice mountains with cunning traps made of iron, who sought the beaver of the whitefish. Him I slew, and there were three men seeking gold on the whitefish long ago. Them also I slew, and left them to the wolverines. And at the five fingers there was a man with a raft and much meat. At the moments when Ember paused to remember, Hauken translated, and a clerk reduced to writing. The courtroom listened stolidly to each unadorned little tragedy, till Ember told of a red-haired man, whose eyes were crossed and whom he had killed with a remarkably long shot. Hail, said a man in the forefront of the onlookers. He said it soulfully and sorrowfully. He was red-haired. Hail, he repeated. That was my brother Bill. And at regular intervals throughout the session his solemn hell was heard in the courtroom. Nor did his comrades check him, nor did the man at the table wrap him to order. Ember's head drooped once more, and his eyes went dull, as though a film rose up and covered them from the world, and he dreamed as only age can dream upon the colossal futility of youth. Later, Hauken roused him again, saying, Stand up, O Ember! It be commanded that thou tellest why you did these troubles and slew these people. And at the end, 
journeyed here seeking the law. Ember rose feebly to his feet and swayed back and forth. He began to speak in a low and faintly rumbling voice, but Halkin interrupted him. This old man, he is damn crazy, he said in English to the square-browed man. His talk is foolish and like that of a child. We will hear his talk which is like that of a child, said the square-browed man, and we will hear it word for word as he speaks it. Do you understand? Halkin understood, and Ember's eyes flashed, for he had witnessed the play between his sister's son and the man in authority. And then began the story, the epic of a bronze patriot, which might well itself be wrought into bronze for the generations unborn. The crowd fell strangely silent, and the square-browed judge leaned head on hand and pondered his soul and the soul of his race. Only was heard the deep tones of Ember, rhythmically alternating with the shrill voice of the interpreter, and now and again, like the bell of the Lord, the wondering and meditative hell of the red-haired man. I am Ember of the Whitefish people, so ran the interpretation of Hauken, whose inherent barbarism gripped hold of him, and who lost his mission culture and veneered civilization as he caught the savage ring and rhythm of old Ember's tale. My father was Otsbyok, a strong man. The land was warm with sunshine and gladness when I was a boy. The people did not hunger after strange things, nor hearken to new voices. And the ways of their fathers were their ways. The women found favor in the eyes of the young men, and the young men looked upon them with content. Babes hung at the breasts of the women, and they were heavy-hipped with increase of the tribe. Men were men in those days, in peace and plenty, and in war and famine they were men. At that time there was more fish in the water than now, and more meat in the forest. Our dogs were wolves, warm with thick hides and hard to the frost and storm. And as with our dogs, so with us, for we were likewise hard to the frost and storm. And when the pelis came into our land, we slew them and were slain. For we were men, we whitefish, and our fathers and our fathers' fathers had fought against the pelis and determined the bounds of the land. As I say with our dogs, so with us. And one day came upon the first white man. He dragged himself, so, on hand and knee, in the snow, and his skin was stretched tight, and his bones were sharp beneath. Never was such a man, we thought, and we wondered of what strange tribe he was, and of its land. And he was weak, most weak, like a little child, so that we gave him a place by the fire, and warm furs to lie upon, and we gave him food, as little children are given food. And with him was a dog, large as three of our dogs, and very weak. The hair of this dog was short and not warm, and the tail was frozen, so that the end fell off. And the strange dog we fed, embedded by the fire, and fought from it our dogs, which else would have killed him. And what of the moose meat and the sun-dried salmon, the man and dog took strength to themselves. And what of the strength they became, big and unafraid. And the man spoke loud words, and laughed at the old men and young men, and looked boldly upon the maidens, and the dog fought with our dogs, and for all of his short hair and softness slew three of them in one day. When we asked the man concerning his people, he said, I have many brothers, and laughed in a way that was not good. And when he was in full strength, he went away, and with him went Noda, daughter to the chief. First, and after that, was one of our bitches brought to pup. And never was there such a breed of dogs, big-headed, thick-jawed, and short-haired, and helpless. Well do I remember my father, Otsbayok, a strong man. His face was black with anger at such helplessness, and he took a stone, so and so, and there was no more helplessness. In two summers... After that came Noda back to us, with a man-child in the hollow of her arm. And that was the beginning. Came a second white man, with short-haired dogs, 
which he left behind him when he went. And with him went six of our strongest dogs, for which in trade he had given Ku So Ti, my mother's brother, a wonderful pistol that fired with great swiftness six times. And Ku So Ti was very big, what of the pistol, and laughed at our bows and arrows. Women's things, he called them, and went forth against the bald-faced grizzly with the pistol in his hand. Now it be known that it is not good to hunt the bald face with a pistol, but how were we to know? And how was Ku So Ti to know? So he went against the bald face, very brave, and fired the pistol with great swiftness six times, and the bald face but grunted and broke in his breast like it were an egg, and like honey from a bee's nest, dripped the brains of Ku So Ti upon the ground. He was a good hunter, and there was no one to bring meat to his squaw and children. And we were bitter, and we said, That which for the white man is well, is for us not well. And this be true. There be many white men and fat, but their ways have made us few and lean. Came the third white man, with great wealth of all manner of wonderful foods and things. And twenty of our strongest dogs he took from us in trade. Also what of presents and great promises, Ten of our young hunters did he take with him on a journey, which fared no man knew where. It is said they died in the snow of the ice mountains where man has never been, or in the hills of silence, which are beyond the edge of the earth. Be that as it may, dogs and young hunters were seen never again by the whitefish people. And more white men came with the years, and ever, with pay and presents, they led the young men away with them. And sometimes the young men came back with strange tales of dangers and toils in the lands beyond the Pellies, and sometimes they did not come back. And we said, if they be unafraid of life, these white men, it is because they have many lives. But we be few by the white fish, and the young men shall go away no more. But the young men did go away, and the young men went also, and we were very wroth. It be true we ate flour and salt pork and drank tea which was a great delight. Only when we could not get tea, it was very bad, and we became short of speech and quick of anger. So we grew to hunger for the things the white men brought in trade. Trade! Trade! All the time was it trade. One winter we sold our meat for clocks that would not go, and watches with broken guts, and files worn smooth, and pistols without cartridges and worthless. And then came famine, and we were without meat, and two score died ere the break of spring. Now we are grown weak, we said, and the Pellies will fall upon us, and our bounds be overthrown. But as it fared with us, so had it fared with the Pellies, and they were too weak to come against us. My father, Otsbayok, a strong man, was now old and very wise, and he spoke to the chief, saying, Behold, our dogs be worthless. No longer are they thick-furred and strong, and they die in the frost and harness. Let us go in the village and kill them, saving only the wolf ones, and these let us tie out in the night that they may mate with the wild wolves of the forest. Thus shall we have dogs warm and strong again. And his word was hearkened to, and we whitefish became known for our dogs, which were the best in the land. But known we were not for ourselves. The best of our young men and women had gone away with the white men to wander on trail and river to far places. And the young women, came back old and broken, as Noda had come, for they came back not at all. And the young men came back to sit by our fires for a time, full of ill speech and rough ways, drinking evil drinks and gambling through long nights and days, with a great unrest always in their hearts. Till the call of the white men came to them, and they went away again to the unknown places. And they were without honor and respect, jeering the old-time customs, and laughing in the faces of chief and shamans. As I say, we were becoming a weak breed, we white fish. We sold our warm skins and furs for tobacco and whiskey and thin cotton things that left us shivering in the cold. And the coughing sickness came upon us, and men and women coughed and sweated through the long nights, and the hunters on trail spat blood upon the snow. And now one, and now another, bled swiftly from the mouth and died, and the women bore few children, 
and those they bore were weak and given to sickness. And other sicknesses came to us from the white men, the like of which we had never known and could not understand. Smallpox, likewise measles, have I heard these sicknesses named, and we died of them, as die the salmon in the still eddies, when in the fall their eggs are spawned and there is no longer need for them to live. And yet, and here be the strangeness of it, the white men come as the breath of death. All their ways lead to death. Their nostrils are filled with it, and yet they do not die. There is the whiskey and tobacco and short-haired dogs. There is the many sicknesses, the smallpox and measles, the coughing and mouth bleeding. There is the white skin and softness to the frost and storm. And there is the pistols that shoot six times very swift and are worthless. And yet they grow fat on their many ills, and prosper, and lay a heavy hand over all the world, and tread mightily upon its peoples, and their women too are soft as little babes, most breakable and never broken, the mothers of men. And out of all this softness, sick and weakness, come strength and power and authority. They be gods or devils, as the case may be. I do not know what I do know. I hold ember of the white wish. Only do I know that they are past understanding, these white men, far wanderers and fighters over the earth that they be. As I say, the meat in the forest became less and less. It be true. The white man's gun is most excellent and kills a long way off. But of what worth the gun when there is no meat to kill? When I was a boy on the whitefish, there was moose on every hill. And each year came the caribou uncountable. But now the hunter may take the trail ten days and not one moose gladden his eyes, while the caribou uncountable come no more at all. Small worth the gun, I say, killing a long way off, when there be nothing to kill. And I, Ember, pondered upon these things, watching the wild, the whitefish, and the pellies, and all the tribes of the land, perishing as perished the meat of the forest. Long I pondered. I talked with the shamans and the old men who were wise. I went apart that the sounds of the village might not disturb me, and I ate no meat, so that my belly should not press upon me and make me slow of eye and ear. I sat long and sleepless in the forest, wide-eyed for the sign, my ears patient and keen for the word that was to come, and I wandered alone in the blackness of night to the river bank, where was wind moaning and sobbing of water, and where I sought wisdom from the ghosts of old shamans in the trees, and dead and gone. And in the end, as in a vision, came to me the short-haired and detestable dogs, and the way seemed plain, by the wisdom of Atzbayak. My father, and a strong man, had the blood of our own wolf-dogs been kept clean, wherefore they had remained warm of hide, and strong in the harness. So I returned to my village and made oration to the men. This be a tribe, these white men, I said, a very large tribe, and doubtless there is no longer meat in their land, and they are coming among us to make a new land for themselves. But they weaken us, and we die. They are a very hungry folk. Already has our meat gone from us, and it were well if we would live that we deal by them as we have dealt by their dogs. And further oration I made, counseling fight. And the men of the whitefish listened, and some said one thing, and some another. And some spoke of other and worthless things, and no man made brave talk of deeds in war. But while the young men were weak as water and afraid, I watched that the old men sat silent, and that in their eyes fires came and went. And later, when the village slept and no one knew, I drew the old men away into the forest and made more talk. And now we were agreed, and we remembered the good young days, and the free land, and the times of plenty, and the gladness and sunshine. And we called ourselves brothers, and swore great secrecy, and a mighty oath to cleanse the land of the evil breed that had come upon it. It be plain we were fools, but how are we to know, we old men of the whitefish? And to hearten the others I did the first deed. I kept guard upon the Yukon till the first canoe came down. In it were two white men. And when I stood upright the bank and raised my hand, 
they changed their course and drove into me. And as the man in the bow lifted his head, so that he might know wherefore I wanted him, my arrow sang through the air straight to his throat, and he knew. The second man, who held paddle in the stern, had his rifle half to his shoulder, when the first of my three spear casts smote him. These be the first, I said when the old men had gathered to me. Later we will bind together all the old men of all the tribes, and after the young men who remain strong, and the work will become easy. And then the two dead white men we cast into the river, and of the canoe, which was a very good canoe, we made a fire, and a fire also of the things within the canoe. But first we looked at the things, and they were pouches of leather which we cut open with our knives, and inside these pouches were many papers like that from which thou hast read, O Halkin, with markings on them which we marveled at and could not understand. Now I am become wise, and I know them for the speech of men, as thou hast told me. A whisper and buzz went around the courtroom when Halkin finished interpreting the affair of the canoe, and one man's voice spoke up. That was the lost ninety-one mail, Peter James and Delaney bringing it in, and last spoken at La Barge by Matthews going out. The clerk scratched steadily away, and another paragraph was added to the history of the North. There be little more, Ember went on slowly. It be there on the paper the things we did. We were old men, and we did not understand. Even I, Imber, do not now understand. Secretly we slew, and continued to slay. For with our years we were crafty, and we had learned the swiftness of going without haste. When white men came among us with black looks and rough words, and took away six of the young men with irons binding them helpless, we knew we must slay wider and farther and one by one we old men departed up river and down to the unknown lands. It was a brave thing. Old we were and unafraid, but the fear of far places is a terrible fear to men who are old. So we slew, without haste and craftily, on the Chilkoot and in the Delta we slew, from the passes to the sea, wherever the white men camped or broke their trails. It be true they died, but it was without worth. Ever did they come over the mountains, ever did they grow and grow, while we, being old, became less and less. I remember by the caribou crossing the camp of a white man. He was a very little white man, and three of the old men came upon him in his sleep, and the next day I came upon the four of them. The white man alone still breathed, and there was breath in him to curse me once and well, before he died. And so it went, now one old man, and now another. Sometimes the word reached us long after of how they died, and sometimes it did not reach us, and the old men of the other tribes were weak and afraid and would not join with us. As I say, one by one, till I alone was left. I am Ember of the Whitefish people. My father was Atzbayak a strong man. There are no white fish now. Of the old men I am the last. The young men and young women are gone away, some to live with the Pellies, some with the Salmons, and more with the white men. I am very old and very tired, and it being vain fighting the law, as thou sayest, Hauken, I am come seeking the law. O oh, Ember, thou art indeed a fool, said Hauken. But Ember was dreaming. The square-browed judge likewise dreamed, and all his race rose up before him in a mighty phantasmagoria. His steel-shod, mail-clad race, the lawgiver and world-maker among the families of men. He saw at dawn red flickering across the dark forests and sullen seas. He saw it blaze, bloody and red, to full and triumphant moon, and down the shaded slope he saw the blood-red sands dropping into night. And through it all he observed the law, pitiless and potent, ever unswerving and ever ordaining, greater than the motes of men who fulfilled it or were crushed by it, even as it was greater than he, his heart speaking for softness. 
End of Section 10 The League of the Old Men End of Children of the Frost by Jack London